All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the Theme 2 Steg, oh, Steg Theme 2 workshop, um, uh, the theme of which is labor, home production, and structural transformation at the level of households. Um, my name is Taryn Dinkelman, and together with Rachel Nagai, uh, we have put together what we think is a really, um, really great program for today. There are six papers, which are a mixture of uh, micro and macro approaches to um, thinking about this general theme. Um, and I realized uh, about half an hour ago, this is actually the third iteration, the third workshop of its kind. So um, it's great that uh, we are still getting fantastic uh, submissions um, for this theme. Uh, we have a particular focus on gender, um, and I think you'll see this uh, on this program today. Uh, I think we had given instruct, um, presenters instructions to five minutes, um, and then we'll have 15 minutes of open discussion. But I think if there are clarif clarifying questions um, that come up, you are welcome to put them in the chat. Some of some of the present presenters have uh, co-authors who will be fielding questions in the chat. Um, and if they don't, then um, perhaps the, you know, myself or Rachel will, will flag these um, for the presenters. So each paper has about an hour. We're gonna have uh, six papers. We'll break in what's, what's about two hours from now. Joe, can you turn your mic off? <laughs> um, and uh, we're very happy to start off with a presentation uh, from Michelle Rendell, who, uh, for whom it is very late in the evening. Um, and we're very glad to have her joining us all the way from Australia. So Michelle, I don't know if you wanna share your slides um, and yes. take it. Thank you. Yes, um, thanks for having us be part of the program. I do realize that when we first submitted we didn't actually have that many results, but this gave us an excellent deadline to work hard. And so we have a lot of um, actually exciting results, I would say on this. And the talk, as you can see here, is Gender Education Gap and Economic Development. And this is joint work with Ying and Jia, and they're both in the audience. And what we have in mind here is that even though there's a lot of talk about we're lacking gender equality around the world. Um, there has been dramatic progress in gender equality and especially with economic development. So as countries get richer, there's more gender equality compared to poorer countries. And one of the metrics where we have seen a particular increase in gender equality has been educational attainment. Now you can measure this in different ways. For this talk, I'm going to focus at university or tertiary degree attainment. And so Wolfers has um, a paper where he just talked about how in most OECD countries, you have now women becoming more educated than men. But if you look at low income countries, they're still far behind. So women get about 20 to 30% um, or become educated at a rate of about 20 to 30% compared to men. And this is um, upward sloping along the development process to then at some point overturning the gap. Now, education, as we all know, has big implications for gender equality. There's a lot of papers that talk about how it goes through bargaining. So license sites, they have a paper where it goes through bargaining in terms of consumption inside the household. Dirk Tilt, they have a paper more on development side where they talk about bargaining and how it affects um, fertility choices of uh, desired fertility outcome for men and women. And I have some work that we did with um, Fatih where we actually look at some insurance value of education if for example, divorce laws change. So that's sort of just to give you a background of how we thought about this project. Now, having said that there's actually very little understanding at least as far as we could tell in the literature of how these gaps or why there are gender education gaps across country and across time and why they change over time. So from where I was coming from is, is I know that there was some research in terms of marriage market. There's a paper by Victor Ruiz Rule and Virginia Sanchez Marcos and there's my paper with Fati, but there hasn't really been that much done. And we were looking at it from a slightly different angle 
where we wanted to take a broad cross-country approach and try and understand this across the whole development spectrum. So we're going to use, we're going to study first in the data cross-country patterns. We use the IPOMS International, so we have a database covering 256 surveys for 84 countries of really all income levels. And then we're going to develop a model and we want to quantify what can explain the narrowing gap and we're going to focus on one particular aspect which we're going to term skill by structural transformation so we're going to look at structural transformation and skill by technical change together and see how much of that can explain differences we observe across country and over time and because there has been this literature on the marriage market we're going to also have the marriage market in this model but in a very reduced form now, what we do know about the literature is that um, Rachel's own work and Golden earlier have shown that aggregate labor, female labor force participation tends to be U-shaped. So when countries are poor and women work a lot, then as they become wealthier, labor force participation decreases and then it increases again. There's also a large literature out there that talks about how rising or uh, increasing service sector employment leads to more women entering the labor market. Again, there's work by Rachel and Barbara and work by myself and then um, Francisco and Cora says they, there's, there's a bunch of work, so I'm probably missing a couple of papers here. But so this is a well-established fact. And so what we're going to do in the paper is probably a little bit more related to the next three papers that I'm going to very briefly discuss, which is the Burr and co-authors paper in Ari Stutt, where they talk about how skill by structural transformation can shape or how much of that can explain college premium changing over time for a set of advanced economies. Relatedly, I have this paper where I talk about shifts from physical to intellectual skills and how much that can explain in, in gender wage gaps in labor force participation and also in education. And then there's a job market paper by Ramers from 2020, and this is probably the paper most closely related to ours, and he looks at how structural transformation um, can explain relative education of women and their formal hours in the market, but in that paper he abstracts from um, skill bias technical change. And of course, we think skill bias technical change is like the typical factor that we think about driving tertiary education. So we want to put these two together. Now, before I jump into the data and the model, just very briefly, what we're going to have is a simple marriage market with three sector, a three sector model with agriculture, manufacturing and services. We're going to have four types of labor which are differentiated by gender, so men and women, and then skills, educated and uneducated. And in that model, we're going to feed in a lot of exogenous technical change. So we're going to have productivity differences over time and across country. That's going to be exogenous skill by structural transformation, um, similar to the spirit of where at all, although our sector definition is more um, traditional. We're going to have marriage market differences, and that's just feeding in exogenous assortative matching probabilities. And this, this was a bit surprising, and I'll go into this, but assortative matching actually um, falls with the development process, and that's consistent with this JPE paper by ICA and co-authors. And, and I'll go into the details because I, I didn't actually expect that when I started this work. And then as robustness, we're going to add two more um, productivity changes. One is gender bias, technical change, and the other one is home productivity. They, those two don't seem as important once we look at the, our results. And also we cannot do this for the whole set of countries. So we can only look at a few countries when we're looking at those two. So that's why they're not part of the base models, but they're not the main drivers in our, in our theory. Okay, so Pre, quick preview on the results is we find that changing a sort of matching, matching patterns actually work against a closing gender education gap. And that's, as I said before, that the gen, uh, assortative matching pattern actually decrease over time and over development. 
And therefore, as authoritative matching becomes less important, education rates would actually be decreasing for women or the incentive to become educated would decrease. But what we do have that increases the incentive for women to become educated is that similar to the literature on rising female labor force participation due to services is women have a comparative advantages in services. So structural transformation increases women's um, participation in the market in services. Skill bias technical change, even though it is slightly higher in the manufacturing sector than in the service sector, which is consistent with um, previous literature, the key is that it is high, they're almost, they're almost the same, and it is high in services. And so this fact that women are more likely to select into services and they have a comparative advantage makes them also want to become more educated with skill bias, technical change in the service sector. So the demand for skilled men and women increases in all sector, but the service sector matters for more for female education. So the takeaway from our model is then that structural transformation is important for me, female labor force participation pattern and skill by technical change, especially in services is going to be important to account for gender education gap patterns. And so if you don't have a large service sector, you're not going to see um, a convergence or an overtaking of women's education rates compared to men, even if you have skill based technical change. But if you have this large service sector and skill based technical change, then you will see more women becoming educated than men. So cross country results suggest that skill by structural transformation is an important driver in explaining gender education gaps over time and across countries or across the development spectrum. Okay, so that's a very quick overview. Now, I'm gonna give you a couple of the facts. Some of these are well-established and you already know, and some of them might be new. Um, what we do is we use cross-country data from IPOMS International, which are, I mean, for, for people who don't know about them, they're national representative censuses and surveys. We have a total of 208, country year surveys, which means we have 83 countries, but we have them over it's some countries over multiple years and others only over one or two years. We're also going to look at US time series and you will see that the patterns across the development spectrum across countries are consistent with the US time series. And for that, we just again use the IPOMS data and we're going to focus specifically on 1980 to 2015. Um, 1980, because that's usually when we think of structural transformation um, sort of taking off in the service sector increasing and in women's labor force participation. And we're going to focus on prime aged men and women, age, so age 25 between 54. We're going to use all the individual level information on age, gender, educational attainment, employment status, and industry. Now, so this is the first fact. Um, that I was talking about. So this is the gender gap in university completion. You have the ratio of female to males on the y-axis, on the x-axis you have log GDP per capita. And the green line is the US time series. And then the rest are countries. And of course, countries are repeated multiple times. So those are the little um, dots that you can, that are much weaker. And then the thicker dots are the country averages. But what you see is you see a clear increasing pattern over time. And this is what I was saying in the poorest countries is about 20 to 30% um, women's um, educational attainment compared to men. And then in the richest countries, women have overtaken men. So it's above one. And you can also do this for secondary school completion. It's similar, it just flattens out as countries get richer because almost everybody has a secondary completion rate. Now on the marriage market, if you think about the share of educated men is gamma M and the share of educated women is gamma F, if you have a random marriage market, then the share of couples where both of them are educated would just be gamma M plus uh, gamma M times gamma F. So that's a random marriage market. If you then think of assortative matching, you could compute the parameter, parameter that we call alpha here. And as long as alpha is greater than one, 
it would suggest that there's a sort of matching in the marriage market. So the probability of uh, educated men marrying an educated woman becomes larger than the random probability of them meeting. And once you do this for educated couples, you can of course go through and do it for the remaining couples, just figure out um, how you adjust each of these probabilities. And so if you compute this Lambda parameters, and this is what the Ike um, JPE paper did, what you actually find is that over time, although for the US here in the green um, time series, it's, it's a bit harder to see, but it is actually downward sloping. So it goes from about three in 1980 to about two in by 2015. You see actually a fall in this alpha parameter. And if you look over the whole development spectrum, um, and it, it, you have to account here for polygamous and monogamous country, but uh, or societies or cultures. And so there's obviously more polygamy as in poorer countries. But what you do observe is a clear downward sloping trend. And again, the, the solid um, red dots are country averages and the blue diamonds are country averages, but for polygamous countries. And then the little um, dots that you see that are sort of shaded red, they're just the specific years. And the alpha parameter actually goes from about 20 or even over 20 to about two. Uh, so there's a huge decrease in this assortative matching parameters compared to the random matching. And this was actually something I was surprised because I came from the view that assortative matching has gone up and that's just thinking about, well, the share of educated, educated couples is going up, but of course it can go up for various reasons. And one reason could just be there's more educated um, individuals and therefore that share, share goes up. M Michelle, the co-inhabitation yes. doesn't matter, does it? You know, would it? Yeah, so uh, I should ask, I should put that to my co authors whether we consider cohabitation here, but I'm assuming iPhones, because in some, they only started asking cohabitation later on. So especially if you go towards 1980s, you wouldn't have cohabitation in the data. So this would just be marriages. Now we are correcting, or we are accounting for single individuals here as well. So if you take single individuals out and compute the alpha, the alpha becomes a little bit larger. So, it, so we are counting, yeah, so I should have said that here, we are counting for the fact that you might be educated but not get married at all. And so I guess in this instance, we would be counting cohabitating people as single people, yeah. Uh, just to add, so the actual question in the survey is either you are in a marriage, official marriage, or you are in a consensual union. For example, in some of the rural areas, this couple have been living there together in the same household, even if they're of not officially registered, they will still be show up as uh, as, uh, as sort of marriage in our data set. In the advanced economies, that type of cohabitation is probably not uh, counted in our data as Michelle said. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so that's the marriage market. Um, yeah, so it's a good question to consider if cohabitation would actually have an increasing alpha or not. Um, I, I, we would have to check that. We could certainly check that for the later years because they are specifically, they ask about cohabitation. And then the next fact is on labor force participation rates by gender and education. So I was telling you at the beginning that it's well established that labor force participation of women, so this is your left-hand side graph, and again, log GDP on the x-axis, y-axis is just labor force participation rate, is U-shaped. So in poor countries, women participate a lot in the labor market, and then as as countries become wealthier, that labor force participation decreases and then it increases again. Now, of course, for the US here, Rachel has a paper where they go farther back. You will actually also see a U-shape, but we only, since we started in 1980, you only have the upward sloping. Now, the interesting fact here, or the, the part that we didn't realize before we started looking at the data, that it is U-shaped, but this is actually for women with less than a university degree. Once you look at 
or women only with a university completed degree, you don't actually get that U shape anymore. You just get it strictly upward sloping. And for men, it's just standard. It's fairly flat, if slightly upward sloping for university completion. And then for the um, uneducated, it's just pretty much flat. Now in the US, you get a dip in labor force participation, but um, we're not going to go into that. So having said this thing about the U shape, what you can further show is that, of course, this is driven in many ways by sectors. In the aggregate, what we observe, if we look at the slope of female labor force participation within a given sector um, on log GDP, for agriculture, it's negative. So labor force participation for in poor countries is very high, and it tends to be in the agricultural sector. And then as countries become wealthier, women drop out of that sector. For manufacturing, it's pretty flat over the development um, spectrum. And for services, it's increasing. And then if you break that down by education group, not surprisingly, given just what I showed you about the U shape is that it's all driven by the uneducated um, female workers. So you have uh, a decrease in the agricultural sector in terms of participation of women, it's flat in manufacturing, it's increasing in services if you don't have a university degree. And then for women that have a university degree, it's actually universally increasing in all sectors. So just to summarize quickly these findings or what we're going to base our model and theory on is that women have about 20 to 30% the university completion rates of men in poor countries or in the poorest countries. This gap shrinks um, along the development process and then even overturns. For educated women, labor force participation is increasing modestly with development, while for low educated women, it's U-shaped. And the share of female labor force participation in agriculture is decreasing. It's flat in manufacturing and it's increasing in services with development. And these aggregate differences are driven by the uneducated. And then the last one was that assortative matching actually falls with development. And so I think even if we, so one thing to take away about the last point is that even if we account for our cohabitation like Rachel asked, I don't think the decreasing over the development process will disappear. Now it could become flatter in the US, but in the US it is all, it's, it's fairly flat already from 1980 to um, 2015. But it's unlikely that the alpha from going from 20 to two will become fully flat. And from what Ying said is given that in, in poor countries, they actually do um, measure cohabitation as, as marriage, um, it's even less likely, yeah. Okay, so that's the, the facts that we're going to base our model on. And the model is going to be fairly standard structural transformation model with um, the fact that we have though men and women. So we have a unit measure of female and male workers and they're going to have some heterogeneous cost of studying. So there's going to be a log normal cost of becoming educated. And these individuals are going to make endogenous education and labor supply decisions. And you can um, describe this set of choices as an education occupation set where they have six choices where they can be uneducated working in services, that's NS, ES, educated in services, and then the same for the good sector, NG, EG, and then, oops, there's a typo, it should be a B here, um, for the um, agricultural sector. So B is for the agricultural sector, and so NB is uneducated, and it should be EB for the educated agricultural workers. And so we're going to have production in three market sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. And it's going to be linear in a composite labor. And I'll talk about what this HK looks like in a couple of slides. And so AK is your TF, your sector specific TFP. And so this HK will be a composite between the education, educated workers, and then of course, gender. We're going to allow for perfect mobility of labor across sectors. 
and countries will differ, differ in their AK and in their HK. And this sectoral setup is, is pretty much Rachel and Barbara's paper. It's just that we include the agricultural sector and we include this education decision. So the timeline of households will be that individuals make an education choice. They mechanically match in the marriage market after that. And then households consume and make their labor supply decision. So each household is going to be composed. So we're only going to look at household pairs. And each household is going to be composed of a man and a woman with J education for the men and J prime for the woman. And of course, how are these households formed? That's going to be, depend on this assortative matching parameter. We're also going to assume that males are going to supply one unit of labor inelastically. And women, so we're only going to look at the extensive margin of labor supply here, not at the, in, not at the intensive margin. And so women can either supply market labor and then they, do home production, but it's a home production that is going to be smaller than the home production in the, if you are stay at home wife. So this Psi J, which is going to be education specific is going to be less than one. And we're just going to match um, some features in the data on home productivity hours by, by education. And otherwise, if they don't work in the labor market, they simply produce home production and home production is going to be log normally distributed from um, uh, a log normal distribution where the mean home production and the standard deviation are going to be education specific. Uh, was there a question? Okay. Maybe just an unmuted mic. Okay. Um, so with the household is then described by the woman's education decision W, which is equal one if she works in the labor market and zero otherwise, and by the education of the husband and the wife. So the J and J prime. So there's going to be eight types of households in our model, depending on the education and then the labor force participation decision. So that's the extent of the heterogeneity in the, in the model. And so that's the sort of basics of the households. And of course, they're going to have um, maximizing some utility and the utility is going to be a CES between the three types of sector, uh, sectoral outputs. So goods, G um, services, which is a uh, composite between services in the market and services produced at home and agricultural both CB, where we're going to allow for some non-homophyticity. And this non-homophyticity is going to partially be driving this U-shaped in labor force participation because households are going to maximize utility by choosing these consumption levels and women's um, labor force participation subject to a standard budget constraint. And so households will work either when, or sorry, women will work either when their wages are high enough to compensate for the loss of home production, or when the male wages are too low to satisfy the non homocyticity in agriculture. So those are the two types um, of working women. Either they're poor households and therefore ha they have to work to satisfy this below a bar, or they work because their high, wages are high enough in the market. Uh, one thing that we haven't done yet that we plan on doing is to allow for um, not perfect substitution between consumption and home production. Although since we're only looking at the extensive margin and then you would recalibrate the model, I actually don't think this should have a huge quantitative results. It would matter more if we would allow for obviously the intensive margin. And then, so the last thing to just close off the um, model, uh, the, the consumer choice is that when do you become, when does an agent become educated? Well, just the utility of being educated minus the cost of education has to be greater than the utility from being uneducated. And of course, this is an expectations because you don't actually know who you will end up marrying. You just have some expectation about the marriage market. So we're going to have cutoffs for men in, uh, in women in terms of the education costs and when they become educated. 
So that's the household. And then on the firm side, as I said before, it's linear in this composite HK of labor. And what is HK? Well, HK is a CES between educated labor and uneducated labor. So the chi here will give you the skill bias technical change parameter, or it tells you how productive educated labor is in the market and any given time in any country and any sector. So the chi K is sector specific. And then each educated and uneducated labor, H, E, K, and H, N, K, is going to be a CES between women and men. And so the SETA, J, K, here, is going to be the gender-specific productivity or female productivity. And if you were to allow for gender-biased technical change or different, uh, that would change your SETA over time. And then of Across countries, you could vary the setter to allow for differences in gender productivity across country. Since labor is perfectly mobile, wages in equilibrium will be the same irrespective of the sector a woman works in and a man works in. And but of course, the education specific and the firms are just simply going to optimize by maximizing profits subject to the wage costs. Okay, so that's the model. Um, I think I have, what, about 20 minutes to maybe a little less to go over the quantitative analysis. So we have quite a big tier because we start out with the US, then we go to Clems country, and then we do a sort of broader cross country from low to high income countries. So in particular, we're going to take this model calibrated to match the US in 1980 and 2005. And we're going to set this exercise up as a horse race. Horse race, sorry. So we actually want to match the patterns of female labor force participation um, and education rates in the US in 1980 and in 2005. We're going to use the IPOMS International for education, labor force participation, assorted sort of matching parameters, and CLEMS we're going to use for industry specific productivity parameters and consumption shares. The nice thing about the setup of the model is that the main parameters that govern productivity and that we then will vary across country. So the AK, the TFP, that sector specific, the CHI, which is the productivity of high skilled workers in each sector, the alpha, the assorted matching parameter, SETA, the gender productivity parameter, and AH, which is the, I actually, I don't think I mentioned this, but this is the average home productivity. Um, yeah, average home productivity in a given country. They can actually all be estimated um, using model identities and the data. So they don't have to be part of our calibration procedure. And, what we're going to assume is once we go cross country, we're going to keep all preference parameters the same, and we're just going to allow TF sector specific TFP, AK, and Chi K to vary. We're going to allow alpha to vary when we have information of alpha. Unfortunately, we don't have this for all countries. And then as a robustness, as I said in the introduction, we're also going to allow SETA, the gender productivity, and the AH, the home productivity to vary. So for our CLEMS countries, which are a set of OECD countries or for a set of the CLEMS countries, we can do this for 1980 and 2005, just as for the US. And we actually don't have to recalibrate the model here because all of these parameters can be computed directly from model identities in the data. And so we, you can think of this some sort of um, out of sample test of the model. And then for the rest of the IPOMS countries, so for thinking about the whole development spectrum from low, middle to high income, we're going to do a new calibration where we are going to calibrate the productivity parameters and then see what our model produces. And at each of these steps, we're going to decompose the quantitative effects of the mechanisms that I have discussed so far. So the mechanisms would be structural transformation, skill-based technical change, assortative matching, gender biased technical change if we have it in home technology changes. So what I mean by the that we can identify these parameters directly from the model is so these are the four um, gender productivity, um, educate the educated productivity, sector TFP, and then home productivity. So 
gender productivity is in the model, you can compute that that's just a function of XJ, which is the gender gap, I mean, the education specific gender gap, and the shares of women of a certain education J and in a sector K relative to share of men working in that same sector with the same education level. So once you determine your elasticity, which we're going to take from previous studies, so once you determine ADA, the elasticity between men and women, and you can get these H, F and HM from the data, you can get the gender gap from the data and you can compute your gender productivities. Similar argument can be made for um, the educated productivity. You just need to know the relative price of educated and uneducated uh, labor within a given sector. Of course, you need to know the elasticity theta between educated and uneducated workers and IEK, which is the wage bill share of educated workers in a given sector. AK straightforward, that's just YK divided by HK. And then AH, we're going to actually use from Bridgman and co-authors. They, they did this computation of what AH is for a set of CLEMS countries. And so the set of CLEMS countries we have are listed down here. I have to say for Belgium, we don't have the AH. At least I didn't find it in, in Ben's data. Um, and there are some caveats. So for example, for Spain, we don't have it for 1980, but I think it was 1983 or 85. And, and so there's a, some small things there. Okay, so parameters. Um, elasticities, they're straightforward. So sector specific, um, the consumption elasticity is close to zero. Uh, elasticity between educated and uneducated workers, that's from word all 1.53. Um, female, male, that's from Rachel's work. And then sector specific technology in 1980 is normalized to one. And um, more interestingly, oh, and maybe before that, I should say that the, the parameters we do need to calibrate, and this is where the horse race comes in, is the education cost and the home productivity costs and then the consumption parameters. So consumption parameters are just going to um, match value added shares. So that's straightforward, typical in the literature. And then these education costs and the home productivity parameters, we're going to set them in such a way that we're going to match the vice in women's education compared to the vice in men's education. And we're also going to match the vice in female labor force participation of educated and uneducated women from 1980 to 2005. So on the data identified parameters, so the sector specific technologies, they are sort of very standard numbers that are comparable to the rest of the literature. The educated productivity, what I want to show, so the first three are 1980 and then the last three are 2005 numbers is that not surprisingly, the educated productivity is lowest in agriculture and highest in services. And what you do see that they, it goes up in all sectors over time, the largest increase marginally is actually in manufacturing or in the goods sector compared to the service sector, and then it's the service sector. Female productivity, um, women are least productive in agriculture and high-skilled women in the goods sector. And then they're most productive, and this is the comparative advantage in, in the service sector. And again, we're, we're keeping um, gender productivity fixed over time, at least for the baseline. This, was, this is what I mentioned about the assortative matching parameter that it falls from 2.85 to 2.17. Oh, um, of course, here we're only looking until 2005, and 2005 is picked uh, consistently for the CLEMS data. Okay, so those are the parameters. Let me decompose what the model produces. As I said, it's a horse race and we're going to perfectly match um, the gender education gap changes in the US and labor force participation, both for educated and uneducated workers. So naturally we think skill bias technical change should explain our bias in education, which of course it does, but we would require it to explain more for women than for men. And the model produces about a third of this gen change in the gender education gap, just through skill-based technical change. So the exercise here is to keep the US in 1980 
and then say, what if only the chi's changed from 1980 to 2005, everything else fixed? How much of the gender education gap would we, or the change in the gender education gap would we reproduce? And we would reproduce about a third. But what the model also does, it would generate exactly the opposite reaction in terms of labor force participation, because wages of educated workers go up, especially educated men, women become less likely to actually engage in the market. And also there's the price effect and um, prices are changing. So they're actually more likely to stay at home, do more home production and work less. Now, I want to highlight that most of this is coming actually through the service sector, this increase in the gender education gap, or sorry, the decrease in the gender education gap so that women are catching up with men. When we run this experiment, we only allow for the CHI in the service sector to change. We get actually a slightly higher percent, but it's still about a third. In contrast, if we only allow for structural transformation, we actually can explain a lot more of the closing gender gap. And I think part of the reason for that is that with structural transformation, you also get the right effect in terms of the right direction of female labor force participation. So structural transformation makes more women enter the labor market. So education also becomes more valuable and more women become educated. Now take those two together. So skill by structural transformation. So the AK and the Kais are changing. So the only thing not changing here compared to the base model is the alphas. And what you do is you can generate a very large um, closing of the gender gap and women become much more educated than men and even more so than in, the, than in 2005. And the reason for that is, is that the alpha is falling over time. So assortative matching is actually working against a reversal of the gender education gap. As you can also see, female labor force participation is almost completely explained by these two mechanisms, and it's actually over-explained for the uneducated. Again, the alpha changing is the, is the difference that is missing to get this to 100%. So that's the baseline US model. So from there, we're going to move to cross-country results. And the first thing I'm going to show you is using CLEMS countries. And as I said before, the nice thing here is that we don't need to recalibrate anything, but instead we can compute the AK, the CHI case, the SETA case, and the AH directly from CLEMS data. And when we do this, and, and sorry, I should also say in this first part, I'm only going to allow the AK and the CHI K changing over time, but the SETA K is going to be fixed and the AH is going to be fixed. So it's going to be country specific, but it's going to be fixed. So it's, it's just the average over, over that time period between 1980 and 2005. And so what you see here, the X axis is data, the Y axis is the model, and the dashed line is the 45 degree line. And, and I also computed here an R squared for you, um, regressing one on the other and the correlation between the two. And I would say the model actually reproducing surprisingly in some ways, a lot of what we observe in terms of in the data of um, education rates across country. Now there are three countries, especially in 2005 that the model cannot match, which are Spain, Italy, and Denmark. Um, Italy is actually a country where when you compute AK from the CLEMS data, AS, so the productivity in the service sector is actually decreasing over time. I was asking Alessio whether that seems consistent and he said it, it could be consistent that it's actually decreasing over time, the AES. And as just to show you that the reason why we use AK and KIK as the benchmark is we can also allow, of course, for gender bias technical change. So the setters to change over time and the AH to change over time. And again, I should have removed Belgium here potentially, or I should put an asterisk in Belgium because for Belgium, we don't have AH. So we're just assuming it's the same as in the US. What you see is that the R squared goes up by a little bit, especially some countries, Netherlands. So this is now the light orange or yellowish line in 2005, now gets much closer to the 45 degree line. Um, and Denmark also gets a 
bit closer, but for the most countries, you actually only see a small shift by changing SETA and AH. Now we also change them separately. Again, um, not that much changes. So that's why we are happy with using the baseline for just looking at changes in AK and KIK. Uh, I forgot to mention that we actually also did a calibration for the US where we allow SETA to change. And in that instance, um, gender bias technical change can explain about 10% of the gender education gap changing over time, but it has little interaction with, uh, with the other two mechanisms, not like what we saw for a structure the skill by structural transformation where we got a much bigger increase. So, so this is what we see cross country. Now we can of course decompose that and say, okay, how much can each of this mechanism explain of the variance we observe in the data? So to note first is that the variance in the data in terms of uh, gender education gaps is larger in 1980 than it's in 2005. And Consequently, maybe also the change, the variance in the, the change in gap over time is, is larger in general than in 2005. The first thing I want to highlight here is you will notice the two in red, so structural transformation alone. So the exercise here is to take the US in 1980 and in 2005 respectively, and then just change one thing at a time to the rest of the countries. So assume Italy looks exactly like the US, but only changed the A case in 1980. And then Italy looks exactly like the US in 2005 and only changed the A case um, in Italy for 2005. And you do this for every single country. And what you observe is that the structural transformation alone can explain about a third of the variance in the change in the gap. And skill bias structural transformation can explain almost half of the variance we see in the data, while the other mechanisms don't actually explain that much. So just a little bit more focusing in on this, structural transformation explains a large amount in 2005, and it explains, a, or it explains even more than 100%, and it explains a size of about 1980. So there's two reasons for that. One is that, of course, the variation I said is smaller in 2005 than in 1980. So it's potentially not surprising that it explains more. But even if you account for the different size in, in, in variance, you still get that it explains more in 2005 than 1980. The other thing is that the A case the, the variance in the A case across countries becomes much larger moving from 1980 to 2005. Now, in contrast, if you look at skill bias technical change, it explains very little in 1980 and explains about half of the variance in 2005. The, the variation in CHI is actually similar in 1980 and in 2005, but the difference is that in 2005, so this is taking the US, and just assuming a different CHI that is um, country specific. And so the service sector in 2005 is much larger. So therefore, when you have a larger service sector and you allow for differences in skill bias technical change, you will be able to explain a larger part in this gender education gap because of course the service sector or the size of the service sector with skill bias technical change is what matters for female education more so than for men. And so, of course, once you put the two together, then you can explain a huge or you can generate a huge amount of variation in 2005 because there's a lot more variance in the size of the service sector. So the A's vary a lot more across countries and you have more skilled by technical change or skilled workers are more productive. And, and that's also why both of them together are the ones that explain the bulk of the changing in the gap or the variance of the changing gap. So for my last few minutes, because I think I'm getting out of time here, let me give you the cross country predictions for the whole development process. So what we're going to do here, unfortunately, we cannot use CLEMS because we don't have, while there is some information, we don't actually have great information to get all the A's and the CHI's. Instead, we're going to calibrate our model to a typical median low, uh, to the median low, middle, and high income country. 
from the world income distribution. And what we're going to do is we're going to allow the A and the CHI to vary to match only female targets. And we're going to also allow the alpha to vary from the data. So what targets in particular we're we going to look at? Well, we're going to look at female labor force participation, matching that, then the share of women in agricultural employment, goods and service employment, and then as well, the share of educated women in agriculture and goods and services. Um, the one thing highlighted here is that of of course, the data has a U-shape in female labor force participation, and we're going to match the same U-shape. So you'll see a U-shape in female labor force participation. You see a decrease in agriculture, a fairly flat um, slope in, in the goods sector, and an increasing slope in services. So doing that, and then here just simply plot, plotting the gender education gap is we obtain, so if you look at the red axis, so that's the median high income country, median middle income country, and the low income country, which we obtain something that's actually fairly close to the data. So let me put some numbers behind that. So one way of representing this is comparing the high with the middle country and the middle with the low country. Um, let me focus on the gender education gap. What we have is that in the data, the difference in the gender education gap between the high and the middle income countries, 21 percentage points, our model generates something a bit higher at 35 percentage points. And for the middle to low income country, it's 35 percentage points in the data and we generate something, um, I would say again, somewhat higher at 47 percentage points. Now we also ran a version of the model where we don't allow for educated workers in agriculture and then the prediction for the high income countries don't change, it's still 34 percentage points, but for the middle to low income country, it goes down to 36 percentage points, which is pretty close to the data. So one of our thoughts was is that uh, Rachel in her paper with Claudia and Barbara, they have a family farm to think about agricultural, especially the subsistent agriculture is not the same as productive agriculture. And if you think about the family farm, education might not have a value there. And you could think about a version where there's just no educated workers in agriculture and then you get a smaller gap. Now, the other thing is we're keeping education cost fixed here across countries, and you could potentially think that it varies between high and middle and low income countries, but we have nothing to say there. It's probably difficult to measure. Quickly decomposing the gap. Michelle, um, can, I, yeah. can I interrupt quickly? We have about 10 yeah. minutes left of discussion yeah. time. So I um, have like this slide. To... Okay, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> so if we decompose it, Quickly, um, only structural transformation explains um, female labor force participation as you expect. It explains a large share of actually both the gender education gaps in both um, settings. SBTC, again, labor force participation goes in the opposite effect. Um, it explains about the same amount as we see in the US from 1980 to 2005 to the high to middle, which might not be surprising because maybe the US in 1980 is closer to a middle income country and, um, and then the average high income country by 2005. And it, it's still, but it explains a large share in the middle to low income country. Um, the adjust the SBTC by itself. And the two together explain everything in high and middle income countries. So again, the skill by structural transformation seems to be a big driver on explaining cross country differences. And so, yes, that's where I conclude. So I can just skip quickly over the conclusion, general equilibrium model that's consistent. We validated with the CLEMS results. And really the main point is that Educated women are drawn disproportionately in the service sector, and so skill bias technical change alone explains a somewhat smaller share, a small share, like about a third. But skill bias structural transformation is key in accounting well for cross country differences of the closing gender education gap. And a sort of matching actually works in the opposite direction. So that's it for me. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, we have about eight minutes or so. Um, before the next presentation for questions. Um, there has been an ongoing discussion in the chat. I think most of those questions are resolved. Um, so if anyone has any other things to ask Michelle, I'm gonna exploit my 
position right now with an open mic to ask you a question. <laughs> one, is the, one is about whether um, you had, have done this or thought about doing it with, instead of university, but uh, high school. Because a lot of the low income countries are, the levels of education are so low, you're gonna have handfuls of people who have university level education and especially women um, in the data. Um, and so, and I guess, I, I guess sort of connected with that is that in a lot of that low income part of the distribution, you are seeing shifts into services, but it's not skilled services, very low skilled yeah. services, right? And so it's hard for me to think about yeah. what's going on there if you're thinking about university level education, but low skilled services. So I'm not sure if you have yeah, anything yes. I, to say there. Yeah, actually, there's two things to say that. So this is the graph for secondary schooling. So you're right, and, and it's it's actually pretty low. And, and if you don't get secondary schooling, you might not get university. I mean, you can't get university to, to start with, right? So and one issue that we thought about doing it, one issue that we were having is that we said, okay, we calibrate it to the US and then use the US parameters for other countries. Calibrating it to the US for secondary school completion is not very useful. And so then you have to figure out, okay, what can you calibrate it to, to use secondary school completion? But yes, it was definitely something we had in mind. We just haven't quite figured out how to do it in a sensible way. So any ideas, welcome on that. And um, on your second part is when we started out this project, we actually looked at high and low um, services related to my work with Alessio and Fabio. Um, but then we left it to the side for now. But I think that's a, a valid point to think about the different types of services and how that affects things. Because of, of course, there's there's differences there. I don't remember exactly the data um, on the develop uh, over the development spectrum, but we did look at low um, skilled services and high skilled services. So yeah. Probably not satisfactory answers to your question, well, except for I, it's something to consider. It is something to consider. I almost feel like 1980 is not far enough back in the US to be, yeah. you know, to be thinking about if you want to calibrate to the US education levels, you know, further back in time, maybe that would be something yeah. that um, exactly you would have to go a lot further back. Yeah. 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 And then um, you can. You don't have clamps at some point. Well, you have clamps are go, going a bit farther back. But yeah, we could think about that, definitely. Um, Joe, did you were you raising your hand? Go ahead. Yeah, I had a question. I guess uh, one thing I was thinking while you were presenting is like, um, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe like uh, Western societies or, or uh, advanced economies have sort of patted themselves on the back for progress in gender equity but it may have less to do with that stuff and just more to do with the basic economics which is which kind of interesting if that's the case um, but I was also trying to think that you know there's the other aspects of gender gaps like the gender wage gap yeah. and I and it wasn't clear to me like whether you guys whether your model has any gender wage gap in it because if you put a wedge in there I imagine then all of a sudden some things that would ordinarily an envelope theorem would make them irrelevant might become more important if you're having a gender wage gap but i just didn't see whether you, you put like yeah, a so, for that so the gender wage gap is coming through the setters here through the productivities so the x is the gender wage gap and so the gender wage gap will determine the relative productivity of men and women and that's so this is the i see so there's not education a specific yeah, so it's it's just coming through these productivities. So this is also why over time, if set a changes, that will change your gender wage gap. If I want to think about that as being not true productivity, but sexism, is that going to change something substantially? Or <sighs> I'm curious whether this would interact somehow. Yeah, so I guess what would happen is that the setter should be higher then. And then women are taxed or something like that, and the tax is thrown away. That that would be sort of sexism, right? Yeah, I would have to think what the effects of that would be. I mean, it still would just result in lower wages for women. So they should still react in terms of what education decisions they make on that. I'm not sure actually it would have 
a different implication now thinking about it. Yeah. I mean, one way to think about that is if it's really sexism, that then the women actually are productive. It's just they don't get to keep all the money. Yeah, um, yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. Yeah, so you yeah. tax so them it, and you throw it away. Well, it wouldn't be thrown away. It's just given to the men. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you could do it then. Because you don't want to. Yeah. You don't want well, to change it would the just output. be income effects. Yeah, I guess. I, yeah, I you don't want to change the out. You don't want to change the output. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, just just one quick one on the overview. You know, when you started the paper, you talk about the importance of the education gap for bargaining and insurance. Yeah. And they all have to do with like a family structure, which is why you started the model yeah. of the family. But then at the end of the presentation, it gives a feeling as if it is not very important quantitatively that uh, you know, family structure, or is it because you haven't had time to go through it? So what is the role of the family here? Well, no, I mean, the, 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 one, the only thing that we have is just saying that the marriage market is changing. So, so we don't actually, so family structure, we don't have bargaining or anything like that in the house, in the model, right? And so we don't actually have anything to say there. And the, the marriage market is something much more mechanical that saying that, how do you meet another person? And so this alpha would suggest that even if there's very few educated people, but alpha is very high, you're more likely to meet somebody else that's also educated. So that's the only thing we have related to household structure. So we don't have anything related to this idea of bargaining. We, the insurance thing, for example, that's about divorce um, loss. In, in my paper. And so we don't have anything like that in there. So that's why we're saying we're using a very simple marriage market. So we're not saying that the marriage story is wrong. We're just saying this is a parallel and we're testing this cross country. It would obviously be interesting to think about a more um, vigorous household structure, but you can take this as like the first pass of trying to see how much of cross country differences can you actually explain with just productivity and technology. And then would be interesting to say, okay, if you think about a more careful household structure and marriage market, how important is that? Just a sort of matching alone won't goes in the wrong direction. I guess that's all we're saying. And our originally when we started, we put a sort of matching in because we expected a sort of matching to go up over time. And therefore it would actually increase the incentive to become educated, but it turns out that the data is actually different from what we expected. So we, yeah, we were surprised by that. We're actually thinking of writing a paper on that just because it was surprising to us. And I mean, there is this paper by Eike and Mark Nemox at JPE. I don't think it's well known in macro, that paper. At least I didn't know about it until we started doing this. Um, and Ying founded the paper. But yeah, so that that's just a surprising because I think we're more used to the Jeremy Greenwood work which it's it's not inconsistent but they find okay our sort of matching goes up because those types of couples go up over time yeah okay um thank you so much michelle uh and thanks to your co-authors ying and chi um fan do you want to share your slides uh joe's question about the gender wage gap was a good um uh, promo for your paper. <laughs> uh, Fan is going to talk about the distribution of the gender wage gap and equilibrium model. Hello. And I think you need, yeah, there you go. Go ahead. Hi, yes. Can, um, is the sound working okay for everyone? Okay, great. Thank you for the opportunity to present this paper. It's uh, so we're going to talk about the labor force participation as well as the gender wage gap. And this is a paper with uh, Sonia Balatra, Manuel Fernandez, and me. I'm at the University of Houston. 
And uh, uh, as was just mentioned, this paper closely relates to what was just presented. I, I will not try to make linkages everywhere, but as, as the paper was presented, uh, I was thinking about that. And you will see a lot of uh, related structures, although we focus on different questions. And, uh, and so I think, yeah, we can have a discussion at the end about what the differences are, which could be very interesting. So uh, let me get started. Yeah. So as we as we well know, there is a substantial secular rise in the female in female labor force participation, uh, and this is something that we have seen over the world and throughout the last century, and it continues to happen today. In our empirical setting, we're looking at Mexico. We're going to have data from 1989 to 2014, during which female labor force participation increased by about 50 percent. So in the chart below here, we have the years along the x-axis. Along the left-hand side y-axis, we have the female labor force participation rate increasing from about 35 percent to 60 percent. And, and as you can, uh, as we also know, male labor force participation doesn't change that much. And it's fairly high. So that's shown along the right-hand side y-axis. It's uh, generally over, slightly over 90 percent. And uh, so what we want to understand is how has this substantial change uh, in female labor force participation uh, been impacting and has been related to also changes in the wage structure between men and women. So let's look at some additional motivating data on wages. Um, so we see that there has been a substantial change in the wage gap, but significantly not just in the mean, but differently along the distribution. In fact, there's not that much change at the mean or the median, relatively speaking. We see two opposing things happening at the bottom and the top, at the top of the distribution, things are quite different. So at the top of the distribution, we see a decline of the gender gap, but below median for lower paying types of jobs, we see a widening of the gender wage gap. So one of the motive, this has motivating fact, and I'll show you a figure on the next slide. Well, the way we want to think about this is that maybe these divergent patterns are consistent with differences in female labor supply. Uh, if women are more substitutable for men in higher paying jobs than in lower paying occupations. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So this is a chart that shows just the raw unconditional distribution differences between men and women when we take the difference at each point of the distribution between 2012, uh, circa 2012 and circa 1992. And you can see the fact that we mentioned, which is at the higher parts of the percentile, there has been a decline in the wage gap. Of course, men's wage was higher and remains to be higher, but at the bottom part of the distribution has been widening. And this has been accompanied by the rise in female labor force participation. Okay, so how does this elasticity of substitution idea uh, work for us? And, and let me actually do mention, so in the prior paper, we had the gender substitutability, right? But that wasn't varying by skill groups or by occupations. So when we talk about substitutability, we're talking about the same parameter, but now adding a subscript to it compared to the prior paper presented. So we're going to assume that men and women are imperfect substitutes in production which was also assumed in the prior paper. And uh, in this context, increases in women's labor supply will exert downward pressure on both male and female wages potentially, but the pressure could be larger, uh, oh, it should be larger on female wages, right? Because that's where the supply chain is mainly coming from. Uh, so this should be widening the gender wage gap. But how much this happens differs depending on the substitutability between male and female workers. And we will allow for this to be different by task content of occupation. And there are gonna be sort of some tasks that are at the lower end of the income uh, wage spectrum and other tasks that, that are at the higher end of the spectrum. So one more slide of motivating facts. So we're gonna break our, uh, in this Mexico data set where we have micro data on occupations and wages, we're gonna break the uh, occupations into three groups, uh, abstract tasks and tens of occupations, routine and manual following the literature. And if we look at these three charts, what we have here along the axis, axis again, 1989 to 2014. And for the y-axis on the left hand side, we're showing the log male to female earnings ratio change, earning or 
they should be replaced by a wage. So by when, when I say wage and earning, they mean the same thing in the in this setting. So uh, log of wage change. So you, um, and then on the right hand side of the y axis, we see the log of the relative supply change. So what do you see in panel A and panel C for abstract and manual occupations? Oh, sorry, in panel A and panel B for abstract and routine occupations. Um, Sorry, but you know, if you look at abstract, that the chart, the pattern there is different than what you see in B and C. In routine and manual occupations, you see this crossing between these two lines. As the black line is rising, the black line is the wage ratio. The, the dashed line is decreasing, um, right? And however, for abstract occupations, as both lines are going downwards, right? So in other words, if you think about uh, relatively increase uh, in, in female labor supply that's accompanied at the same time by a reduction in the wage gap for abstract, but that's not happening in the routine and manual occupations. And we're going to try to think about, uh, so this is a motivating fact that we're going to use to uh, uh, think about why it's reasonable to allow for these elasticities to potentially differ, the gender elasticity to differ by these uh, occupations. Okay. And also similar to the prior paper, we will bring into this analysis the equilibrium model. Um, so the way we think about this equilibrium model is that we're we're thinking that it extends these kind of canonical labor demand supply models. I think this comes a little bit more from the micro literature, um, and um, there's a, a large line of literature extending to to today where people are. Uh, are going to basically be focused on these kind of CES demand structures and trying to estimate different elasticity and relative share parameters. And so that's what we're going to adopt as well on the demand side. We're going to have a nested CES very similar to what you just saw, but we're going to allow the elasticity to vary by occupation. And we're going to try to study the variations over time, right? So we want to allow for time varying labor shares by gender, skill, and occupation groups to be different. And we want to see how these um, different patterns are changing, how they explain the observed changes in gender wage and participation gaps. On the supply side, we will incorporate in this, um, we think also a fairly standard structure where households or workers, male and female workers of different skill levels are going to choose among the different occupations, abstract, routine, and menu, but also home production. And importantly, we're going to incorporate here a bunch of observables, observable patterns in Mexico. Um, that uh, the four dimensions are uh, overall fertility rate by gender and skill groups, uh, marital status by gender and skill group appliance availability, meaning whether they have a fridge or they have other types of key household appliances, and then also women's rights. We think of these as potential non-wage shifters of female labor force participation. And then on top of that, uh, that participation rate is going to be multiplied by population level, right? These are the demographics. And we're going to allow for demographics to vary by gender and skill. And this is um, other, so in, in this context, we're going to view skill, which is basically college or non-college educated, as an exogenous thing that we're going to be feeding into the model uh, rather than modeling endogenous educational choices. And, and uh, yeah, okay. So to summarize our findings uh, on the elasticity end, we find that uh, uh, this elasticity of substitution between male and female worker is about three for these high paying abstract tasks, which have arisen in importance over these 20 years in Mexico. But for the lower, uh, uh, lower task, uh, the lower paying manual and routine occupations, it's about 1.2. So more like uh, Cobb Douglas and uh, consistent with uh, so this is consistent with the increase in female labor force participation that exer exerts less downward pressure on female relative to male wages in the higher paying relative to the lower paying occupations. Uh, in other words, if we're thinking about having a female or a male PhD as a co-author, there's they're very substitutable. But if we're thinking of have, having a, a male versus female mine coal mine worker, they're less substitutable. And this is driving the changes in relative wage, uh, we argue, in this uh, setting, in the setting of Mexico. And in terms of the estimated demand trends, uh, uh, so we find that um, these demand trends, as others have found, have favored female workers and more so for skilled female workers, especially in abstract and routine task intensive occupations. So the demand there is rising relatively. And so, in effect, the, the skill and analytical demand rise is overwhelming the supply, supply increase. And then 
on the other end, the for the lower skilled and non-learned co-workers, uh, there's a rise in supply, but not relatively as much rise in demand. So, so we see this um, the resulting widening of the gender wage gap that we saw earlier. We try to use we use this frame. Remember, we were saying you know we have these different uh, things on the supply side. These potential uh, these observables that are driving female labor part force participation choices and we also have this demographic factor so we can use this framework that we have to study which demand and supply side dimensions has larger or smaller effects on the changes in gender wage and participation gap so um or and some of our key findings here are for the non-wage determinants of labor force participation, we find that appliance availability change and fertility change are very important, but for two different groups. So increasing appliance availability has led to substantial increases in unskilled female labor force participation, which um, I think relates to uh, the name Greenwood just, was just mentioned, right? relates to a lot of the, the Greenwood uh, type research that uh, has pointed out the importance of, of these types of things. And this has hastened the divergence of the gender gap at the bottom of the wage distribution where these unskilled female workers are. On the other hand, decreasing fertility for skilled women has increased skilled female labor force participation. And this actually muted the convergence of the gender wage gap at the top of the wage distribution. Uh, so that's one dimension. In terms of demographics, these uh, so over time, there's a substantial skill upgrading in women. Lots more, more women are being getting educated. Overall population also doubled. Uh, and there has there was also a lot of emigration of unskilled men out of Mexico. And uh, the most important factor we find here is the skill upgrading by women. And we find that this helped to widen the gender labor force participation and helped to narrow the wage gap. And we will talk about that in greater details later about why that is happening. Um, but to forecast that one of the key things that um, that the different elasticity is going to allow us to have is the elasticity basically is a propagating mechanism. Um, depending on what the elasticity in each of the subnets are, what happens in one particular segment in the labor market will have larger or smaller effects on other segments. Uh, so, and so because of that, depending on, on where the exhaustion change is taking place um, in terms of changes in the supply or changes in the demand, that will propagate the different of the subnets differently because now we're allowing for these elastics to, to differ by these uh, subnets based on uh, occupations. And then finally, we, we really are focused also on this difference between GE and PE, um, which um, I think uh, is a very important thing here because in a lot of the literature where you take wage as as uh, something that doesn't change the participation decision of women or men um, there's there might not be you might just say look i'm going to change the labor demand and labor supply is this exogenous thing that's fixed right but in this framework because wage can potentially change labor force participation so there's a big difference between um, counterfactuals that consider equilibrium wage responses versus that those that do not and we see that sometimes the g effects can attenuate um, the PE effects in specific for these non-wage determinants of labor force participation, but they might also be magnifying these. Um, so we will look at some of these results later. Okay, so, so that was the introduction. Now let me tell you a little bit more about our data set. We're using the Mexican Household and Income Expenditure Survey. And uh, this is a nationally representative survey with, I think, about 50,000 households between um, across these 25 years. 25 years. And so we're going to have monthly labor remuneration uh, income from various sort of uh, income sources. And we're going to exclude the government transfers and profit from self-employment. It's a tricky thing what to do with self-employment. So we're really just focused on wage workers. Another tricky thing is some people are part-time workers. Sometimes people are full-time workers. We do some robustness check on the differences. Um, this paper is not focused on flexible versus inflexible work. We have a different paper that does that. So here we're focused just on the full-time workers, but our results are fairly robust to, to other considerations uh, when you change these thresholds. And most importantly, we're going to focus on prime age workers, population between age 25 and 55. Previously, I said we take demographics as given, meaning education and gender are given. Uh, and we think that part of the reason that that maybe is a little is okay in this setting is because most education decisions are going to be made prior to age 25, and and so we're looking at the post-education attainment completion decisions in labor market in the labor market. 
Um, I will show you, so uh, it's a little bit small to see the text here, but basically this is this showing you how from the micro data we're able to identify different occupation groups. Uh, we, we calculate the syntax of how much abstract tasks, routine tasks, manual tasks there is in each of these occupations. So what do we mean by abstract? For example, managers would be an abstract. Uh, occupation because they are they have the highest score from abstract compared to their routine manual score. What would be something that's routine? Well, a machine operator, a craft and trade person, clerical person, those are routine under our categorization. What would be manual? Transport, street sales, domestic services. Um, so that's our classification. And in terms of wages, as you can imagine, the analytical jobs have relatively speaking higher wages, and the manual jobs have relatively speaking the lowest wage. So that, so thinking about these three categories maps also to the wage distribution that we were uh, looking at earlier. Okay, so prior to putting together everything in the you know, full structural model, we do some, uh, let me just call it descriptive data analysis using uh, unconditional quantile regression methods from Firpo et al. 2009, and uh, I won't go into the details of this, but through these unconditional quantile regression methods, we're able to generate this figure, which uh, allows us to say, okay, there are two things that are potentially changing over time. One is uh, how much each, how much our workers being paid, the, the wage structure, and the, the other thing is uh, the composition of uh, workers from different groups by like gender, by education, etc. And what we see from, from this decomposition exercise is most of the changes we saw earlier in terms of the, the overall unconditional quantile changes in the wage distribution is really driven by the wage structure change, not the compositional change. So that helps us to motivate why it's important to have an equilibrium model where wages are going to be endogenous. And, you, um, and uh, for time reasons, I won't go into details about this particular analysis, and I'll go into the model. So before we look at the, the full model, let's lay out the, the key framework, the core objects that we're playing with in this framework. So we have rising female labor force participation. It can influence wage structure through four channels, imperfect substitutability of male and female labor, gender bias, technological change, demographic compositional change, and non-wage shifters of labor supply or labor force participation. So we believe that in contrast to maybe not most, um, maybe not most of the macro literature, but maybe more on the micro side, most of the literature, we model these channels as operating in a context which labor supplies a lot to respond to changes in the wage structure. So let's look at some two equations which captures the entirety of our model setup. So on the supply side, we have this equation. So uh, letter O is occupation, we have three, we have gender G N, and we have time T. So labor supply in occupation O by gender at time T is the population, the demographic, right? The red demographic times the share of that population group that is participating. And that participation rate is driven by this equation here. Uh, so that includes the wage from all the occupations, right? Not just the occupation O, but also the other occupations because they're choosing relatively. And also this B gen, this B, B variable, which are the appliance availability, fertility trends, women's rights, these other things that can be impacting you that is not wage related. The side parameter here can be zero. So if this is zero, then wage is not going to matter. So then with respect to wage, labor supply is inelastic. And, uh, and then the only the B, B, B would impact things through changes in pi. And then on the other hand, for labor, uh, for demand, demand optimality from the CS re structures requires that um, leads to this kind of equation that we're all very familiar with. And very importantly for us, so in the, you know, in the literature that, that we're, we're um, looking at, often people refer to this L ratio as labor supply. But of course, in this setting, that's equilibrium labor outcome. So it's not something you can just take exogenously from the outside as that's easily a, where you can find some easy instruments for. That's an equilibrium outcome along with the Ws. And for the demand side, we have these alpha changes that are occupation specific. These are the potential, the, the share parameters, the intensity to which labor inputs are used, representing changes in gender bias technology or skill bias technology over time. And then also importantly, in blue here, we have sigma rho O, these occupation specific elasticities that we were mentioning earlier. So how do these four things, the, the three red and the one blue, how do they interact all together? Well, rewriting these two equations together, uh, at the end, the, the purpose of the paper is to estimate the parameters um, that are here, and then to think about these three red objects here as 
where we places where we can do counterfactuals to decompose um, the source of the observed changes. So first, in terms of exhaustion changes, if pi is equal to zero, as we just described, supply shifters can impact labor force participation. That's one exhaustion change in these changes in B over time. Second, supply curve shift with compositional change in population. So the demographic changes that's going to come from the data. And then thirdly, relative demand shifts, this alpha, that's something that we're going to be estimating that can also change, that's also exogenous from the perspective of the model. Then the endogenous determine the vector of W and the vector of L. And um, in particular, if psi is greater than zero, then B will have an indirect effect on labor force participation um, through wage. Population will impact labor force participation through wage, and alpha also will impact labor force participation through wage, uh, even though L and alpha are not in the labor force participation uh, equation directly. So that's the setup that we have. And um, now more generally, we put this uh, structure in the context of the ne uh, nested CS model, uh, which again is similar to what was presented earlier, uh, except that we nest the occupation strongly with um, the, the education, the gender layer. So we have a three layer nested problem. And this is giving you two of the big branches. Here on the left hand side, we have the analytical branch. Here we have the routine branch. There's also a manual branch. So aggregation uh, at the top level is over those three, those three branches. Then within each branch, it aggregates over uh, skill and unskilled worker, meaning college and non-college educated. And then in the third, in the bottommost layer, the layer that actually touches the data, we have uh, male and female workers. So altogether, because we have three times two times two, so we're gonna have 12 worker groups and 12 equilibrium wages and 12 labor quantities in each period of the data. I find um, just a clarification. Yeah. You go back uh -huh. to that. If you apply this structure to the uh -huh. whole economy versus yeah. if you apply this structure to within each industry, will mm -hmm. your two sigma estimate be very different? So, if, so I think what we're doing here is we're allowing for elasticity between analytical routine and manual tasks, right? So I think the version of this this model where you solve for these three things separately is in effect assuming some uh, some making some assumption on the elasticity term, right? So we're we're going to try to estimate the elasticity in the topmost layer. If that if I answer your question. No, so, no. My question is, uh -huh. if you do this structure for the yeah. whole economy, okay. Uh -huh. Versus if you do this structure just for a particular sector. So let's say you just take manufacturing. Uh -huh. the I see, I see. Okay. Thing. The question uh -huh. is, would those elasticity, your two sigma, be very different? Because so I, when you do yeah. it for the whole economy, that could be some mixture that due to the substitutability across sector as well. Yeah, so from our perspective, the abstract routine menu, these are, from our perspective, even though these are task content, right, these are occupation groups, right? So because, you know, abstract is all the tasks that are behind, um, all the occupation that we, be, we, we found to be abstract intensive, right? So I think the way that we're approaching, uh, the, the way that we're addressing your question is that uh, we are keeping it flexible, by allowing for these um, the aggregation at the sector level, but allowing the parameters to be flexible. Um, so in effect, we are allowing for this the what you would call sector-specific parameters to be different, right? But then also allow for aggregation across the sectors of the economy. Now there might be other ways to aggregate this rather than abstract routine and many other ways to do sector, right? Um, and that might lead to changes. But this is uh, the way that we're approaching sectors here. And as we see the parameters, but we can go back to this question again. But thank you for the question, Rachel. Okay, so now, you know, how do these, so we already saw a very similar equation. So very, just very briefly, uh, we have the alpha shear parameters, which in this case at the level one is between analytical types of occupations and routine and manual. We add this extra nesting here um, because we we think that maybe analytical is fundamentally different than routine and menu. So we have row two, which is the elasticity between routine and menu, and row one, which is the elasticity between analytical and routine and manual aggregated occupations. And um, then the, so, 
and these are all going to be estimated. The, there's overall ZT parameter, which because we only have one country, right? So it's just going to be whatever the residual is, whatever other out inputs there are, that's going to capture everything else that's not labor here, that's varying over time. And so we cannot distinguish between productivity and changes in other inputs that we're not modeling. In the next layer, the skills, we have skilled and unskilled with a shear parameter alpha three, that's occupation time specific. Now note crucially, uh, row three is occupation spe uh, specific, right? So these elasticity, skill elasticities are occupation specific. We also allow for these skill elasticities, uh, not skill, uh, gender elasticities to be occupation specific. Um, but to limit parameters a little bit, this row four at the final layer is not, is not both gender and occupation specific. It's only occupation specific. Okay. And so we end up with these, um, a vector of alpha four parameters, alpha three, alpha two, alpha one. And then because it's over time, so it's following the literature, we assume this polynomial form for how the alphas evolve. On the elasticity end, we have three gender substitutability parameters, three skill substitutability, and two occupation substitutability parameters. On the supply side of the model, we have uh, a standard multinomial logic type structure where workers at each T choose between these occupations at home production. No, because the, because and uh, so we have weights, it's gender speak, scale and occupation specific. And there's some intercept term with some taste shocks. Um, the, the, if you want to choose home production, uh, the thing that impacts these are, are the four things that we're incorporating that we mentioned earlier. Uh, something related to fertility, marital status, appliance availability, and WBL. So these will um, proportionally kind of impact the occupations in the equal in the same way because they're relatively only impacting home production. And WL is this index from the World Bank that we're using. And because it's a multinomial logic, so we can have this simple structure where the pro uh, the probability is this expression. Uh, we have the total labor supply, which is the product as we discussed earlier of the demographics times the participation rate by demographics. Equilibrium is straightforward. Um, it's optimality in terms of relative wage and margin rate of substitution between these two types of workers in each one of the low subnets, and we want to equate between labor demand and supply. Even and, and one thing to mention here is even though this is specific in the female male labor supply situation, but the general framework and the estimation framework that we develop is applicable to other types of subscripting as well. Okay, now, uh, so in this particular structure, we are not able to derive analytical solution, despite the seeming sim simplicity on both ends, right? But it's nevertheless, less, there's still no equilibrium analytical solution. However, the equilibrium solution is fairly straightforward. We end up, I won't go through the detail here, but basically you equate demand and supply, and you're able to end up with the equation where female wage in a particular occupation is a function of female a vector of female wages, which also impact the male wages. K here may represents the male wages. And so you're able to derive, you know, a setting here, uh, a, a number of equations, the number of unknowns with wages. So given parameters, you can, you know, fairly um, organize ways solve for equilibrium wage solutions. Estimation presents a major challenge because as you saw earlier, we have a whole bunch of parameters, right? We're not going to micro data, but we're going to these um, year by year sector aggregated gender and uh, um, aggregated wage and uh, labor labor supply data. So there's going to be, it's kind of, um, it's not really micro micro data estimation, but it's sort of in between macro estimation, and micro estimation. And the three challenges that we see is, well, you have all these parameters at these different nest levels. What do you do with that? You have the elasticity and shear parameters at each nest level, and you also have the demand supply parameters. All together, we end up with um, 12 nests, 29 supply and 65 demand parameters, and we have 312 model predictions over these 13 years because our data is observed every two to three years. Um, we we don't have time to go into details here, but in the paper, we spent quite substantial uh, parts of the appendix discussing identification. So we did discuss identification across nests using relative wages within a cross nest, which I think is standard in the literature. Then the lowest nest directly faces these observed wage and labor quantities. Higher nest levels generate these aggregate wages and quantities based on lower level parameters and observables. We discussed the data requirement for jointly identifying these elasticity and demand share parameters. Um, in the context of those using these polynomials to describe the changing shear parameters. And the cr critically, there's this concept of time invariance of demand shares after differencing. So even though polynomials seem flexible, but actually it's, it's imposing a strong structure because once you 
do the fourth difference of a third order polynomial, then it's time invariant, right? So that's the key assumption you're using to identify things there. And then estimation proceeds by searching for demand supply side parameters that generate the best fit between equilibrium predictions and the data across all these um, sector gender and skill specific nests of wages and quantity, labor quantities. Um, so in one more slide on this, so we have these W and L, we have all these parameters, and we assume that there might be some measurement error, eight and epsilon for the labor and wage, and then we estimate these via GMMM using the score of log likelihood. Again, for more details, uh, please see our paper. One thing I do want to mention is, in contrast to what we believe is the standard uh, sort of CES-based demand side only estimation, once you think about these in this equilibrium framework, it makes them um, and very tricky to think about what, what is often done in this literature, specifically, um, so for demand based on the estimation, you have potential bias for measurement error, bias if, especially if, if both wage and labor are measured with error. Once that's the case, then um, this estimation becomes tricky and you need an instrument. But instruments are hard to find because when labor supply is elastic with respect to wages, supply shocks, which usually is something like, um, uh, supply shock that are uncorrelated with demand shocks, which usually is something like a demographic shock, are no longer valid instruments because equilibrium quantities are determined jointly by demand supply shocks. And so, so um, unless the labor supply is fully inelastic to wages, uh, it's very hard to think about what a potential valid instrument is. And also, it, what, we have this data that's over two or four years, right? And in this setting, it's also hard to find what we call equilibrium supply shifters, which means um, you have only a shift in the supply and no changes in demand. And that's sometimes using reduced form estimation as well, using the CS structure, but that's also hard in this context. And because of these reasons, though, that's why we adopt equilibrium solution-based estimation. And we'll make a strong argument for why that's important in this setting. Okay, so I will talk uh, very briefly about the fit and then we'll show you the key, some of the key counterfactual results. So basically, um, we have a lot of parameters. As you can imagine, we're gonna fit the data fairly well. These are the patterns we showed earlier on changes in relative supply between female and male, and also changes relative earning or wages. And these all fit pretty well. Participation rate also fit fairly well. Um, now, what are the estimates? So I hope this is large enough. So for the substitutability parameters, remember we have eight of them. At the lowest level for male versus female substitutability, uh, we have for the analytical types of occupation about 2.9. So if I remember from the prior paper, it was closer, it was fairly close to this number, right? But when we do this for the man manual and routine occupations, it's substantially lower, meaning Again, from the example from before, it's easy to substitute a female and male PhD uh, as a co-author on a paper, but it's less perhaps easy to substitute um, people doing these manual and routine tasks where men and women might be doing, even though they're in the same occupation, they might be doing very different things, right? Um, so, so that's one thing. And then on the education, on the second layer, when we look at the skill elasticity also by occupation, we see that manual, uh, uh, analytical is, not very substitutable. So you cannot easily substitute a skilled worker for unskilled worker. Routine is also not very substitutable, but manual, relatively speaking, is. So you can replace an unskilled manual worker with a skill. The skilled worker might not appreciate that, but they're gonna be relatively easy, you know, similarly substitutable to each other. Finally, for occupations, we don't see much, um, um, so, so it's very close to one for both of these cases. So they don't, they're not uh, too interesting in our setting here. Okay, in terms of these alpha trends, the polynomial trend that we end up estimating, uh, so we have these uh, on the first uh, bottommost layer, layer level three, we have these gender share parameters. If these are sloping downward, that means uh, relative demand for female is increasing. And so we see that that is the case. It's increasing more rapidly for the uh, college educated, but it's also increasing for high school educated. And then for, for the skill bias, so if this is increasing, that means skilled workers are being appre uh, relatively appreciated more by the demand side over time. So these are rising, uh, which uh, follows much of the literature. Um, so given all these estimates, we can, on the supply side, uh, so those were, the de those were demand side estimates, right? Now on the supply side, once we estimate our model, we can look at these wage elasticities. How much does a change, you know, change in wage impact uh, in terms of elasticity 
labor force participation and every labor supply. So uh, as has been pointed out, the literature, women are more elastic, male are much less. And uh, so, you know, female labor, the elasticity is close to 0 0.5, which is very substantial, but male is below 0 0.1. Not too much difference between skill and unskilled for, for male. Partly this is because there's so much, so many male who are participating in the, in the labor force already. Uh, we can do this also by these occupation groups. Uh, we don't have time to go through this, but we do these um, in a very detailed way for cross elasticity, own and cross elasticities. And they operate in an expected way. So, okay. So in my final, I think I have five minutes. So you might, or do I have five minutes? Yeah, you have a you have about eight minutes left. Oh, okay, great. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'll use the remaining eight minutes to talk about uh, counterfactuals. So for counterfactuals, which you know, the, we develop this framework, we estimate all these parameters at the end, we want to understand the relative importance of the three red, right? The three red that we pointed out earlier, how do they impact things in terms of wage and labor force participation? So to remind you, we have non-wage determinants of labor force participation, demographics, and demand parameters. The way we're going to do these counterfactuals, we're going to keep each one, each one of these things at their 1989 value, resolve the model. In PE, we're going to take the observed wage path as given. In GE, we're going to resolve for all the wages. And we want to see, given these, um, if we kept these at 1989, how would the gap be for wages and for labor force participation? And so, and in terms of the, the facts in ter along each one of these dimensions, for the non-wage determinants of labor force participation, there was a dramatic substantial increase in appliance availability for unskilled women, a reduction in fertility for skilled women on the demographic end. There's increase in skilled women among skilled potential workers, so skill upgrading more college educated women. There's also increasing emigration of unskilled male potential workers. On the demand side, those are based on not data, but estimates that we just showed, which skill bias technological changes favoring favoring the skilled and gender bias technological changes favoring women across these nests. So as these drivers change, what is the overall result? So this table here summarizes the overall result, um, not by the occupation or sales, but overall. So let me tell you what's going on here. Of, across the columns, we have in the first column, the model reason, the model prediction without counterfactual. This is, it's called model, but it matches the data very, very uh, closely. So this is the column one is what is happening in the model or the data without counterfactual changes. Then we have two columns for the two key drivers of non-wage labor force participation, fertility appliance, demographics, skill upgrading by women, increasing emigration of unskilled women, and finally demand for gender demand share and skill demand share. Then we have these two panels here. The top one is for 100 times the change in male minus female labor force participation. At the bottom here, we have 100 times change in the log of male over female wage ratio. Okay, so I have highlighted out here a bunch of pink factors. These are the factors that have led to a reduction in male to female labor force participation or the wage gap. If you look at column one, both have gone down over these 25 years. So First, let's focus uh, on, and, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing, which is the first row and the third row are PE results. The for second row and the fourth row are the GE results. So if we look at the first column here, this is saying the fertility change everywhere was leading to a reduction in the gender gap and also a reduction, a, a wage gap and the participation gap. You see that um, this 17% says the overall reduction in, of this about 20 percentage point, 17% can be attributed to the fertility uh, reduction for skilled women, basically. And But then when we do GE, this mutes the effects a little bit. So this now only explains 10% of the gap um, of the change in the in the data. Um, the, over here, we also see a muting once we look at the GE effect and PE is larger. And this, again, is because as female, uh, as, as skilled women, have less babies, they work, they, they participate more, and this generates this, um, because these skilled women earn higher wages and participate more, so that's what the PE effects are coming from, and the GE effects are muting them because as they participate more, their rel the wage is going down a little bit, so once you consider the wages, these changes, their, their contribution to these reductions are no longer as substantial as without the wage consideration. For appliance availability, however, uh, these help to this help to contribute to the reduction in the labor force participation gap very substantially, especially in PE. So the unskilled 
for the unskilled women, um, there was such a large re increase in appliance availability, and that really substantially led to unskilled women willing to participate more. And if you only do PE, they, that accounts for the majority of the change in labor force participation, the reduction. But GE, much smaller, because these unskilled women's wage are going to increase, right? So or sorry, going to decrease as they participate more, so there's less incentive for them to participate. Uh, participate. On the other hand, the gender wage ratio uh, goes in the opposite direction. So this appliance increase, uh, appliance availability increase, doesn't help with the gender wage gap. It makes it go in the opposite direction because these um, because these women, these unskilled women, they don't earn as much wage, right? So as they participate more, they're going to help to drive down the wage gap because there's compositionally more unskilled women in the workforce. And so that's the, where the PE result comes from. The, the GE result um, uh, magnifies that a little bit uh, or because of the, the wage change, as uh, wage reduction as these women are participating more. Um, and then for demographics, for skilled female, the, uh, the very, very large increase in the share of skilled women in the population. And that led to, interestingly, if you look at here, uh, a, a, a substantial reduction. It was helping to explain the reduction in the labor force participation gap, which one would expect because these women, the skilled women, have higher participation rate than the unskilled women. They also have higher wage rate. So this also helps to explain in PE the reduction in the wage gap. But once we consider the GE effect, it turns out that the skilled women actually, um, once equilibrium is taken into consideration, they actually do not contribute to the reduction in the gender wage, uh, gender participation gap, but it helps to make it go in the other direction, um, partly because the presence of these additional skilled women really substantially uh, muted the potential wage increase women would have gotten, both skilled and unskilled, if these very skilled women didn't become available. So if they didn't become available, the, the other women would have been demanded more and and uh, labor force participation would have been higher. However, over here on the wage and this GE effect actually magnifies this P effect a little bit. Um, in terms of emigration, emigration didn't play a substantial role. So these effects here, relatively speaking to the other columns are smaller, uh, largely because the the uh, so most of the changes, the increase in immigration is from unskilled men, and uh, that uh, has the effect relatively to the other categories, but it wasn't sub as substantial as the changes in other categories, basically. And finally, on the demand side, these the increasing gender and skill bias technological changes substantially help to explain the overall change. Here, we don't have the PE result, just GE, because um, uh, by PE, we mean the supply side PE responses. And so when we look at demand, there's no supply side change, just the demand side change. Okay, so that summarizes the results, the overall result. And um, in my remaining maybe one minute, let me go through one counterfactual here, which is this female skill, skill upgrade, which because previously we talked all these things about the elasticity, right? It, and you know the propagating effects of these elasticities. How do they really matter in this counterfactual? In the summary, it's so aggregated here, but here let me tell you a story of what female skill upgrading is doing through the elasticity lens. So under PE, as skilled female workers become more available, they earn higher wages, have higher labor force participation. So compositionally, that's going to reduce the gender labor force participation wage gap. But once we look at GE, now we have we can go sector by sector. First, let's think about skilled females. Because we're increasing the number of skilled females, right? So of course that's going to reduce their labor supply. So initially there's no change in demand, just a change in supply. So of course, female skilled wages is going to go down. But because of the row four parameter, which is the analytical gender substitutability between skilled male and female workers, as female labor supply goes down, a female skilled labor supply goes down, and female skilled labor wage goes down there's going to be less demand for skilled male as well. This, the demand for skilled male goes down because of this propagation effect of the substitutable row four. And because of that, skilled male wages are going to go down. Then we go to the unskilled workers. The unskilled workers are going to be also impacted because of the high menu skill substitutability row three menu between male and female. So as the wages for both skilled and unskilled skilled men and women go down, uh, this leads to a contraction in the demand for unskilled male and female as well. 
potentially leading to changes in wage. It turns out that in this case, wages for unskilled male and female both went down as this thing happened. Uh, this is potential because for unskilled female, their labor supply actually went down as well. So their, their demand for their labor and supply for their labor go down. The, the supply is going down because we're having more skilled women rather than unskilled women, right? So the effect is potentially ambiguous. But in this case, wages for each one of these four groups went down. Um, and the degree to which each goes down is, is a function of these propagating row parameters. So overall, these falling wages everywhere had a larger impact on female labor force participation because you saw earlier females were so much more elastic, right? And so that's why in the absence of skill upgrading, women would have potentially participated a lot more. So the fact that women became more skilled led to a lower female participation and was a driver of, of, of widening the gender labor participation gap. Um, but while these are these things, the labor force participation stuff is happening, th th this particular demographic channel is leading to an increase, uh, a, a greater magnification of the P wage gap because partly the, the, the different elasticities, uh, male and female for, for wage. So they, uh, the wage have to respond differently to make them shift. Um, so, and one, one final comment here is since weight, uh, since education is exogenous here, right? So we are trying to take into, into consideration here by allowing that, that education share to change over time. But one thing that's not considered here is uh, potentially as wages change, the share of people who might choose to be higher or lower educated might be changing as well, right? We're taking that as exogenous. So that's one dimension which, which is, uh, is not fully considered here. Uh, okay, so now let me just, I think I'm out of time. So let me just, summarize the, the results. So we do a bunch of robustness checks and we're pretty robust along in terms of parameters when we make model adjustments in terms of how you want to do the CS nesting. So to conclude, what we do is we structurally estimate an equilibrium model of supply demand using Maxwell data over the past two decades. The model incorporates the task based approach and allows us to think about the substitutability of labor by gender and education across occupations. And elasticity of substitution between male and female labor is heterogeneous across the earnings distribution across these occupational groups and higher substitutability abstract tax intensive occupations. And, um, and then we have the counterfactual result. And that's my final comment. One, one for, thing that was really fascinating about this paper, working on this paper is once we started running this counterfactual, it was so interesting to see these different things, right? But the struggle was sometimes you want to have one key counterfactual in your paper, but here we ended up basically running this horse races. Now in the paper, we have a bunch of horse race charts and figures. And it, so it was quite a bit of, it was interesting, but so quite a bit of a struggle to try to juggle these different results and put them together in one setting. Hopefully it wasn't too, too confusing. Thank you very much. That's what I wanted to share. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, so I see Rachel has her hand up. Do you want to jump in? Yes. Okay. So let me restate my question, Ben. So you yeah. did this for all the women, all the uh, men in the Mexican economy, full-time worker. You run, you computed three electricity for these three um, tasks, okay, three occupations. What I'm saying is, can you do this for men and women only work in, say, service sector versus those who only work in manufacturing sector. So you will have three elasticity parameters for each of these sectors. Mm, I see. And I okay. wanted to know whether this ranking of these elasticity parameters is still the same. Mm. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about the uh, menu tasks, the men and women have very low substitutability. Because you use everybody in the economy, so you're basically mm. saying a, a female cleaner is very less substitutable with a male uh, construction worker. But that is not something that we, you know, wanted to think about. We wanted mm. to really think about, uh, given they do similar type of job, is a woman uh, manual worker really not that substitutable with a man manual worker? Uh, so if you separate the sector, then you will be soon in more. You know, for the abstract task, it might be less uh, problematic because you'll be thinking about a manager in a particular sector versus them. So people can, at a manager level, they're easier to switch sector. Mm. So I thought at the minimum, we can just run the mm. whole exercise for service sector and for the manufacturing sector and then see if we still get that sort of ranking. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. In some sense, 
the model solution estimation framework that we have developed is genetic. It doesn't care about how many nests that we have. And so we can potentially expand these uh, or, or do them in separate things. And one, one slight caveat is there is a slight issue with how many observations we end up with in each cell, right? So the current nesting structure we have, even though, you know, we have these 12 groups, right? So in the smallest group, we still have substantial uh, sort of sample to get sort of the, the proper estimate, right? Um, and so we cannot do it infinitely, but I think we could do it along the service and then service exactly as you were suggesting. So that's a great suggestion. Thank you very much. Uh, Michelle? I see you. Yeah, oh, um, yeah. I, I think my question and, and is- And thank you for your presentation. I, I, will, I look forward to reading your paper <laughs> once it's out, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think the question is actually related to Rachel's. I was wondering while you were presenting, with these elasticities, how much can you actually control for preferences and selection? So I was particularly thinking that women have preferences potentially going into different occupations than men. And so what you're capturing is not necessarily the elasticity of women and men doing the same job, but they're less substitutable, but it's just like preferences women choose to work in certain occupations versus men in other occupations. Now they might still all be manual, but the occupations just are very different. So yeah. do you and do you do any controlling for that when you're doing so, estimating yeah. these elasticities or so on the supply logic end, I didn't show all the parameters, but we have various parameters that are occupation, gender, and specific. So they're intercept terms that are basically representing sort of these time invariant preferences that women might have with each one of these occupations by uh, by gender and uh, skills. So I think that might capture what you're saying to some degree. I think the degree to which we don't capture this is uh, changes uh, changes over time. So we have these intercepts that are fixed over time, right? These um, that you capture overall averages. Then we have these observable patterns on the supply side, right? So, um, but the the preference, the unobserved preference parameter is not allowed to to sort of vary over time. It, it, does, does that answer your question? So I think we're trying well, to address. But it's still just like a. These, uh, if if it can just jump in, it's still yeah, a preference yeah. just for like a manual job versus a routine or an abstract job. Is that it? But it's not the preference for certain manual jobs versus other manual jobs. That's what I was um, getting at. So yeah, right. Because in this particular context, that's the nest is, uh, yeah, exactly. So we have a right because we don't have finer ca classification below the manual routine occupation level for women of a particular skill level, yeah. right? So I think this is really what Rachel is saying, right? Exactly. So if we had that, yeah. you know, service versus not, that's what exactly, exactly. So that's exactly right. So we could yeah. interpret that as well. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. Then we can on the exactly as we change the demand side, we can also make the supply side more flexible by allowing for preference parameters to vary by this additional key layer of choice, right? Yeah. Got yeah. it. Thank you. I had um, yeah. one one question. So earlier on in your presentation, you were talking about the non um, the was it the non wage supply factors, and you uh -huh. mentioned um, using the World Bank's women and the like the legal changes to yeah. women being allowed into certain jobs. Right, right, so right. Where, yeah. In your in your kind of factuals, I didn't see that showing up. Yeah. Um, so so we select. Uh, thank you. Thank you for mentioning okay. that. Um, so it didn't have much of an effect, that particular index. So in the full paper, we show four counterfactuals for non-wage determinants, determinants of labor force participation, uh, mm -hmm. also including um, the, the f uh, f marital status. Yeah, marital status thing. But, um, and in the horse race, they, they were sort of lagging behind, so they were not highlighted here. But we were really, but, but I, I don't necessarily, I think, I think it might not be that WBL doesn't matter, but, you know, is, it, is the World Bank really capturing what we need to capture in this context, right? And for some of the other variables, they're gender and skill specific, uh, skill specific which mm -hmm. we can get from the micro data. But this WBL is homogeneous across all That's the groups, right? right? But they might, they might actually be super different how you feel if you're a skilled worker or unskilled worker, right? But we don't have that by that finer level, which might be why we don't see much of an effect from that potentially really crucial variable, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, for, so for those of you who are, um, on the Zoom and don't know this data set, it's a um, World Bank has captured data on different countries in different years and how um, legislation has changed allowing women into certain certain sectors, I think, and certain types of work. Um, but you're right that I think it's kind of a, a national level measure 
And so maybe you're not getting much traction from that because yeah. of the structure of your model. Yeah. Right. I mean, it be, can I, I don't know what much. Oh, yeah, yeah, I just want to add to what Taryn said. You know, that indicator, I looked at it some time ago. It has so many dimensions. So it talk about like the division of property, women's political right, uh, you know, a child marriage, whether, you know, certain brutal physical pro surgery done on women. So there are many, many aspects. Do you just use the overall or you actually focus on the labor market dimension? Because when I was playing with these index, mm -hmm. they can give you very different correlation across countries. So, so I don't know, um, you know, what, 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 which part of this index you are doing or you are doing, using that overall? So uh, I believe we're using the overall. So um, I, I should be more familiar with this index than I am, but yeah. thank you so much for pointing out the finer gradients of this, right? So, I mean, in our setting here, I think it's, it would be really interesting to incorporate uh, not just this unidimensional thing, right? But to add in these, the, 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 the ingredients of this thing to see which one drives things. And mm -hmm. each one is not too expensive to include because it only really adds one parameter, right? Because we're, we're just using the variation in the observable and have, mm -hmm. have to identify one extra parameter. So potentially we can, we can do that. That's, uh, that, I'll, I'll look into that further. Thank you. Alexio, did you have something to ask? Maybe he's gone for coffee already. So <laughs> <laughs> he unmuted yeah. himself. I yeah. guess he was. He was. Maybe he was planning to say something, and I interrupted. Sorry. So, so I can I ask a question. So can I ask Michelle a question? Mm. So, yeah, so sure. for, in, in your setting there, so so we try to you know put a big emphasis on this um, supply side observables, right? So is there a way in your setting to incorporate in some observables? like the ones we like we're doing or is it harder to do in that in that setting I, I was just curious on the supply side right so you, you have you know we both have labor supply decisions right and yeah, you know, we yeah, are trying, yeah, yeah we're trying to back this labor supply with you know changes in these things over yeah. time right that might be impacting yeah. different dimensions of women's choice yeah and so i mean in our setting home productivity Mm -hmm. uh, is the only thing, I mean, except for wages, of course, productivity changing in the market. Yeah. The only other thing we have is the home productivity channel or the, and so we set a mean and standard deviation to match the change over time for the US there because we set it up at this horse race. And so we do that separate for educated and uneducated women, which I guess would be similar to your appliance um, story potentially. Mm. You could so think could you potentially there. map? Could you potentially map like um, map the distribution, like do some regression so that that distribution is a function of some observables, or or that makes the the computation solution much harder? If, because I guess those would be in effect additional state variables in the model, right? If you had to incorporate yeah, those yeah, exactly. that would expand the state exactly. space. Got, got it. Right. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah for us here. These things, because yeah, these things are yeah, and then okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, I, I would have to think what you could do, but yeah. So, I mean, the the applying thing, I guess, would be sort of an easy way of of putting that in the model without any issue. I don't know if you could uh, add more stuff in, but obviously, in the U.S., applying things doesn't matter because home productivity right, right, is pretty right. flat um, from nineteen eighty to two thousand five. Yeah. And we allow it for the rest of the countries. Um, of course, education in our model is endogenous already, so that's right. different from yours. So that's uh, observable, I guess, in some ways. But um, yeah. and I, I and one more, my final comment on edu education thing. I think, I think it's so we were struggling quite a bit thinking about whether education should be endogenous or not, right? But it seems like in, at least in some development settings, much of the education change is really driven by changes in like school supply, for example, right? The availability of schools across locations. So so, so we were thinking perhaps in this setting, it's it's reasonable to, to take that as more exogenous if it's really mainly not driven by endogenous choices, but just driven by availability changes. But that might not be true, of course, in a setting like the US, right? 
Yeah, I, I think university choices, I would assume, are maybe more endogenous and secondary no. might be more exogenous. I would think, I mean, that goes back to um, yeah. the earlier question, whether we could, for developing country, think about, well, maybe in developing countries, actually, education choices are also in, um, mm. exogenous. Yeah, I would think maybe secondary is more exogenous and university might be more endogenous, I would think. I see. Yeah. I mean, that that would be my in, take. I, yeah. I think even in Mexico, the things of like the cost of schooling is really something that does affect your choice to send your kids to school, mm -hmm. even at the high school level. And so I'm not mm -hmm. sure that you could just say that, you know, secondary schooling is, is exogenous, even in, you know, Mexico mm -hmm. and the time that you're looking, right, looking right. at. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, Michelle, I think you're right that on the university level, I think it makes a lot of, you know, total sense to make yeah. that a choice yeah. for, for everyone. Um, okay, Thanks. we are we are due for a break. So um, I, you, you can stay on the Zoom. Um, we are going to convene again in about 15 minutes. So please come back at whatever time zone you're in, plus 15 minutes. Um, and Farzana, we, we're going to transition to more of a, a micro session in the next two papers. So for those of you um, for whom it's time for bed, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, but hope to see you all in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, thanks, Michelle. Chair. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. So I'll probably be heading off soon, but yeah, um, it, it was really good. Thanks. And I, I might be coming in out because I have to teach two classes today, but I'll try to come to uh, as many sessions as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, Taryn, would you like me to try my slides? Yes, please. Let's do that now. And Farzana also, if you're around. Um, yep, I can share. Okay, so let me Let's try gonna... Edmund first. Okay, yeah. I'm I'm just you okay. can see my screen, right? Yeah, we can see your screen. So that works. Thanks. Great. Okay, so let me yeah, let me try mine. Yeah, my, mine's a PDF, so let's see. How does that look? Perfect. Can you advance okay. your slides? Yep. Yep. How does that... no, perfect. Yeah, that's great. Excellent. So... Okay. Great. Yeah. okay. Uh, see you in a few minutes. Thanks. Yeah, I feel a little bit out of my league here as a political scientist <laughs> among a bunch of economists. <laughs> I was feeling the same way, and I was telling Darren that yeah. I think I need to give a lot of context and a lot of background. It was very interesting that this was this conversation about whether education is a choice is exogenous or endogenous, and I've never thought of it as exogenous <laughs> in yeah. a developing country context. Yeah. Um, you know, so when you don't have any laws about uh, mandated number of years of schooling and so on, and it's not implemented expensive yeah yes mm -hmm. and it's very expensive i always think of it as endogenous so <laughs> that was interesting okay well i think i think one of the points of um what steg is trying to do as well is to get different types of economists um yeah. or people who work with quantitative data including political scientists to talk to each other <laughs> yes. um so that we can you know learn more about uh, Absolutely. You know, how the models work in poor countries or or just basic, you know, mm -hmm. some basic descriptive statistics about low income countries that, that we're missing. Um, yeah. So I think the next section is going to be much more micro oriented. Uh, and then the last session will be kind of a mixture. Um, so don't, please don't feel out of place at all. I, I think the conversation will be great. Well, I learned a lot. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> great. All right. We'll see you in a bit. See you. Bye. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, we've just heard uh, a bunch about Mexico. This session is um, going to tell us a lot more about work, uh, women's work, and constraints to women's work and uh, empowerment in India and uh, Myanmar. So, Farzana, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for accepting this paper. Uh, this is joint work with Amrita Dillon, uh, Sanjari Roy, both at King's College London, and Nikita. Uh, from ISI Delhi and Nikita is here in the audience. So in case there are any clarificatory questions, please uh, put them in the chat box and hopefully we'll have more time for discussion later. So we are jumping into, uh, you know, uh, from uh, the previous session to looking uh, more micro into India in particular. So I'm trying to go, uh, I'll try to give you a lot of context and background to motivate the question that we are asking here. Um, and so I think we ended 
uh, I think Rachel was talking about women's uh, preferences for the kinds of work that they want to do. And so this, uh, you know, sort of cues into this paper uh, where uh, our motivation essentially is uh, in terms of gender differences in preferences for work by men and women. And typically what we observe, particularly in developing countries, is that work which is located physically closer to home is often preferred by women due to various reasons. One is, um, you know, the social norms that restrict women's physical mobility. Are, uh, and uh, this has been well documented in the data. For example, uh, uh, you know, those are concerns related to sexual purity, uh, but also they could be uh, concerns related to safety in particular um, and uh, generally, in, at least in urban contexts, crime rates and crimes against women documented to be higher uh, in, uh, in, in heavily densely populated uh, areas. And the third reason could, of course, be the home production burden, which is disproportionately higher on women than on men. And this has been, of course, documented across the world and seems to be much more stringent uh, when we look at many developing countries, particularly in South Asia. And along with the fact that women may prefer jobs uh, closer to home for all these reasons, there's also low levels of education and the lack of awareness and information about labor market opportunities. And that, of course, gets compounded by the restricted mobility and also the fact that since women are physically less mobile, they tend to have fewer weak ties, which has been well documented in the network literature when we look at labor markets in terms of getting job referrals and getting access to information about job openings and job availability. So in general, what we're trying to say over here is that typically women, more than men, would potentially face higher job search costs. And one possible way in which one could address these high job search costs is through this new technology that has come where you get, uh, uh, where you, know, you can aggregate the uh, job availability information on these digital labor market platforms, which work very much like, let's say an Uber, which is telling you, you know, what are the, uh, uh, what are, who, who's demanding work and who's available to work. Specifically, we'll be looking at hyperlocal uh, job markets uh, and that can reduce job search costs and matching frictions. And at the same time, because, uh, you know, we, we are talking about women looking for work, which is closer to home. If you're looking at hyperlocal job service uh, information providers, then potentially, this technology can be more beneficial to women because it is addressing many of these concerns related to higher job search costs for women. So this is not to say that job search costs aren't high uh, in developing country contexts for various reasons for men as well, but they can be potentially higher for women. So what we are asking, the question that we are asking here is whether digital technology overall can enhance labor market participation and improve employment outcomes. And we're going to look at both men as well as women. Uh, but specifically, what we're interested in is looking at whether uh, we can harness women's social networks to enable technology adoption. And uh, I'm going to just refer to some of the literature also, uh, which mentions, and you know, it's been well documented that women may have lower access, for example, to mobile technology which may itself uh, sort of hinder their uh, technology, particularly this technology, which is digital adoption of this technology. Uh, and therefore, you know, it could uh, have put some constraints on uh, the possibilities of this technology improving the labor market outcomes. So we could harness the social networks uh, in the sense of uh, when you have a community which is adopting the technology, then you are also more inclined to be less suspicious of that technology and more inclined to uh, sort of try it out yourself. Uh, but also what we're interested in understanding is how do these social norms, the prevailing social norms, which relate to women's workforce participation uh, and are therefore deeply linked with uh, their mobility and the access to information and their work preferences interact with 
the structure of the social networks in determining what is the effect of this technology on labor markets, uh, the gender differentiated effects of this technology on labor market outcomes. Um, so just to briefly jump into the literature and just to give you a bit of a background, we are going to be focusing on women who are married. Um, and of course, in the context that we are looking at, which is in India uh, and perhaps in you know, many other developing countries, marriage is uh, basically universal, it's almost universal. But there is also this marriage penalty on women in terms of uh, the fact that women, once they get married, they tend to drop out of the labor market. And that's not purely due to childcare concerns, but also related to the burden of home production. Um, there's also recent work which suggests that uh, when we are talking about labor market participation of women, and very often, of course, it's more realistic to think of for married women, there would be joint household decision making in terms of labor supply of husband and wife. And that uh, potentially, uh, you know, men in, in the sense of the prevailing norms could lead to lower participation of women when it comes to this joint decision making. Um, and, and what we know is that uh, harnessing women's social networks may have a positive effect on women's economic participation. So when we're looking at a context when women are dropping out or more likely to drop out of the labor market, uh, market due to uh, marriage, and the constraints that they face in terms of the norms in the, uh, and the gender norms which are imposed on the mobility and work preferences and so on, then uh, there is one paper uh, which is in, in, this, in this very large field looking at uh, social networks. There is a very large literature, for example, which is looking at technology adoption in agriculture. Um, there is a huge literature on uh, labor market uh, social networks in developed country contexts, but it is a very, it's very sparse when you look at developing countries, particularly when it comes to looking at labor market outcomes. But there is this one paper by Field and co-authors, which finds that in rural areas, women's take up of entrepreneurship. So the probability that they would go to the bank, for example, to take a loan, uh, to start an enterprise, for example, is higher when they're treated along with their peers. So there's this one example which suge suggests that, you know, when you have the support of your network and your peers, you're, may you're more likely to sort of uh, take the first step or take a decision which is uh, not uh, the norm, uh, so to speak. Uh, but what we also know is so, so that's, you know, given the limited literature that we have and is looking at entrepreneurship, uh, but a ton of literature, not really a ton rather, I would say uh, a very narrow literature, which has just started talking about uh, the gender differences in the structure of social networks. Uh, so there is work by Stoloff, and co-authors, which is 1999, going back to the sociology literature, which was documenting the kinds of networks that women have, which is more amenable to, uh, uh, to providing social uh, protection uh, rather than improving labor market outcomes. And then there is more recent or relatively recent work, which is documenting the gender differences uh, in women's networks as opposed to men's networks when it comes to accessing the flow of information on job openings and uh, information on labor market. Um, uh, and what they find is that women's social networks are often narrow and restrictive. So women tend to have tighter social networks which are deeper rather than having more weak ties which are required to allow this flow of information on job openings. Uh, and so a lot of this literature essentially has also been so far focused on looking at white collar jobs in developed countries to document some of these gender differences. But there is very little that is available on uh, women's social networks, particularly in an urban context in developing countries which might be different from what we know so far about uh, women's networks in general, which is more focused in rural areas, because migration uh, 
for marriage or after marriage is a big part of uh, you know women's movement from rural areas to urban areas and typically then when they uh, migrate after marriage to the cities they're going to lose they lose their connections the social connections that they leave behind in their natal home and the second as i pointed out previously also is the safety concerns are much more salient in urban areas because of higher crime rates against women as opposed to uh, the rural areas and so what i'm trying to say over here essentially is that it is possible that because of uh, these factors that women are getting uprooted from their natal homes and moving to the cities and uh, these other safety related concerns the mobility of women is going to be much more restricted in urban areas as opposed to rural areas in developing countries which might lead to even narrower structures of their social network as opposed to what we might see for men and particular and that might be particularly relevant uh, in the labor market uh, context and that's what we are going to try to understand here so what we are trying to do essentially is to leverage uh you know so 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 going by what we see in the literature and to uh, and and the fact that we are trying to encourage uh women to adopt a new technology we are going to engage with their networks to see what the impact of that would be both on adoption as well as on labor market outcomes and for this we conduct a cluster randomized control trial in the urban areas of delhi uh, which is the national capital region and uh, over two years starting from 2019 to 2021 and uh, we have three treatment arms uh, one in which we do not be uh, offer this new job search technology to match husband wife pairs and another one in which we offer it to the match pairs along with the wife peers and then can compare the outcomes that we see with the control group where this offer is not made either to the couple or their peers and what we find is um that as we had expected that uh, and given the design and I'll delve into that a little bit later when we come to uh, the results um that one year after the intervention we find a uh, very significant positive effects on the husband's labor market outcomes both at the extensive margin and at the intensive margin as well as in terms of earnings and the structure of work that they're doing shifting away from more precarious casual labor to salaried work but surprisingly and contrary to our expectations women's overall work status does not change um and instead what we find is that women increase the self employment uh in uh, and both these changes we are observing only in the network treatment after a year we don't see any effects positive effects on either gender uh in or uh, uh and i i'll i'll uh, you know discuss what exactly we see there but we don't see any improvements in without network treatment so the results were very surprising and contrary to what the theory would suggest us and what the empirical evidence on engaging with networks might suggest and so what we are hoping is that you know we are able to try to uh, try to understand why we get these results and what that means for us in terms of these new technologies coming in and how we can ensure that the benefits of these technology also percolate down to women so the data that we are looking at is um we have these five districts that we look at uh, uh, that we sample randomly about uh, 108 polling stations uh, and we are drawing about 15 households from each of these polling stations and our focus is on looking at the age group of 18 to 45 years so these are relatively young married couples uh, so both the husband and the wife would be interviewed uh in our study separately as well as uh we have a household survey that we conducted which will allow us to list all the couples that are there in the household and then we would go for the uh uh, uh couple which is in this particular age group because many times you'll have multiple families living within the household 
And the reason we go with the 18 to 45 age group is that uh, these, this is the age group where we are more likely to see engagement with the labor force, but also at the same time, women are more likely to have home production responsibilities uh, along with childcare. Uh, our focus is also this, on the sample that is low skilled, low educated. So these are essentially going to be blue collar workers. Um, they are less skilled and they're also, of course, as a result, uh, you know, cons not consequently, but rather, you know, accompanying the fact that they're also low income. So the blue collar sector, for, uh, particularly in India, is, is much larger in terms of the size of the labor force, or the proportion of the labor force than the uh, white collar sector is. And uh, the challenge of providing jobs and uh, providing employment opportunities to them, to them is much, uh, much bigger in India right now than it is for the white collar sector. So this is just a map of Delhi on the left hand side with the districts that we sampled uh, our households from and on the right is the distribution of the control and the treatment groups. So let me give you a timeline of what we did. So we started in about May and July of 2019, where we conducted the baseline household survey and the individual surveys separately of the husband and the wife and of the peers in the network of both the husband and the wife. And then uh, it was followed by the intervention, which was done over a period of about three months. And this was also then, of course, unfortunately, uh, was followed up by the pandemic, which started in uh, March, April, and uh, which led to, of course, a significant disruption of the labor market. So our first end line was just around the period when there was uh, a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, complete almost shutdown of the Indian economy. And then uh, we had uh, about 14 months later, our second end line. So I'm going to focus all of our results on the second end line. We don't find any significant effects, understandably so at the end of the first end line, because the demand itself, the labor demand itself was pretty much uh, absent given the shutdown of the entire nation and the economy. And so we are going to focus on this uh, 14 months later results that we see. So um, as I was discussing, I think it's important to sort of fix ideas and to think about what is the kind of sample that we are looking at. So we asked both the women, that's the wives and the husbands, about what their attitudes were towards women working. So these are a lot of questions that we put together, for example, from the world value surveys, but also frame some of our own. And what we see is that overwhelmingly uh, their uh, perception is that women should work within the home, which might mean that they shouldn't work at all, or if they're doing any work, they should be doing work from home. Uh, and I'll follow it up with further data uh, in the next slide. Uh, and also that uh, women should overwhelmingly, again, the attitude that they should support their husband's careers, and that uh, uh, you know, uh, it could have potentially negative effects on the mother's relationship with the children if the mother works. But as you can see, there is a, a husband, husbands are much more likely to uh, agree with the statement that women should work within the home. <clears throat> now, when you look at the left panel here, this is looking at what was the baseline labor force participation rates of women and men. So if you just look at the first row over here, you can see 24% of the women were working in, so they were engaged in uh, some kind of uh, work which was remunerative, including self-employment, whereas 96% of the husbands were engaged in remunerative work. Um, and this uh, lines up with what we see in the uh, nationally representative data as well. But what is interesting is that the uh, majority of the women who are working are engaged in self-employment. And when we look again on the right-hand side, uh, on this panel C, which is called the job preferences for women, again, we ask the wives and the husbands, what are the kinds of jobs that you want to take up? And so what we see again is a large proportion of both women as well as men, and more so men, the husbands wanting their wives to take up work, which is salary. So salary jobs would be considered, you know, what we call good jobs, jobs which are uh, less precarious. They could be government jobs, private jobs, for example, but also even a larger proportion want home-based work. So home-based work would be 
work that you can do in terms of an enterprise at home, for example, tailoring and stitching, or that you could get uh, you know, uh, a contractor to come and give you some work from factories which are close by to do work from home. And as you can see, that lines up very well with what we saw in the previous uh, table when we were looking at regressive attitudes. So 75% of women were neither working nor looking for work, but they preferred good salary jobs. So a lot of the reasons why women might be holding back from uh, participating in the labor market is because uh, you know these are the kinds of jobs that they want and they may not be coming, um, they may not be available, but also that women most, li most likely uh, women who are working are most likely to be self-employed. And again, that lines up very well with the kinds of job preferences and the attitudes that they have towards working uh, women. Uh, so what we see is essentially that um, because they prefer home-based work, which is also, you know, that allows them to do part-time more flexible work, then they want greater job flexibility. Um, I'll also uh, refer to data later, which will show that a women's stated preference was to work within a much closer distance to their residence than it was for men. So 50, uh, they would be willing to travel only 50% of the distance that men were willing to. And also in other uh, similar data on attitudes and preferences, what we find is that only 33% of the husbands approved of the married woman working if the wife or, or his or his wife rather had uh, or a wife has a husband capable of earning um, as opposed to 60% of the wives uh, 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 approving. So there is this big gender difference there as well. So, so along with the fact that we have um, you know, all of uh, this uh, data on what the job preferences are and what the attitudes towards working women are, as I pointed out, we collected a lot of information on, uh, so what I'll, I'll explain to you how we collected the social network data in a minute, but just to see how the structure of the social network also differs, which again, uh, you know, lines up with what I was talking about earlier in terms of the motivation. Uh, what we see is that 75% of the peers that the women named were non-co-residing relatives of these women, as opposed to 39% for husbands and 37% of these peers being friends. So it's just, you know, acquaintances, what we would call, you know, sort of those uh, 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 people that you know, that you have, uh, that you can talk to in terms of availability of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of anything, but also, of course, the labor market and job information and so on. Uh, and then when we break this up by whether they are women or men, 50, uh, more than 50% of these non-co-residing uh, relatives uh, are essentially female and the rest are male. So there's an overwhelming of the 75%, you know, the rounding of errors here, uh, a large proportion are women, but also a very significant proportion are male non-co-residing relatives. Uh, whereas for uh, the husbands, the largest proportion of their peers come from male friends. So the way we elicited this information was um, through a name generating process. So we would give them uh, context, for example, if you had an emergency, who are the people that you would go to if you had to go to social gatherings, uh, uh, festivals, uh, if you had to go to the park, and so on and so forth. So, and, or at work, would you go with to work? Would you have lunch with at work? So there were these different contexts in which we uh, sort of, you know, uh, prompted them to give us names. And then uh, we listed uh, uh, the uh, maximum of four names that they, uh, that were elicited through the process. And what we see is that women's network was overwhelmingly female and the uh, labor force participation rates of their peers is also um, low uh, and it aligns with what it is for the main respondents. But the fact that women's network is very much homebound or family-based. So the fact that you know, many of these are co non co residing relatives, they would also be relatives and related or social connections of the husband as well. 
Uh, and that again points to what I was uh, referring to earlier in terms of the restricted mobility that these women have and the very close uh, uh, tight structure of the social connections that they have. And that leads to a significant overlap of husband and the wife social connections, given this very homebound network structure. Um, so that's all of the background data and uh, from the baseline, but now I want to talk about the job matching platform technology. So exactly what we did here. So we collaborated. Oh, can, I, yeah. can I give you a quick time check? You have about 15 minutes. Oh my, okay. So we have a hyperlocal app-based job aggregation platform, which connects the employers directly with multiple blue collar workers. And this is essentially very low cost for the worker. And then the employer only has to pay a very small fee if there is a match with a worker. And so there are no agents, agencies or contractors, there's low job search costs. And then the, um, uh, you know, the worker can choose the job as per their preferences. So this is the website and it was both in Hindi, which is a local language as well as English. And you can look at you know, all kinds of works that, were, that work for jobs that were available. So we classified these 108 polling stations into these three network, into th these three groups randomly with 36 clusters in each. And what I wanted to point out over here is that the, there's endogenous selection of the network in terms of the people that are chosen by the wife, right? So we are eliciting the names and then they are allowed to choose two peers who they would like us to reach out and also provide information on this job portal service and uh, help them register on the platform. So essentially we have an ANCOVA specification here where we are going to measure labor market outcomes uh, 14 months after the intervention. Um, and this is both at the extensive margin and intensive margin and a reference period is in the last three months. Uh, and uh, these are, uh, you know, we're going to look at the treatment as a whole, but also break it up for each type of treatment separately by controlling for a ton of baseline characteristics, including mobile usage because we would be concerned about whether there would be differences in terms of access to uh, uh, cell phones, for example, which would be important in order to be able to use this technology and the standard errors are clustered at the uh, level of randomization. Uh, so first set of results that we find, men are more likely to be employed in network treatment. So there's a 4.4 percentage uh, point increase in the probability that men in the network treatment are employed one year after the intervention. Um, and again, men are working more intensively by more than 50%. Uh, these are in logs, the outcome in the intensive margin. Um, and that there is uh, more than doubling of their earnings one year after the intervention. And in all of this, what we find for women is that women instead are taking up self-employment when treated with their own network. So there's a 4.5 percentage point increase in the probability that a woman is in the uh, is self-employed in the network treatment arm. Um, so all these impacts are mediated by the wife's network, which is surprising. So if it is that the wife's network is not an enabler for her, why is it that it is improving outcomes for men? that there, uh, in, there's an increase both at the extensive and inter intensive margin in terms of their outcomes. Uh, but we also see a slight insignificant or marginally negative effect for wives when the treatment is offered only to the couple. So that's in the non-network treatment arm. And there is some related literature now also looking at um, job platforms which suggest and remember what I was telling you was that uh, women typically have and I haven't shown you the uh, summary statistics but women have lower education than men have they have lower information about job market opportunities so it is possible that we see this uh, negative slight negative effect because they might be uh, once they become aware of these opportunities they might be waiting it out uh, so what explains these impacts uh, the first is, if you look at the structure of our, uh, the design of our intervention, we have two people who are provided information, the husband and the wife, in the non-network treatment and offered registration on the job matching platform. 
Whereas in the treat in the network treatment, we have up to uh, four people. So that's almost double the volume of information that would be available on job openings uh, uh, just, just by the design. And we do see that there's take up, that there's higher take up of the uh, of the, uh, the the technology in the network treatment. I'm going to show you results as I go along. Um, but the fact that we see these positive effects in the social network, but we don't see it for the women might be suggesting that the, the gendered structure of the network is benefiting men. And that there is this flow of information from uh, the women's networks, which where you should remember about a substantive proportion of them were men who were also socially connected with the husbands, for example, through job referrals going to the husbands. Whereas women are conforming to the gender norm of working from home or working close from uh, home because we do not really see any heterogeneity by mobile usage or ownership. So what I can tell you is that what we see is that network improves take up. So you can see in column five and six that the coefficient on the network treatment is positive and significant relative to the non-network treatment but we do not see any gender differential in the platform registration. So it's not because women are less likely to adopt this technology, but the network structure is benefiting women. So we see more job offers. So this is all data coming from the platform uh, itself of those who are registered. So again, relative to the non-network treatment in the network treatment, husbands are more likely to get job offers both unconditional on registration and conditional on registration, as well as the number of job offers. And there's a significant gender differential as a result. Um, and interestingly, when we look at the peers of the women, so of, these are the women, um, uh, you know, and women's peers were the ones who were treated if they were in the network treatment. We see a positive outcome in terms of both the extensive margin and the intensive margin only for the male peers of the women than we see for the female peers. We don't see any significant effects for the female peers. So even the male peers employment outcomes improve, but not for the female peers. And uh, women are conforming to the gender norm. So we break it up again in terms of looking what is the kind of self-employment that they're doing. And this is typically own business manufacturing, as I pointed out. So it's like, you know, you require capital, which is like a sewing machine that you need in order to run uh, 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 stitching from home. And that would be explained by the income effects from increased earnings of husbands. But could it also be that there are changes in social norms due to peer effects? Uh, you know, that there's a differential effect in terms of the network treatment as opposed to the non-network treatment. And we don't find that. Could it be that there's differential access to technology? And as I pointed out earlier, we do not find, we're controlling throughout for that. We also don't find any heterogeneity in results by mobile usage ownership. But there could also be demand side factors. It's just that, you know, jobs that were like the ones that the women want are not coming forth and they're more likely to, you know, be available for men. So uh, if you look at this uh, data that we collected on the, uh, uh, on, on uh, you know, the attitudes, uh, which is the norms, and there were these regressive attitudes towards women working versus progressive attitudes. What you see is that there is a decline in regressive attitudes in both without network and with network. And there's no differential between these two uh, treatments. So it can't be that there's differential effects in terms of through peers working through the network treatment leading to these different effects that we see. Um, and what we found was in terms of the labor demand, it's, it's absolutely fascinating that women register for fewer types of jobs. And then again, these are aligned with the gender norm. So they want to, you know, uh, uh, take up uh, services like providing maid service or uh, uh, working closer from home in terms of, uh, and, and also not going longer distances, but also that the salary expectations were completely mismatched with what the market was willing to offer. So there was, they were asking for almost 100% higher salary than what was the existing salary for the women who were working. Uh, while in contrast, men were registering for larger number of job profiles, willing to travel longer distances, and the mismatch between their salary expectations and those of 
the the current the what the market was offering was only nine percent. So what what I'm what I'm trying to say over here is that it, it is entirely possible that you know you have fewer offers coming to the women because of all these factors. They are asking or they're registering for fewer types of work. They are less willing to move, be uh, to move further away. They're also asking for salaries which are much higher than what the market is willing to provide them. But what the, the point that we were also trying to make over here is that it's very hard to disentangle these uh, the demand the potential demand side factors from the supply side factors in terms of the preferences, the job preferences that the women have. So let me just conclude, and I think I should be on time. Then the digital technology, uh, you know, uh, theoretically can potentially provide jobs aligned with women's work preferences, both in terms of flexibility and also lowering job search costs. Uh, and do we do see that that can potentially happen when we engage with the network? And I think there's, an, there's one more interesting result there that of course we are sort of not uh, you know, emphasizing here, which is that we don't see any positive effects of this technology in the non-network treatment. And it seems that you know, it's important to kind of create a buzz around this technology for adoption and for the flow of information on openings. But again, that men are more likely to take advantage of this because of the gendered structure of network that we see. And so uh, social networks may not always act as enablers. And there is this tiny bit of literature which gives support to what we find. Uh, but again, as I said, you know, tons of more work is required in order for us to understand what is it that is limiting women's uh, social networks from uh, helping them benefit from uh, labor market information, and particularly in this context, in terms of uh, the effects of new technology that could potentially benefit them. More. So I'll stop here now. Thank you so much. Thanks, Farzana. Um, any any questions for Farzana? I think there are a lot of questions in the chat, and. Uh, Nikita has answered some of them. Okay. Yeah, I, so I had a couple of questions. Um, the one slide you, you zoomed past um, was the one with uh, the, what that platform actually looked like. And yeah. at the bottom, it had the types of jobs. Can you yeah. put that one up again? Because I wanted, I saw the domestic service, but I was curious to know what the other jobs are. Yeah. Um, so the kinds of jobs, uh, can you see it? Can yeah, you see I, the slides now? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, they, they offered both short-term contracts, long-term contracts. People could do gigs as well, you know. So, um, so that was the nice thing about this particular, yeah, this one. So domestic one, yeah. workers, office workers, drivers. Um, sorry, this one is hidden over here, but you could be a cook in a restaurant or you could work, you know, be a cook in a home, so a salon. So a lot of women, for instance, when, it, when I was mentioning other services might be interested in providing beautician services. So you could either, for instance, uh, be self-employed as a beautician, but you could also do gigs. Like you could, you know, uh, go to different people's homes or provide home yeah. service. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and also I, factory. So, I was just wondering like, you emphasize the safety aspect of you know, concerns about safety is one of the barriers to women's work in these urban areas. And I think what you were saying there is this you know, you, women may not want to travel very far from home because the actual process of moving to the job could be unsafe. But I think. What I wonder about in a lot of these jobs that you have on the platform is, is also potentially security concerns. Even if they are three kilometers away from your home, right. you might not want to be in a factory working with other people or working as an individual domestic worker in someone's house, you know, might still make you feel like yes. it. So I'm not, I'm not sure that yeah. the, the platform itself kind of solves the, you know, safety concerns. Maybe it reduces it on the transport side, but the jobs themselves still have right. on of yeah. You know, so of so the way there. I would the way I would answer that is, um, you're absolutely right that given a three kilometer radius, so all these jobs that were being offered on this 
platform. As I pointed out, they're hyper, it's a hyper-local job service, uh, job matching platform. So it would ask you, what distance are you willing to travel? So it works a lot like Uber in the sense that it'll match you to the closest possible uh, either employer, potential employer, and also match the employer to the closest possible worker that is available. And that's the reason why we went with this particular platform, because as you correctly pointed out, you know, if it's just a platform which matches you across states, for example, you know that women are not going to probably take that up. But here there is this, uh, it actually is trying to reduce that uh, mobility constraint by offering them work as close as possible uh, to where they work. And you're absolutely right that there would be a lot more opportunities, for example, to be a domestic worker. Uh, but there are many businesses around. And as a matter of fact, where we were looking and the areas that we sampled, the residential clusters were located very close to factories, which were light industries, for example, like footwear, where women can, you know, are generally a larger proportion of the workforce than you would find, for instance, in heavy industries and so on. So all of these would be possible. Uh, all, of those, all of these jobs would be closer than you would find on a regular platform. But what I think what we are finding is that women want to be as close as possible. So even, uh, you know, as I was pointing out that men are willing to go seven kilometers, but women, when they register on these platforms, they say we want work only within a three kilometer distance. And it's not just safety, but also because they need to come back home and do, you know, their yeah, domestic the work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think what we're trying to do is to look at the, the kind of platform that would align the closest, as close as possible to the preferences of the women because and, and yet we find that they're not taking up these jobs so that that was pretty surprising for us are you interpreting the the um the idea that women wanted much higher paying jobs is that um an informational story or are you thinking of that as a compensating differential i think there's an information story here so uh I think I, what you're referring to is, let me go to that uh, page about the, inf, uh, the, prefer, the, the, the wage preferences. And uh, what we were finding is, so one is, one is that, you know, as I pointed out earlier, women want jobs which are salaried. And salaried means that, you know, it's not daily work. So you don't get paid on a daily basis, for example, at a construction site. But uh, if you work as a maid, for instance, you will get a monthly salary. Um, that's not necessarily high status, but what is high status would potentially be working as a school teacher, for example, uh, which is a public sector job, which is highly coveted. Um, so they generally do have higher reservation wage. So in the sense that what I, there is this, I think but, I, I think there's I both an issue. Con concretely, I'm curious, the words women's expectation. Is it phrased in terms of an expectation of what kind of job you could get or what you would it's or is it really a desire? I think it's a desire. Okay. Uh, given the kinds of preferences that they have, that they would be willing to take up a job which is taking them, let's say, further away from where they're located if it is compensating them for that extra distance or the risk that they have to bear, but also- Yeah, so that, okay, time, it's a compensating differential idea. Okay. Also compensating for the social costs which are attached to that particular job. I see. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. I'm not sure it's entirely compensating uh, differential because there is also, you know, we find this big mismatch. So for the same kind of work, women demanding higher pay, um, I think it's something that needs more uh, digging into, and I'm hoping the future work that uh, we are doing is helping us, would help us sort of figure this out. Is it all driven by, you know, the fact that there are these risks attached and they want compensation for that, and how much of it is coming due to uh, informational, uh, lack of information and informational asymmetry, which might be higher for women, again, because- yeah, I guess you yeah. could look at sort of like heterogeneity in these job characteristics and how this yeah. 
expected, ex, ex, you know, this differential uh, varies to see whether it might be compensating differential for these risk Absolutely. factors. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, I think it's not really clear from what we have so far. Rosanna, um, this the the fact that COVID intervenes in the middle of your experiment mm. is a bit of a, I knew you were not a problem, <laughs> but it's a problem for lots of experimental design. So, uh, is there uh, so one one interpretation is that you know um, there's just there's nothing going on for women fourteen months after maybe in a non-COVID world the immediate effect would mm -hmm. be big and then it would die out mm. over time. Um, mm. Is there anything you can use in the first uh, in the first follow-up and the first yeah. end line yeah. on take-up maybe just what people report about actually looking at or maybe that's not even very useful because everything is shut down I don't know it just it feels yeah. like it would be in it would be useful to think about is there any outcome you can look at that might have moved whether it's about information or whether it's about take-up or did you ever open the app or something like that um, in the first follow-up uh, to try yeah. and understand, you know, what, yeah, yeah. how so much we, of what you're not finding is about the, you know, the lag versus actually, you know, the technology is not working the way you wanted it to work. Right. Um, we asked information on the flow of uh, job offers coming through the platform at both end lines. So every time we went back to them, we would ask them, you know, did you get offers? What happened? And so on and so forth. So we have that information. Uh, uh, it's not that the te uh, technology is not working. Um, I, I, I don't know how many of you would be aware of this, but in India, India had a very stringent lockdown. Uh, we had like about five deaths and the entire economy shut down, absolutely. And uh, it, it shrank by about 27%. So it was a huge, uh, you know, like complete uh, uh, stoppage of all economic activity. Um, and uh, yeah, so we don't see any effects either for men or for women. And one of the things that we did was to see whether we could explain these results by people who lost jobs. Um, uh, due to COVID, right? So uh, one of the questions, you know, I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate here myself, which is that, is it the case, because men are more likely to be active in the labor market, right? And so they're also more likely to lose jobs uh, when the shock hits. And so there's just compensation for that, which is happening 14 months down the line that, you know, this is, the men are supposed to be the breadwinners. And so uh, when the jobs become available, let's just pass everything on to them. And in under normal circumstances, if the pandemic hadn't happened, then probably, you know, would we, would we have seen different results? That we wouldn't have seen all of this benefit going to the men. And so what we do is we look at the heterogeneity by when the husband, if the husband had lost a job or hadn't lost a job uh, uh, during end line one, so between the intervention and end line one, and whether we see all of these results being driven by uh, women whose husbands had lost jobs, uh, and we don't see that. We don't, that's not explaining our results. So it's not that, you know, th this, something here is much more salient than just the shock of COVID, which is causing uh, the men to benefit and the women to not take advantage of this technology, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I had one last question about like social norms and how they're playing out. Cause you, you know, you have said several times in talking about your result that women are sort of taking up the, um, the type of work that the social norm would kind of dictate as appropriate work for women. Um, and you cited the paper in the beginning about uh, that sort of showed men are the ones who bear the costs of women going out to work. Um, like the social costs. Um, do you have enough variation in your household structure to look at like effects for women who are living with their mothers-in-law versus not? Yeah, good, good point. Okay. Yeah, we should, we haven't done that. I know you like that variation a lot. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not that important. important. Absolutely. But what I can tell you is that if there is a mother-in-law, uh, what I can say out of just what we see on the in in, in when we're collecting the data is that when the mother-in-law is present then uh, yes, they're more likely to conform to the norm of staying within the boundary of the home. So even when we were eliciting network information, if the mother-in-law sitting there, uh, even if we've asked for privacy, she would like, no, I don't know anybody. I don't talk to anyone <laughs> except for members of my family. And you know, the surveyors would come back and tell us, you know, if we went back to the same woman, and the mother-in-law is not there, all the names would come tumbling out. Yeah, I talk to this person and I have a phone and I engage with that person, <laughs> yes. So are you absolutely right? We should look at heterogeneity, but of course the structure of the household is endogenous. Of course, we yeah. Don't know how much we can take away from that, but it's still, you know, it's kind of useful information. But what we see is that more than 50% of their social connections are these female relatives which means that, you know, and, and what we do see, oh, and I didn't give you this result, but for those women who have a larger share of their network being female non co-residing relatives, they are the ones who are more likely to take up self-employment. So the confirmation, you know, your network is pushing you to conform to the gender norm when it is more heavily composed of uh, those who are close to you and your relatives, but not co-residing as opposed to if they were your friends. So maybe that gets at some of, you know, the point about the mother in law indirectly. Thanks. All right, and anyone else have some last uh, questions or thoughts for Farzana? Thank you, Farzana. Um, Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Edmund, do you wanna, um, share your slides excellent yeah okay i don't right. see i don't see any other hands up so um maybe let's get started uh thank you edmund yeah great i'm really excited to be here um thank you so much for um accepting our paper I, I'm going to apologize ahead of time for those of the, you that wanted to see the wonderful Lakshmi Iyer, <laughs> who, um, who is the really famous economist on our paper and has been really helpful in this. Um, she wasn't able to make it because she had other events um, to do. Um, Al Fairtig from University of Michigan is joining um, and he'll help a little. I think he, I'm hoping that he'll help with any questions that get put in the chat that I don't see. Um, and, and Alexander Hartman from University of College London. So this project arose when we were doing an evaluation of an intervention for IPA on a land for the landless intervention. And this puzzle and really interesting sort of natural experiment emerged that we wanted to take advantage of. Um, it, it, you know, there, there is, there are, there's a, as many, I'm sure you know, a very large literature in political economy about the benefits of property rights for women and, and how they flow through to affect women's economic performance and then ultimately economic empowerment and decision-making in the household. But of course, this is a, a very difficult nut to crack because of all the obvious endogeneity and unobserved heterogeneity problems with estimating it. And so with this um, experiment, we thought got us excited because it gave us an opportunity um, to sort of pull that apart. Um, so um, I think one thing I do wanna make clear at the very beginning is this we the the work for this was conducted in 2019 in Myanmar um so the so the first the baseline survey this was the data I'm going to show you was from a baseline survey that was conducted in 2019 prior to COVID but then um Myanmar was hit by COVID and then the coup and we were not able to go back um to to finish the rest of the study um all right so um I I think with this audience I don't need to demonstrate um, there's so much. Um, so um, obviously there are very there's disadvantages. Um, we've we've looked um, in, in this in this conference today, there's been a lot um, of work demonstrating increasing women's labor force participation, but it still remains highly biased in Myanmar specifically, um, which is exemplary of a lot of other developing countries. Um, the labor force participation for men is particularly high, 76 percent compared to 46 percent of women. Um, and um, in you know, and there's obviously high estimates of physical or sexual intimate partner violence that um, that we observe in Southeast Asia and also in Myanmar as well. Um, 
so the, these are sort of the issues that women face in terms of being sort of generally disadvantaged. Um, in addition, women have fewer access to land and other assets. Um, women are 43% of the global agricultural labor force, but hold only 25% of agricultural land globally. Um, and in 2003 in Myanmar, where we're working, the FAO estimated that 15% of land in Myanmar is held by women. That's increased a little bit, but not very much. So the, the ultimate question that we are interested in is, can formal property rights over land improve the economic outcomes facing women, narrow this gender gap, and then also improve inter-household bargaining? Um, so um, there is a lot of literature that suggests yes, um, some theoretical, um, some formal, uh, and some empirical, but actually very, very tightly causally identified tests are limited. So um, related literature that I think is important here that I think many of you know, um, Agar Agarwal argued that women's ownership and control over land is vital to their empowerment. Um, in particularly, he was looking at the importance of household bargaining um, and, and, and economic empowerment without it. Um, he looks at historical and qualitative evidence from several regions of South Asia. Um, Mines and Dick, in an excellent review of 52 studies on the impact of lands, um, women's land rights on a range of economic um, um, outcomes, finds increases in women's decision-making power, mobility, and empowerment, um, but, not, uh, but not robust effects across the entire range of countries. Um, and acknowledges that what we observe for agricultural productivity and access to credit are based on a limited number of studies. Um, a third issue that we um, that we do want to look at this paper is the effect of backlash. Um, so um, Balhotra et al. Um, have a really interesting pair um, um, that looks at um, interhousehold violence and female feticide. Um, after that increased after inheritance reform. So this is after women are empowered, does this affect um, it, um, not, just, not just household bargaining, but have a negative effect on um, violence in the household. Um, there is a large and growing literature on income transfers to women. Um, Almas et al. have a great way of studying this um, using um, 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 behavioral games. Um, Esther Duflo has looked at this. So one thing that we are going to look at um, that we think is is interesting is that we're not studying mandates where assets were transferred to women or factors were transferred to women. We're instead looking at incentives um, to incentivize giving land to women. So we think that's an important contribution. I, I wanted to show you this. This is the Minds and Dick um, sort of theory of change where she mapped out all the different ways that women's land rights um, um, might impact um, variables that we might be interested in economic performance. I think the um, sort of the, the key ones that we see sort of come through the middle, um, the ones that we're interested in getting at. So women acquire more formal land rights, that improves their ability to access credit, um, that in turn might lead to the opportunity for um, 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 increasing non-agricultural livelihoods, so their ability to um, to engage in um, off-farm, non-farm activity. Um, it could also lead to women being allowed to adopt better technology and increasing agricultural productivity, which improves women's income and leads to household bargaining power. Um, Meinzadik also notes that just giving women land rights also might empower them directly, which also might lead to bargaining power within the household. Um, so. Um, that you can see that with this causal chain, there are just a number of factors to consider. And also the obvious endogeneity becomes very difficult or becomes um, sort of really critical to unpack, which is that when we observe women acquiring greater land use rights, was that more possible in areas where women already had higher bargaining power or where there were cultural situations where um, it was easier for women to be able to acquire those rights. So, so exogenous assignment of women's lands rights is critical here. And we think that's what we've been able to answer. Um, so um, we're sort of, the, the simple framework that we're interested in sort of comes through the middle of that Minds and Dick paper. Um, so we're, we're, um, we're looking to see whether formal property rights lead to women's economic empowerment. Um, um, second, whether which is which has been studied by Erica Field, Goldstein et al. Um, 
whether formal property rights lead to other kinds of economic empowerment, including female household decision making, and then finally whether formal prior um, lead to formal property rights lead to how um, greater bargaining power within the household and the possibility of backlash. So, in particular, in the paper, we lay out five households, uh, five hypotheses um, that we're going to test based on the data from our survey. Um, so. And as I said, we're interested in this financial incentive to be able to, to um, split land and put it in the women's name. So the first hypothesis is that um, um, those given this exogenous incentive to split land will be more likely to have property rights granted in their name. That's sort of necessary. So we wanna first observe that that happened. Um, second, that there'll be higher levels of economic participation, including loans. Third, that that would lead to increased economic benefits, including agricultural income and revenue, and then higher levels of agency, including more participation in household decision making and agricultural matters. Um, and um, and then um, and then a fourth one, which we'll test with a behavioral game um, similar to the Almas at all is willing to sacrifice less to control an unconditional transfer to the household um, because they have. Um, already exert more power in decision making. And then um, because I am a political scientist by training, we did want, there is there are some really interesting political science theories about access to property rights and whether um, that makes citizens um, more favorable about democracy and more likely to participate politically. Um, so we'll, we'll look at those two because we have the data to test that in our survey. Um, so, okay. So the, I think the the critical issue that um, that we want to look at here has to and, and the natural experiment that we're going to exploit has to do with the unique um, um, unique sort of way land works in Myanmar. So Myanmar, like a lot a lot of other countries, you can think Singapore, you can think China, you can think Vietnam. All land is technically owned by the state, but the government then allocates long term usage rights that can be exchanged, sold, or mortgaged. Um, so they're these in some places they're called land titles or land use rights certificates. So we generally call that ownership, and because they have this ability to exchange, control, and mortgage it, um, though that um, though it, it really is meant it is technically a long term lease. Um, so the strongest property rights in Myanmar are provided by what's called a land grant in urban settings or what goes by the name Form 7 because of the document you have to fill out, which um, gives you a land use rights certificate for agricultural land. Um, so Form 7 renewal dates, because these are long-term leases, last 36 or 90 years, um, but there's very little evidence that renewal is anything but automatic. Everybody that's had one has been able to renew after it's expired. There is, however, and this is a this was a big concern in Myanmar um, pre-coup. It's obviously a bigger concern now, is that the government can confiscate prior um, property for eminent domain for infrastructure building or economic development building. Okay, one very confusing thing about working on land in Myanmar is a lot of people think they have titles when they actually don't. They think they have form seven or the most formal form of property rights, but they actually hold lesser documents. So part of these are um, documents that you need to acquire a form seven. So you need to be able to get um, a mapping of your land, which exists in form 105. Um, sometimes you need a history of transfers. Um, Sometimes there are documents that are confused. Form 15 or Form 39 allow for subletting or transferring, but are not actually the underlying title. Um, and a confusing thing about this in Myanmar is people have traded these and people have purchased them as if they were land titles. But we're, I want I highlight that because I want to focus just on the Form, form 7. seven. Um, but, there, but I did want to document that some people are confused on whether they actually have the right title or not. Um, so... Um, in there was a new land policy that it was um, interest introduced in 2016 um, after the return to democracy in 2015, which is really important. Um, so I, I'm sure, as you know, in Myanmar, um, there was a major constitutional reform in 2008, um, and then um, the um, and then um, um, elections in 2015, which brought in a sort of a quasi democratic system where um, an elected democracy existed a lot that had power sharing arrangement with the underlying military government. Um, so during that period, 
there it um there in the national land use policy they um removed any restriction on women being able to hold property or a, be able to have joint registration so women can have their names on land titles there's no legal restriction to them doing it but um in practice um that um we don't um we don't actually see that being implemented as much so like one one key issue that survey respondents will often talk about or people will talk about in Myanmar is that the form 7 which I'll show you in a second the name to put both parties names on it is very small and so they say that's one reason they write it but there's also just more general cultural reasons um so um a lot of people, 13% of the people from our survey said that only men's names should be on Form 7 since men are the major decision makers. 13% um, felt that joint registration would lead to conflicts between couples. Um, simultaneous with our survey, we surveyed village officials um, who, the, the actual village officials who, um, who help with land procedures. Um, they said that women, 22% that said that women should not make decisions about household agricultural plots. Um, and only 50% 50, 50 of the officials who were in charge of land procedures felt, um, believed that a woman's name should be included in the land document. So these are cultural barriers that have affected um, bureaucratic performance in Myanmar that affects women's ability to get their name on the documents. Okay, so here's, here's what kind of Form 7 looks like. Um, so people fill out their region. There's the name of the farmer. It goes with the uh, registration number. Um, and then appended to this would be a map previous ownership history. Um, and this is the document that allows people to exchange access mortgages. Okay. okay. So I, the really interesting thing comes for us um, in terms of the banking regulations. So um, in the place where in our site, um, rice production accounts for the most agricultural loans in Myanmar. In our regional site, 100% of agricultural loans are in rice. Um, the major bank prior to the coup was um, um, a state-owned bank called the Myanmar Agricultural Development Bank. Um, it was the dominant source of agricultural lending in the country. So between 60 to 90% of agricultural lending, where, depending on where you were, was done by the Myanmar Agricultural Development Bank. Um, to get a loan, an agricultural loan, you needed to be able to produce, a, like in many other countries, a Form 7, um, a formal proof of land ownership, in addition to some other documents, a savings account and an MADB, membership in a land committee. Um, interest rates are fairly um, um, modest, zero, I mean, well, I mean, relative to developing country standards, not, not relative to developed country standards, 0.71% um, per month, 8.5% um, per annum. Um, Commercial bank loans in Myanmar um, charge um, have a larger range and on average charge slightly more. Here's the really interesting thing. So the loan size for these um, MADB agricultural loans is about a, a hundred thousand kyat, so about a hundred dollars, which is issued per acre. So at one acre you get a hundred dollars, at two acres you get two hundred dollars, but it's capped at 10 acres. So if you have 11 acres, you're still only getting um, $1,000 in loans, right? And so um, any additional loan amounts require a separate Form 7. Um, so you can imagine um, what the incentive here um, is for families is to, if they have any land above that, it's to subdivide, um, generate another Form 7 and put that land um, in the woman's name, right? So. Um, experiment that we're going to exploit here is that financial incentive to split the land. Um, we're not the first people to discover this. We wish we were. We're not the first people to discover it. Um, Ong et al. used that same 10-acre cutoff to test the implications of rural finance. They weren't looking at gender effects. Um, they found a null effect on, of yield, um, on yields and output of being above the income um, they suggested there, which is interesting for our study, that there was some spillover of loans into non-farm activities. Um, all right, so the data for our survey, um, I should just take a quick, are there any questions about that? So everybody understand the context that we're working in? Yeah, can I actually clarify this uh, property right arrangement? So it is a use right, but you mm -hmm. can sell and mm -hmm. you can rent it out. Yes. And it's protected. So in terms of government confiscation, does it depends on what you do with the land? 
So is it more likely if you sell it, if you rent it out, that you, it will be confiscated more easily? You know, is that something related to that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like there, I think there's two sources and Al, you can jump in here because Al's looked at these two a lot. The, the, when, where you see that eminent domain use, so the first part has nothing to do with what the owner's using it. It had to do with government projects, whether they were building infrastructure or buildings. Um, there was, there have been efforts to reclaim land that was being unused. Um, people that were squatting on land use rights certificates and retrieving that, and some um, and to to put those back in the market. Um, so um, and sometimes that was. Um, that was done by connected political actors taking away land from those who um, weren't using it. So, but um, but it's it's the non-use rather than the specific kind of use that has generated that. And you cannot use the land other than agriculture activity, right? It has to be used for farming. It it is supposed to be the when you have a form seven, it is supposed to be used for farming. Um, um, at least in our survey and in other surveys I've seen, you do see people using that for some non-farm activities, um, off-farm activities. So you'll see small tailoring out bits, some small restaurants like noodle shops taking place on places that are holding Form 7s. Yeah. Um, we're primarily looking at agricultural activity because that is the main use though. So, um, but we're, we, you know, we're conscious of the fact that there's a small percentage, that I think 4% that are using it for other things. Um, yeah, so um, so to get at this in 2019, um, um, we conducted um, with IPA in my Myanmar a large household survey in 128 village tracks. So this is um, slightly larger than a village in terms, and it's not really a, 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 an official administrative unit, but it is, but the village tract officials do have um, some activities over land across 14 townships, which is which was official administrative unit and the most important one for economic activity in Myanmar. So we were working in what was called the Irrawaddy region. Um, so we selected these particular townships because of the other intervention we were doing, which was a program um, to for land to the landless, giving land to the unlanded to see the impact economic impact of it. Um, but we, but in our survey, we were conscious of this natural experiment and wanted to make sure that we could capture it. So we surveyed 2,534 households, um, of which um, 1,671 had access to land. Um, so in, um, we're, I'm, we're only interested in the ones for this project that had access to land. We're dropping the unlanded. Um, one really cool thing about our study is we interviewed both male and female um, household um, head members. So 5,068 individuals, so we could get both women's and men's perceptions on these activities. Um, so we zeroed in on the survey, conducting um, um, surveying households with less and more than 10 acres of land. Um, just a few characteristics, average age um, is about 48.5 and 51 for men respectively. 84% of the women have only commuted primary school. 38% um, of men have finished secondary school. Average household size is about 4.6, um, sometimes including children or extended relatives. Um, so yeah, I, this is the land size distributions here. Um, so the, I think the first thing I want you to know, in, and this is gonna be something that is important for how we sort of conduct the analysis here, is you can see this lumpiness in land size distribution reporting, like people are rounding up a little, right? So you can see, um, at one, at 10, at 20. So th that, you know, that's standard um, in places with relatively low administrative um, bureaucratic capacity. Um, the second thing I want you to see is that we do have um, sufficient um, information on households um, at 10 and below, which is um, where our regression discontinuity is. We're going to, we are going to call, we're going to, since, since this is, this land would not be split, everybody that's 10 and below right here, that's that's the part we're looking at in the regression discontinuity. And then we have sufficient households at 10 and above, okay? Um, so for most of our um, bandwidth calculations, we're using an optimal bandwidth calculation that is a, a little over two acres, depending on the outcome variable. So you can see we go from about 10 to about 12, and then from ten, um, from eight to 10 here for, for the regression discontinuity. Um, Median land holdings about eight acres. Um, the fifth percent is about five acres, and the ninety-fifth percentile about thirty-five acres. 
Um, 62% of households own only one plot, 25% own, own two plots. And it's, it's those two plot households that are sort of critical for um, how we're thinking about what's going on here. Um, to estimate the total land holding size, we're adding up plots. So if someone has two plots, we're taking the total. Um, all right, so in terms of the formal land rights, 88% of households report a possession of at least one Form 7. Um, 2% two, two house, 2 of households report possession of alternative land documents. 30% um, of the plots with a Form 7 have multiple Form 7s. Um, so why do, um, in the survey, we asked people why they had different, um, why they were doing this. About 40% 40, 40 said, um, they, um, the, it, the different form sevens had to do with boundary issues. Um, the second had to do with acquisition. We acquired the plot at one time and then later we acquired it at a different time. And about 8% said it has to do with being able to access multiple loans. Um, so women are, tend to be less knowledgeable about the details of household form sevens. So they're more likely to answer don't know to how many form sevens are on the plot. Um, 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 and, um, uh, um, so um, they report, um, um, women report 32% of plots having multiple four sevens compared to 34.7% of men. So there's some discrepancy in how they're answering these questions and saying don't knows. The higher level don't knows, I'm sure as everybody on this Zoom knows, women tend to answer more don't knows on surveys, sort of a general finding you know, um, in the survey literature. Um, so in 9.5% um, of female respondents report their name on a Form 7 in their household. Um, men report at 8.9%. So there's some discrepancy um, between men and women on, on sort of this basic information. 11.2% um, of female respondents report any woman's name on a Form 7 in their household. Um, and then we're unable to identify gender of 15% of the names on the Form 7. So we just it's like we were, we sometimes we could code the gender by because we knew who they were, or we could code the gender by the name. But there are some cases where the name is neutral or the name was hard to detect. And so we weren't able to do that. Um, and only 6.3% of female respondents report their name alone on any plot of land within that household. Um, yeah, so here um, some basic summary statistics in terms of the age um, and primary education. So um, you can see that um, um, that in, in, the, uh, in general, um, women are a little bit less educated than men, and there is some discrepancy. Um, they generally are agree on the number of household members. Um, um, so in terms of formal property rights, um, in, we, about number of plots with a non-missing plot size is about 1.5. Total number of Form 7s in the household, you can see the average numbers. Um, a little bit higher for men, but generally consistent. Um, household has at least one Form 7 in the female household's name, about 9%, and household has at least one Form 7 in female household's name with nobody else, about 6%. Yeah. Um, so in terms of economic outcomes, 55% um, of households um, report no loans that were taken out using the land as collateral. Um, there's about slightly under one loan for male households and, um, and about 0 0.06 for the female household. Um, and then in terms of agricultural and non-agricultural enterprises, 19% of women and 21% of men report being engaged in non-agricultural enterprises. So that goes to your question, um, Rachel. Um, and revenue from non-agricultural enterprises is only about 5% of revenue that we get from agriculture, which is why we focus on agricultural outcomes. Um, yeah, so here's um, sort of that here's a sort of summary of that information for the total male and female respondents across these activities. Yeah, um, yeah everything's measured in millions of kyat. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, now to measure, so those, are, so the I should just highlight like we're the, in the economic outcomes. We're going to look at loans. We're going to look at agricultural revenue from the plots, and then in particular, patty revenue and revenue income in the woman's name um, as a way of measuring the economic empowerment of the woman. Um, in, um, so in terms of female agency, the way we did this, um, we had an index where we asked a large number of questions um, from us. This is a standard battery of women's agency that's common in the literature, um, asking whether women, whether we're involved in decisions about land transactions, livestock gardening, 
So we coded it as one if either the man or the so the, so for the men for women if they said yes. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I thought that was a question. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So um, if 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 the respondent if the respondent said yes, we coded it as one, and then we summed those com components up, and then took the standardized z-score. So on average. So, so men and women were asked the same set of questions. So on average, the women's Z-score was about 0.704, um, corresponding to reporting one at about 1.5 of those categories, while the men's Z-score was considerably lower. So, so you can see that women, men assess women's agricultural decision-making as lower than women do. Um, we did the same sort of technique for um, female agency and household decision-making. Um, so this was about eight questions, not always involving um, education. They involve childcare, healthcare, cooking, expenditures. Um, again, um, women's C-score was a little bit higher, about 0.370, um, um, about, so, um, about five out of eight categories, men's score was lower. Um, so um, these, the two measures of women's empowerment um, were tended to be positively correlated about 0.33. So correlated, but not super high. All right, so, yeah, so there's some basic information. You can see the index. We do the index. We have um, a female agency expenditure. We have a women takes power index. Um, so this is these are from some economic games that we played um, um, here about taking power in household decision making. All right, so let me get to the methodology um, for this. Um, so um, as you can tell, I think I've highlighted this. We're going to do um, a regression discontinuity design. That's our way of solving. So the critical problem that when you sort of look at the literature is there is this issue of we don't have a truly exogenous assignment of property rights. So when we do encounter women's with property rights, we have to ask if it has to do with the pre-existing bargaining power of women or economic empowerment of women. So we have this, the Myanmar Agricultural Development Bank gives us this opportunity to look at it because we can do an RDD where we're looking at those slightly above that threshold. So those with um, above 10 acres. Um, and then our forcing variable is the total number of land holding. Um, we're gonna use the RD robust package um, um, and we're gonna you know, calculate optimal bandwidth for that. Um, so just a couple of things I wanna show you about the research design. So um, the first thing I just, I pulled this out of our appendix cause I thought it was critical for you to see. We are highly balanced on age, um, on primary education. There doesn't seem to be a lot of differences on potential confounders at that threshold. So we're not seeing tend to be um, at that threshold, a shift, intercept shift in wealthier families and higher educated families um, in the number of household members. So that's very nice. And um, that's in their appendix. We do that across a, a wide range. So we feel pretty comfortable there. But then, but then why this makes a very nice experiment is you can see this jump in the number of plots um, at 10 acres, a very clear intercept jump at the number of form sevens, um, a jump in the any form in the woman's name and a jump in the um, any woman's name exclusively in those plots. So that that's very nice, which tells us that there's some idea here that we do have exogenous assignment and we can look to see the downstream effects of that. Um, one last thing, there's been a lot of criticism of RDD designs um, because of the limited power. I mean, by, by nature, you're shrinking the power to get in at the bandwidth. And so um, the question is, so if, you know, so there has been a criticism that many of the times people are far underpowered to be able to detect an effect. And when they do detect an effect, it's because it was um, obscenely large. So they just got really lucky. Um, or um, and other people have said there might be some publication bias in RDD designs because when we get a null effect that was because it was underpowered, we don't tend to see it published in the literature. Um, so, so one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that um, across the different outcome variables that we looked at, that we were um, powered enough to be able to find. So these are the what you see here is um, the percentages of outcomes that were powered enough to find. These are reported in terms of standard deviations, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5. So you can see here, if we for a one standard deviation effect, 
at about 80% power, we're powered enough to find um, effects for 77% of the outcome variables that we're interested in. So we feel pretty confident moving forward um, that uh, the reason I want to say that is because, and that means that we're, we are powered enough that null effects can be treated as, as true null effects and not an artifact of not having enough power to do it. Okay. Okay. Any questions about the research design before I move to the, um, um, to the results? Okay. I should, can I, can I just do like a little survey here for those of you online? Like I'm very curious to know before I sh show you the results, what you think the results would be in terms of economic empowerment. Like, do you think, I, I you like, do, do you think that the land use rights will, <laughs> will generate women's greater ec um, economic decision-making and greater household bargaining from your knowledge of the literature before, like, I'm curious, if you just want to throw them in the chat, I'd be, before I jump in there. Okay. Okay. So if some people saying yes, all right. So I don't know. I think I, I was going to say, I think it depends a little bit on the structure of the economy as well. Like, mm -hmm. the, you know, the other things that women are going to be able to do or, you know, have yeah. sort of making power over. So you know, maybe within the household, this shifts things a little, but it depends also on on the broader yeah. um, context of in which they're making these decisions. Like, so whether they know, can... I don't know enough about Myanmar to mm -hmm. have a sense of whether this is likely to shift real outcomes. Yeah, um, I think that's an important consideration. All right, so let me show you the results. Yeah, so um, I think that you might have anticipated this. So, so. Um, these here's just to show you we have the female responses the male responses there's the control mean and then you can see because the optimal bandwidth is changing um, across the different specifications depending on the variance observed you can see that it, um, in areas where there's um, um, smaller number of observations or higher variance or optimal bandwidth is shifting a little bit so um so number of plots with non-missing plot size. So that makes sense. We, we would be scared if we didn't observe that. There was a larger number of um, plots above that. Total number of form sevens. Notice here, for female respondents, the total number of form sevens in the household name, we, we observe a significant. For men, we don't. For a household has at least one form seven in the household's name jointly, women say about 13% more likely um, men are about 20% more likely. Um, and then, um, so that so that that discrepancy is interesting, not statistically different, but interesting that men tend to think there's more name, house, um, 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 the, um, there's more land in the woman's name than they do. And then the household has at least one form seven in the female household's name, female household's name exclusively, again, about 13% and 20%. So we do see a greater allocation of property rights to women here. Um, and then one thing I just wanted to, we do want to do real quickly is to make sure that was happening at that 10 cutoff, that it really was an incentive to split the land at that 10 acres. So here, what we're doing here is just running that same design. Um, here we're just, um, here's just showing the female respondents, but for each cutoff, and this is just plotting that coefficient, that marginal probability, and um, across the different bandwidths. So you can see um, very clearly that the incentive is at 10. It's not happening at 11 or more downstream. Um, so um, so we observe it here. This one, um, that was significant at the 90% level. That's why it's crossing a little bit there. Um, Edmund, okay. how, do you, how did you code the, the ones that didn't, that you couldn't tell the gender? Um, yeah, the ones where we couldn't tell the gender, we dropped, right? We just dropped, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so here's the financial incentives. So this is interesting. In number of loans in the woman's name, um, so um, female respondents report 14% higher loans in their name. So we do see more economic activity. We don't observe the same thing for men here. Um, one thing that's super interesting here is um, a 61% effect on number of loans in the male household's name. So the women, the, the female respondent is aware 
that there may be, may be more loans after splitting, but thinks it's in the man's name as opposed to in the woman's name. Okay, so they're more likely to get land and, um, and um, yeah, and so here's that same um, sort of effect, number of loans in the female household's name. We see that same shift, that important shift at 10, not across the other areas. Um, it's a little bit more um, wobbly here when we're looking at the loans in the male household's name. We, we also see a significant effect at 12. Um, so we have more land in the woman's name, more loans in the woman's name, but then comes the next question, does it actually lead to increased economic activity? And this, Taryn, I think this was your point in the question. Um, we don't in terms of um, the total agricultural revenue com coming from plots with a woman's name on the form seven, um, we don't find a significant effect and actually slightly negative effect. Um, the total non-agricultural income in the female household's name, um, significantly negative um, for both male and female respondents and total agricultural revenue from all plots, pretty much a zero effect. Um, so we're just not seeing, while we're seeing the loans being given to women, we're not seeing um, higher levels of economic activity um, um, in, um, in the plots that they control or that they have property rights over. Um, and then moving on to their ability to influence decision-making. Um, so these are just the, um, the female responses here. So here is that index that I told you of agency and agricultural decision-making about choices about crops or um, about other plots. Um, once again, effectively a zero effect. Um, there, um, the male response here. Um, um, so this is from a behavioral game about whether women are taking power, where we ask them to essentially split the dollar. Once again, we here we actually see a negative effect um, over these decisions: women taking power, the husband giving power, and the women and men agreeing. So, um, so you can see that um, across these effects, we're essentially getting zero on women's increased decision making. Um, and then finally, um, on women's non-agricultural decision making on households, once again, in terms of expenditure decisions, um, agency and expenditure decisions, once, um, and then giving or taking power, which has been common in, the, which has been talked about in the Almas and Seema Jaya Chandran's work, once again, essentially zero results across for male and female respondents. So, um, so we're not, um, once again, not trans seeing that translation of a formal property right into actual um, effects on decisions. And then finally, the political ones, um, you know, we asked, essentially asked male and female respondents, could they name local officials? Um, so could they name a higher level official in the province, the head of the village track authority? Um, we asked them about their plans to vote in an upcoming election and their feelings about democracy or satisfaction with democracy in Myanmar. Um, again, so across the board, we don't see effects of political empowerment or political knowledge for women. Um, male respondents on the other side of the threshold were slightly more likely to remember the VTA authority, um, but we don't see the effects on democracy there either. Yeah, um, yeah, so um, summing up, I mean, we think it's kind of, a, it's an interesting study um, so there is a huge literature, um, formal and empirical, on economic and agency benefits of providing women's property rights in developing countries. But um, as I showed you, the causal chain here is very complicated, and it's really, really hard to unpack social, uh, cultural, and political constraints that lead to granting women greater rights in the first place. Um, we feel like we had a really cool natural experiment that allowed us to tease this apart and test it. Um, um, and we um, and we do find strong evidence of exactly the behaviors that we would expect, that splitting the land, more women, loans in the woman's name, but then ultimately on the things that we care about, agricultural activity, women's decision making, we don't find those results. And I think the, the I think the story is that there there are severe sociocultural um, household barriers to be able to translate formal property rights in, into agricultural decision-making. And, um, and that's what we're observing here in the Myanmar case. So th yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, looking forward to your helpful comments. Thanks so much. Um, Edmund, can you go back to the slide 
uh, I think like the the first stage, what's going on with um, the number of uh, the loans? Oh, on the loans. I, yeah, so I think I saw like women, men. No, sorry, sorry, not on the loans. The actual uh, form in yeah, the form uh, seven. The yeah. yeah, yeah. So I thought I saw that men. Yeah, I think that third column and even maybe the fourth column sort of saying that men are that women are not reporting as much femaleness in the property rights as men are and so one yeah. thing that could be going on is just that men are putting the woman's name on the form seven and getting the loan and they're just not telling the wife and so that might be part of why the you know you're not finding downstream effects an additional yeah. reason why you might not find downstream effects if you're not told that you have this right then. yeah to totally 100 percent. like i think that's going it, it, you you um you you kind of observe it here too in that this in the places that are above that threshold like the, the we have this 61 percent effect for thinking that there's additional loans in the man's name right yeah. so which tells you that the man might be breaking the land and then going to get loans based on it and telling the woman it's in yeah. his name rather than hers um yeah i think that we think it's going on and so like we're we're so we're yeah so but i, I mean our idea here was at least here the 13 percent of women who know it's in their name might have been more empowered going forward, at least, right? Because they, they actually have due knowledge. But you're right. There, there's a group here who never have the opportunity to be empowered because they don't know um, about that activity, and and which also has some interesting policy implications. Al, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I, th I think yeah. I mean, that's something that we we noticed that that you know uh, was one mm -hmm. of the first things we noticed looking at this table. Yeah, and that was that's been our theory, kind of the whole time. But there's, the, you know, there's nothing in the survey that can really um, verify that. But that's definitely seems to be what the data is saying. Yeah, we we've been we have been suspicious of this. There's a whole that story. If we could tell that story very easily across a number of things where women um, have been empowered but have less knowledge to know it. So it's 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 a really good intuition. Um, I see Farzana. Yeah, I had uh, I had asked this question in the chat, and it, uh, I think I did get a response. But I was wondering if you could also elaborate on exactly why you would. Ex so I'm I'm trying I'm trying to understand what is the structure of the households in Myanmar. Is it typically like nuclear families, or do they have multi generational families? So the reason I'm asking that is that uh, what why would we expect the transfers? Of or the new form seven to be only in the name of uh, the wife, let's say, right? So if there's a younger daughter, for example, mm -hmm. or there's a mother, the male head has a mother, or you know some other extended family. So for example, a daughter would be uh, yeah. quite easy, and you know, like maybe less uh, of a concern in terms of passing on some power to another member of the household. So what is the structure of the households that we see typically in Myanmar? That was my yeah. first question. And the second is, if we look at columns three and four, this, the, you know, these are very uh, uh, imprecisely estimated effects, like it's significant mm -hmm. that 10%. So mm -hmm. this is like a very weak first order effect, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not very robust and so, I mean, I totally agree with, uh, you know, the possibility of what Taryn was suggesting is that they don't know that their name has been put on this new Form 7. But it could also just be that uh, the women in the households getting the Form 7, like an adult woman for whom you want to see these empowerment effects, not really happening, but there's some other members of the household, maybe they are women, but not necessarily the ones who would also want to exercise mm -hmm. uh, their bargaining power in other household decisions. So yeah, so that's the second. So it's, it's a weak effect. And so it's natural to expect that the second order effects would either not be there or would be just as weak, right? Yeah. So if you could elaborate a little bit on the structure of the households and yeah. yeah. That would be very helpful. Thanks. Yeah. So, so non, non, like extended family living in a Myanmar household is not 
is not unusual. Um, I think we showed that the, the average family size is about 4.8 or 4.9, including kids or extended family. We did, we were conscious of this, Farzana. So we like when we, so I should tell you that the idea came around because people working with us on the other project were talking about their incentives to put the land in this household's name. So we, so we have a great deal of qualitative evidence that that was going on, which is why we decided to do it. And we also captured whose name in the household it was on. So, um, so the it, it really, the spouse is the most likely person they turn to, but not always the only one. So we've run it for all potential female households as well. Um, but you're right, they do have other options to do this. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the spouse. I think I think there are some reasons sort of um, tax wise and other formal procedure wise where the spouse makes the most sense. It would be great yeah, if you could, uh, I mean, if, 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 if you could de dwell on that a little bit more because I was kind of lost in the beginning trying to understand uh, what okay. it would be. Because, uh, you know, in some countries, for example, uh, they might want, I would see the first choice would be the daughter, you know? Why the wife? You know, you yeah. can control the daughter and, uh, uh, and her, uh, you, you know, she's less likely to impose her preferences on decision-making within the household than the wife. So you might think that that is a safer option. Oh, that would not have been my intuition because I would have been worried about um, issues with the daughter marrying and having the property right in her name when leaving the home. <laughs> I would, um, so. Yeah, that, that's a great point, exactly. Yeah. So we don't know how it works in Myanmar. For example, there's sometimes there are matriarchal societies. So even in India, for example, there are parts of India where you'll have matriarchal societies, others, you know, mm -hmm. so lineage in any, any way goes down through the mother. So it would be really, I mean, maybe, you know, knowing that about Myanmar would be helpful, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we, those are really, and since we're folk, we, since the cultural issues matter to us, we should really focus on that. Yeah. Um, I think Rebecca had a had a question or a comment. Thanks. Is my microphone working? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Great. I was just going to ask. <clears throat> how long it was between the addition of the women's name to the land and the follow-up survey? Oh, yeah, so we, um, so we're, the, our, the, the, the land law changed in 2016. So that's when it, that's when it became clear that there were no restrictions on having women's names on the form seven and our survey was conducted in 2019. Um, so, um, so yeah, there's kind of a three year window here. Um, for it to happen. The, the agricultural policy actually existed before that. Um, so going back to 2010, so there, there may have been some activity before that. It, is there a reason, is there something we should do, Rebecca, because of that? No, I, I'm, I'm just wondering um, whether, if this is sort of a necessary um, part of women's economic empowerment, but not sufficient, it would, it might need more time for the wider socio-cultural kind of changes to take place. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, and so it, I don't know how you test that, but it, it could be a key kind of enabler mm -hmm. for once those wider socio-cultural changes happen. Um, I just wonder if it's a particularly bad time between 2016 and 20, well, I'm not really sure. So that would have uh, been the best time because that was sort of the blossoming of democracy and yeah. periods of economic growth in Myanmar. Um, so prior to that, you know, it was still military regime. And then, out, and then of course there was the coup in 2021. So yeah, yeah. So that was the window for these things to take place. Yeah. Okay, interesting, thank you. Um, Edmund, I had one other question. Am I right in thinking that you're finding the loans jump up at the discontinuity, but agricultural income or earnings doesn't ch change at all? Yeah, that's right. So loans jump up at that discontinuity and then agricultural earnings um, are, e are even slightly negative. Above so that, that actually, that's like a separate uh, kind of an interesting result. Um, I think that these loans are not, I mean, 
what are people using these loans for? It doesn't look like they're getting any return, if anything. It's a yeah. So that that return? that on paper also oh, the that one was that the other also, paper. Yeah, the other paper found the same thing. There wasn't a benefit to the um to the advantage above that extra loan. Yeah. And they they guessed it was because of spillover into non-farm activity. So I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. We Al, Al, we looked at that, right? We looked at the spill. We didn't see evidence of non increased non farm activity either, though. Yeah, that's right. We didn't. I mean, it was I think um, pretty imprecisely measured. The the way we I think there was some issues with the way we measured non non agricultural activity in the survey, perhaps. But we didn't. Yeah, there were no effects on that either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, so but that's it's right. Like it is really interesting that they're getting these loans and they're not productive. After. Right. Any so other the question? the MADB policy makes sense. <laughs> Capping loans. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, so uh, we are scheduled for a break now. Um, if there are any other questions um, or conversations people want to have, uh, feel free to do that. Um, and we should come back for our, our final session, um, I think, yeah. in about 25 minutes. Is that right, yeah. Rachel? <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah, let, let the program, uh, we say we will be soon at 5.35. So 5.35 London time, right. Yeah. It's about 25 minutes from now. So Great. I, Thank I you. I'm going to go teach and then hopefully I'll make it back for the last paper. So um, yeah. I'll <laughs> thank do, you, Abby. Yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank so you for these wonderful comments. This was, this is great. This, um, thanks. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Taryn, do you want me to uh, yeah. regulate the last one? Yes, I was going to ask you, would you mind Are doing you that? Are you exhausted? I mean, you must be too, but um, I okay. think that would be great if, I, you, if you can do the last session. Okay, I'll do the last session. Thank you. But I'll be here. See you later. Just... Yeah, yeah. See you in a while. Right. Sure. All right. So let's wait just uh, one more a minute. I will set a timer so that I will remember to remind you. So I will remind you when it's 14 minutes, 14 minutes into your talk. Thanks. Okay. okay. Let's see. Yeah, it, it, the thing about Zoom conference is you have all kind of time zones here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so some are in really midnight. I think Michelle is already, you know, it must be something like 4 a.m. now. Yeah. So yeah. she must have gone. Okay. So um, shall we start? What do you think? Fine for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming back. Uh, so we are coming to the last part of the, today's conference. Uh, now we start with a paper by Bernardo and then Alexio will be the last paper. So Bernardo, I give it to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And thanks, everybody, for having me. It's a big pleasure for me to present this paper, which is actually a, a chapter from my PhD thesis. It's the third of four chapters, mostly on, on the study of structural transformations in sub-Saharan Africa, with a focus on the informal sector. Um, so this specific case, uh, I'm trying to analyze the effect of technological change, uh, in particular, looking at one specific technology, which is mobile internet on the uh, structural transformation of the informal sector in Nigeria and trying to infer also the impacts of this process of technical change on structural transformation on uh, economic inclusion measured especially uh, in terms of uh, creation of working opportunities within and outside the informal sector. Uh, so yes, uh, what I will do today, uh, I, some very micro approach. I look at informal firms. Uh, I don't look at all type informal firms. I focus on uh, what I will call throughout the presentation, 
uh, non-farming household enterprises. Those are, far, are households, are firms owned by households, where both uh, household and non-household labor is hired. It includes a vast set of possible arrangements, including self-employed, larger firms, and so on and so forth. Most of these hold no re registration whatsoever, neither local nor national. Uh, so these are 7% of those are registered, the rest is not. Uh, this data, which comes from an household survey from Nigeria called the Living Standard Measurement Survey, is then matched with uh, mobile internet information, which is geographical information on the coverage of local government areas in Nigeria in terms of fast internet. So we know how much of the population has access to 3G um, technology, which is uh, the first really fast uh, mobile broadband internet, uh, and then with another set of geospatial data, which we will use uh, for the identif identification strategy. So overall, what we will do is to look at the role of digital adoption, so the adoption of mobile internet uh, and its role on the transformation of the informal sector. We will exploit two different uh, identification strategies. The first is an, an instrumental variable where I use the variation in lightning strikes, geographic variation in lightning strikes uh, to somehow model the presence of mobile cell towers. Very quickly on the rationale of this, whenever a lightning strike hits the ground, it releases a very strong electrostatic charge, which makes the management and the and maintenance of the cell towers much more costly for mobile operators. The second identification strategy is uh, an event study, so a difference in difference uh, with staggered roll, roll out of the treatment. Uh, these will be used mostly to check for the presence of pretrends, which is a necessary assumption also for the instrumental variable to work. Uh, the reason why I don't use this as a main instrument, uh, uh, identification strategy is that we don't have a clear cut for, for the treatment variable. So we basically set the threshold and we use that threshold. Uh, we don't have a dichotomous treatment. Here we have a continuous uh, variable, which is the treatment variable. The quick spoiler on the results, we find that digital adoption mm -hmm. impacts productivity, especially in services. So the benefits of technological adoption are much more likely to be reaped in the service sector by informal firms. It discourages the entry into the manufacturing sector. And we see a process of reallocation of labor away from the household into non-household activities, which is another axis of fractional change. So the, the shift of labor from the household dimension to the market dimension. Uh, a quick uh, set of information as background for this paper. Um, so first of all, why internet? Well, internet is probably the most characterizing uh, technology of our times, probably since the late 80s, beginning of the 90s, the internet has been uh, the technology that has uh, permeated many uh, houses and many countries and changing the way things are done, the way people interact with, it, with each other and so on, with one another and so on and so forth. Now, as you can see, uh, these lines plot the diffusion of mobile, of internet or uh, in general, all types of internet, uh, across different areas of the world. Of course, you see the United States as the forerunners in, in the take up of the new technology since the early 90s. Uh, we have this logistic curve, which is uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, technological diffusion literature, the logistic curve is the very uh, representative process of technological diffusion. We see a very fast rate of adoption uh, given by network effects and then uh, basically plateaus and then goes up again. Now, uh, all the curves are at a different stage of the logistic process. Uh, however, what we see here is that two main areas in Sub-Saharan Africa, which are Eastern and Western Africa, the, two, the, the brown and the blue lines here in the bottom right of the corner of the, of the graph, they are, well, they have seen, these areas have seen an acceleration in the diffusion starting from 2010, but uh, un until that moment, uh, the, the take up was not really there. So we see a lag, adoption of the technology in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, therefore, when we talk about transformative technologies and general purpose technologies that tend to characterize socio-technical paradigms, uh, we don't really refer to all geographical areas equally. There are areas that are laggards in this case, sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. However, we see a huge spike in South Asia and after 2020, we may expect even higher take up uh, in this area, which is where China is. Now, why is this important? Uh, the fact that the technology is diffusing, is diffusing faster creates a, win a window of opportunity for uh, low and middle income countries to undergo a process of structural change. 
a uh, lot of lit- I mean, the evolutionary neoship interior uh, literature has looked a lot on, at the role of general purpose technologies in creating structural change, so in allowing new sectors to emerge and therefore labor to be allocated away from low productivity sectors into modern, more productive sectors. Uh, so it's been argued that this could be a window of opportunity for low and middle income countries to somehow leapfrog away from the traditional productive structure, which is based on low productivity, uh, agriculture and services into more productive activities. However, this is still to be seen. Uh, it's an hypothesis which is kind of testable, but uh, may, we may go into the realm of prediction, which is not what I'm trying to do here. Now, parallel to this, so parallel to this process of technological change, we have seen a process of uh, reallocation of labor in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, towards informal services. This has been one of the results of what Danny Rogic has called the premature deindustrialization of many sub-Saharan African countries. So these countries have not reached maturity in terms of shares of employment in the manufacturing sector, uh, especially in the 70s and the 80s. So after the first and second wave of decolonization uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, there's been uh, international policies uh, imposed or proposed by the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, and so on and so forth that somehow pushed uh, resource-rich countries to, into specialization in their comparative advantage, which in most cases was the export of natural resources. Th- this has created a process of crowding out of investments away from manufacturing activities into the extraction of natural resources, which has basically uh, stunted the evolution of productive sectors like manufacturing. The labor that has been pushed away from the manufacturing sector has gone into informal activities, which are highly heterogeneous in terms of sectoral composition. However, most of these activities are uh, retail, wholesale trade uh, activities with very low productivity. Now, this is a problem for structural change because we know that one of the engines of structural change is first innovation, technological change, and then, of course, the productivity that results from uh, the emergence of new technologies. Now, some literature pioneering empirical literature has been looking at the effect of internet access on employment and productivity. We see that there is a positive effect. Your temples and in particular have looked at uh, the, um, the rollout of the backbone network. So we are talking about uh, the fixed line network. Uh, basically they exploit the, the, the staggered uh, linkage of the backbone of the national backbone networks to the submarine cables that have brought uh, broadband internet from Europe and the US. Uh, this target variation has shown that when uh, firms get access to, uh, to internet, they increase in terms of employment and productivity. But we see also that there could be a negative effect in terms of market concentration. So uh, only the firms and the entrepreneurs with the higher skills may be able to master the technology and may uh, have an advantage over, uh, over incumbents and over other uh, competitors in a way that allows them to uh, to take the benefits, create temporary monopolies, and uh, increase their market share. Now, uh, this is relevant, of course. This is evidence and uh, very sound and robust, uh, etc. However, it has a problem. Uh, this approach doesn't consider informal firms, which are the uh, largest employer in the non-agricultural sector in sub-Saharan Africa. And secondly, it looks at a technology which is. Um, landline internet, which is not as present as mobile internet. So we will try to do something different. We will look at the effect of mobile internet adoption, not only diffusion, and uh, uh, linking it to the performance and structural transformations in in informal firms. I'll focus on the case of Nigeria for a number of reasons. The first is that Nigeria is an oil-rich country, and as, as many other countries that are specialized in the export of natural resources, uh, doesn't have a strong manufacturing sector. There is a very strong uh, export sector, which is the one of commodities, and then uh, a large informal sector dominated by uh, informal services. The informal sector um, accounts for more than 90% of the total employment. This in 2018, this is an ILO estimate. It's extremely large, uh, just to give another uh, motivation to the relevance of the study of informal firms. Um, Renato, this 90% is too shocking. how do they define the informal sector here? It cannot be that 90% of the economy doesn't pay tax, is it? Yes, this includes also agricultural activities, uh, which is 
extremely large in terms of employment. Uh, the estimate comes from an ILO report, which I've cited here, uh, and they consider all the people that work in unregistered businesses. Uh, now, I'm sorry if I can't give more information about this. I should, I should have double checked before the presentation. Uh, but to be honest, I've worked on other sub-Saharan African countries, uh, in particular Ghana. I've used the Ghana Statistical Services um, census of firms for other type of analysis on geographical agglomeration and so on and so forth. And I've seen that in Ghana, 45% uh, of the firms are informal. And that, that's an information that I can double check. It means that uh, firms are not registered either to the registrar uh, general department nor to local authorities. And they don't keep uh, formal accounts. So these three categories account for 45% of the firms and for 80% of the employment. So this seems to be a rather uh, standard figure in Sub-Saharan Africa is not, uh, at least for me, which have been uh, dealing with this type of data. Uh, I understand it's shocking and I should know exactly how the ILO makes the estimate, the estimate but uh, uh, it doesn't come as, as a big surprise to me, but thanks. So the other fact about Nigeria is that uh, in 2015, 45% of Nigerian of the Nigerian population had access to mobile phone services of all types. Um, this comes against another figure, which is only 0.2% of the population are having access to fixed phone lines. And what is more interesting is that this share has been decreasing. So it went from around 1.1% in 2010 in to 0.2% uh, five years later. Now, of course, this is a number that comes from a, a ratio. And of course, it, this could be driven by uh, the increasing population rather than reducing number of fixed phone lines. But uh, it looks like this is not uh, what Nigerians use the most. Uh, another way that Nigerians had to access internet before the uptake of mobile internet technologies was uh, the internet cafes, which are, however, disappearing because it's very cheap to uh, buy a smartphone and uh, use mobile internet using a smartphone. Now, uh, I'll try to give a framework on how I will conduct the analysis uh, and how, uh, where the results are grounded into. Uh, I try to use this framework, which is the inclusive uh, structural change framework, uh, to uh, somehow understand the dynamic relationship that exists between innovation or technological change, structural change, and inclusion. Now, there's a huge literature, especially the new Schumpeterian literature, has been looking at the mutually enforcing mechanism that exists between innovation and structural change. So, an innovation comes to the market, uh, it allows the emergence of a new industrial sector, employment moves away from one sector to the other, and that uh, creates new innovating opportunities uh, around the previously introduced technologies, which links to more innovation and more structural change and so on and so forth. So this is very sketched and uh, brutalized, but this is how the mechanism has been um, conceived in the literature. However, this, this, yeah, this cycle between innovation and structural change uh, does have implications on other aspects of society. One of them is inclusion. Of course, structural change is a very broad definition, depending on how we define it, may bring uh, to the creation or the destruction of uh, jobs, for instance, as a way to consider inclusion. So if uh, an economy moves away from a labor intensive sector into a capital intensive sector, the well, chances are that uh, there will be fewer job opportunities as compared to the previous stage of structural transformation. Of course, we have also the opposite scenario where you have an expansion of labor intensive technologies and labor intensive sectors that allow to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to take up labor from low productivity sectors and therefore to increase uh, aggregate productivity. In terms of innovation, of course, there are innovations or technological transformations that may link to inclusion or not, depending on the technological trajectory of the specific type of innovation that is being introduced uh, and so on and so forth. So what we try to be here is to be an agnostic about the effect of structural change and technological change on inclusion. And in particular, we will try and see uh, one specific set of hypotheses that can be extracted from this framework, which is looking at the effect of innovation, which is in this case, the adoption of mobile internet on structural transformations in the informal sector, and then see whether this pours into uh, economic inclusion positively or negatively. So either creating or destroying uh, job opportunities. We will measure uh, structural change in different ways, and we will see how these um, somehow, um, yeah, 
course down onto inclusion. Yes, Tarin, do you have a question? I, yeah, I, mean, I don't know whether now is a good time, or, you know, you can def defer this to later, but how are you gonna, can you define inclusion in your setting? Uh, yes, well, I mean, I use a one specific dimension of inclusion, which is the creation of job opportunities inside and outside the household. Uh, so in, in, in the fact that are, there are more jobs or fewer jobs uh, provided by the non-farming enterprises and by the market, for me, is a measure of, uh, uh, of inclusion in one. I mean, of course, this is not meant to be uh, a proxy for inclusive societies, of course. It's one possible measure. and. Uh, I mean, it's actually what I can measure from the data. Uh, there is also a gender angle on this, uh, which uh, I, I will only briefly mention uh, because there should be another paper, which uh, I hope to start working on very soon, as soon as my PhD is over. Uh, that's the first thing uh, I will take up. Okay, so no, no worries. Thanks for the question. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, again, I, I will try to estimate the effect of digital adoption on uh, structural change and inclusion, focusing on non-farming enterprises. Uh, I've said a few things about uh, informal firms and non-farming enterprises earlier, but uh, I would like to stress the fact that uh, there's growing evidence that a lot of uh, the between sector component of structural change in terms of productivity is accounted for by the shift of labor from lower productivity household firms into higher productivity household firms. There's a long uh, strand of literature. Margaret Macmillan has been very much on top of these, uh, of, of these uh, empirical patterns. Uh, there's a paper with uh, Xin Shen Diao where they actually decompose the structural change component accounted for by uh, the increased productivity of informal firms. And they see that they actually have contributed uh, for more than a half of the increases in, uh, in, product in aggregate sectoral productivity. Uh, in Tanzania and uh, Nigeria. So, uh, I mean, whether we uh, consider this a vi as a viable uh, option or not, this is what it is. I mean, we have a, an, an, info, an, an economy which is dominated by these firms and the existing productive establishments in these countries are exactly informal activities or non-farming enterprises, which makes them extremely relevant for policymakers to tackle when we think about investor policy. Now, how the analysis is, analysis is going to be conducted, uh, as I said, uh, I will use the different sources of data. I, the main source of data where the information on informal firms comes from is um, the Nigeria Living Standard Measurements, Measurement Survey. There's a panel component within this survey, which is called the General Household Survey of Nigeria. Uh, it has three time periods, uh, 2010, 2012, and 2015. There's actually a fourth round for 2018. However, there's been a huge resampling exercise, which means that I, I won't use the last wave because I really need the panel structure of the data. Uh, so I have, we have these three uh, time periods where we observe information about uh, households and their non-funding enterprises. So households are asked to uh, disclose information about the nature of the businesses they run within the household. Uh, there's actually quite a lot of information in terms of sales labor requirements, uh, access to capital costs, uh, access to credit, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, this is combined with uh, data on mobile internet coverage. Now, just to give you an idea, this is how uh, mobile internet has been diffusing in Nigeria between 2010 and 2015. The color of uh, the LGAs, which is the admin to area, local government areas, gives the uh, share of the population with access to mobile internet services. And by mobile internet services, we in, we consider only 3G or superior technologies, which are the first ones to give uh, fast internet access. Uh, before that, there was the 2G, uh, but 2G is actually the GPRS, which is not fast internet, it's only access to internet, uh, and it's extremely slow and unreliable. Uh, now, of course, there are areas, this is a very skewed distribution and very uh, uh, not very <laughs> homogeneous, as you can see. This is Lagos, for instance, this uh, very, dark green uh, corner. Um, and as you can see, uh, by 2015, there were still districts without access to mobile internet services. Now, this has increased uh, up to 2020. And nowadays, there's much more coverage, but this is the information we have. And we will exploit both the time variation and the geographical variation in internet access to, uh, yeah, this is the variation we will exploit to measure the effect on structural change. 
Now we will instrument uh, the uh, mobile internet data using the WWLLN Global Lightning Climatology time, in time series, which is uh, uh, data which has been provided by the uh, NASA uh, measuring using uh, Earth sensors, measuring the intensity, the density and the frequency of lightning strikes across the entire globe. This data is uh, freely accessible uh, and very useful and very nicely uh, packaged. I will also use uh, data on conflicts from the armed conflict location and event data, ACLED. Uh, this is just a control uh, as there's in growing literature that shows that entrepreneurial activity is severely affected by the presence of conflict. So I will use also a measure of conflict to, uh, yeah, to clean the omitted variable bias. Now, very quickly, uh, I, I know we'll... Uh, Run late, but uh, I think this is important for those of you who are not familiar with the con with the African context. I actually, before starting my PhD, I was an aid worker and worked in West Africa and East Africa. Uh, the first time I went to Guinea-Bissau, which was the very first place where I started working, I worked in an NGO that uh, aimed at supporting local producers. In particular, we were supporting uh, traditional weavers. Uh, this is an example of uh, traditional weavers work. The NGO used to provide the, um, uh, the looms and the machineries, which are traditional machineries, and it gathered local producers, helping them to commercialize uh, their, their produce. Now, this is an example of a quite developed non-farming enterprise. Uh, the, probably the most likely non-farming enterprise that you're likely to bump into in, uh, in African context is this. So it's a, a market stall where there's a self-employed person that sells um, agricultural produce that has been purchased in a wholesale market or that has been gathered on, a, on an agricultural plot. Now, these are, in most cases, uh, one-man bands, so there's or one-woman bands, more likely actually one-woman bands, uh, as these uh, are firms that are one, led by one person that uh, takes care of uh, buying the input and selling it into the market. Now, we will have a mix of these firms in the sample. Uh, we will see that they employ both household and, and external labor. They include self-employed individuals and only 7% of them is uh, registered in, uh, uh, in uh, I mean, with local authorities or national authorities. Now, as I said, these firms are extremely heterogeneous in terms of sectoral composition. Here we have large groups uh, according to the international standard industrial classification. Uh, as you can see, the big blue chunk in the middle of the bars is um, trade activities. They include both retail and wholesale trade activities. They account for the vast majority of, of these activities, but there's also a large share of firms that are active in the manufacturing sector. The traditional waiver workshop that I showed you a couple of minutes ago would fall under this category, although that's in guinea so not in Nigeria, but just to give you an idea of what a manufacturing firm can look like uh, in, 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 in Western Africa. Now, there are also business services, financial services, although these need to be understood uh, under the lens of uh, informality. So uh, they are classified according to the industrial uh, classification, but they may look very different from what a financial enterprise uh, can look like in the financial sector, in the formal financial sector. Now, how, how do we build our measures? So to start with, we need a measure of digital adoption, which is the measure of the extent to which an household is exposed to uh, mobile internet, and we use two factors. The first is the share of coverage of population with access to mobile internet in the LGA, so in the local government area where the household is set. And this is weighted by the number of uh, smartphones per capita, which comes from uh, the household data, the number of um, yeah, smartphones per capita uh, within the household. So if an household has zero smartphones and lives in an area which is highly covered by mobile internet, in that case, digital adoption will be equal to zero because they don't have the means to access mobile internet. Also, the other way around is true. If a household has uh, lots of smartphones but lives in an area with no mobile internet coverage, then in that case, also the digital adoption will be zero. And then, of course, there's a spectrum uh, that goes from zero to one, depending on how many smartphones the household has per capita and uh, whether they live in an area uh, covered by mobile internet. Now, this is our measure of technological adoption. We will measure the impact of this on structural change, which is measured in three ways. The first is the sales per worker within the informal firm, so within the non-farming enterprise. 
this is the best approximation we can get uh, for, um, for productivity or labor productivity. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have reliable information on costs. There's lots of missing data. So in the interest of having a clean measure, we use uh, sales per worker. Now, the distribution is kind of um, credible in the sense that this is a log normal distribution. We see that over time, the distribution, uh, yeah, the, the center of the distribution shifts to the right, which means that overall sales per worker are increasing. Uh, on average, and that the tails, the right tail especially, is becoming fatter, which means that there are more and more outliers or highly productive firms, while left tails become uh, thinner with respect to uh, to the pre to the previous to the previous years. So this is a trend completely unconditional. We we don't know what what shifts the distribution to the right. Uh, we will try to uh, estimate it in uh, in a few in a few slides. The second measure of structural change is the reallocation of firms across sectors. Uh, as we know, structural change, I mean, the essence of structural change is sectoral reallocation of labor and of entrepreneurial activity. Uh, and one may think that given the very short time period we are observing, we may not be able to grasp any events that somehow pushes firms outside of a sector into another sector. Well, actually the data says something completely different. Uh, what we see here is well, every column in this alluvial plot is uh, the, the shares of um, firms run by households in each sector. So every block in the column is a sector. Now, uh, if, uh, if, yeah, if the block in the next year, if the block branches out into another sector, it means that the household has moved from one sector to the other, either keeping the formal, the previous firm and opening a new one, or closing the old firm and starting a new one. Now there's a lot of mobility. I have highlighted only uh, the mobility that comes from uh, the wholesale and trade sector in, uh, in 2010. I'm sorry, the font is very small, but there was no way for me to fit this figure in a Beamer slide. Um, as you can see, many firms exit. So these are exits, but there are also firms that enter the, into the transport sector, into the business service sector, into the manufacturing sector. And they may stay in the manufacturing sector or re-enter in the trade sector or go into uh, or leave the market entirely. So there's a lot of mobility. Of course, this data is extremely noisy. It's very hard to attribute each and every jump uh, from one sector to another to technological change. There are lots of coping strategies in place and lots of uh, short term business opportunities that may be grasped by local entrepreneurs uh, that may push them to decide to open a firm in a sector or in, in another. However, we do observe this and we will try to elicit the amount of uh, sectoral reallocation of firms that is attributable to, uh, to technological change. Uh, inclusion is, as I mentioned earlier, is, is measured in two ways. The first, oh, sorry, there's another measure of structural change, which is the reallocation of labor outside the household. So if we see that labor tends to uh, leave the non-farming enterprise at the household level and being hired in the market, so outside the household, we will consider that as a measure of positive structural change because we have uh, a shrinkage of the household dimension of production and uh, uh, an enlargement of the market dimension of production. Now, inclusion is measured in terms of the amount of labor uh, needed and hired by non-farming enterprises uh, and, of course, by the working opportunities that are created outside the non-farming enterprise and also in terms of entrepreneurial opportunities. So if digital adoption favors the entry into the market, uh, and if firms tend to stay in the market after adopting the new technology, we will consider that as a, an inclusive market or an inclusive technology because instead of favoring incumbents, it allows also the entry of uh, new firms. We will see that th there are very mixed results in terms of these different variables. Yes. Bernardo, this may be a really dumb question, but don't we also want to know what's going on with farm enterprises? Yes. Like we. We do want we do want to know that uh, the data for non farming for farming enterprises from this data source is very very hard to clean. Uh, I have information about the yields and the produce. Uh, there are conversion factors to estimate the revenues of what has been sold and what has been kept. Uh, but in this case, we are focusing on the non farming uh, sector. Of course, it's relevant to look also at the farming sector. Uh, I, I'm not saying that it's not, and in fact, I actually control. 
uh, in the estimation for the fact that the household owns or not an agricultural plot. And I will mm -hmm. try to see how uh, the fact that the household has an agricultural plot, how it, it interacts with the, the technological adoption. Uh, but it's one paper and I couldn't do really everything, but this is definitely something extremely relevant. And also looking at spillover between agricultural activities and agricultural ones is also a very important axis to, uh, to look at structural change. Fan, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, I was just, uh, I find this digital adoption variable to be very interesting. Just to make sure I understand, suppose the location has extremely low 3G coverage, but I buy a phone for everybody in my household. So you're going to view that as low digital adoption, is that right? Uh, not exactly. I'm going to view that as um, ne a negatively weighted measure of uh, digital adoption because we have, I don't know, this household maybe has one mobile phone per capita and uh, lives in an area where 20% of the population gets coverage of mobile internet. In that case, I weight by that 20% by one because the whole household has mobile phones. If the household has one mobile phone every two people, in that case, the 20% coverage becomes 10% coverage because not every member has access to, uh, to mobile internet. What is most important of this measure is that it allows me to avoid considering uh, as adopters households that have no mobile phones whatsoever and they want to be able to access mobile internet. I don't know if that clarifies your question. I, I think maybe you'll be clear to me once you show the results based on this, but I, but I think I was just thinking, um, you, if I'm in a place with a lot of access and I buy a phone, I mean, it's basically a mobile phone ownership is the adoption decision, right? But the 3G coverage, yes. that's the environmental condition, right? And yes. so you, you're multiplying these together in some way to get, um, I imagine your right-hand side, or is this the left right-hand side yes. variable, right? Yes, so it's yes. a little bit hard for me to like, what is the decision problem behind this, right? There is some decision problem that made me choose to have mobile phone ownership, right? As a function of the 3G coverage in my location. So what does yeah. it say about somebody who chooses to have, you know, mobile phone when the coverage is low versus high, yeah. right? And how should that relate to the endogeneity potential issue that you might have? Yeah. Yeah. But maybe it'll be yeah, clear once you show them. Thanks a lot for that. I, I conceived this uh, waiting procedure mostly as a way to clean the information because I have very aggregated data. Yeah, the data is at the level of the local government area, but mobile internet coverage comes from a much more disaggregated data source, which is uh, a raster map of uh, one kilometer by one kilometer cells, which unfortunately is only accessible under paid subscription. And I, I'm actually trying to get a project funded in order to purchase the disaggregated data and avoid these, uh, yeah, this proxy I'm using for, for digital adoption. Uh, but yeah, you're right, there's a decision problem there. And the decision problem is I may have access to mobile internet, but if my budget constraint is too tight, I may not be, I mean, uh, and my decision is oriented to the short term, I may not be able to invest some money into a smartphone uh, that allows me to get uh, access to the new technology. That's the rationale behind it. Of course, it's imperfect and imprecise. I'm trying to build a, a proxy, but you, you have posed a very reasonable problem here. Thanks. Okay, so uh, this is the, the yeah the the uh, estimation strategy uh, baseline model. I will measure the effect of 3G adoption as I've just described uh, on a number of outcomes that relate either to structural change or inclusion uh, in terms of uh, what I've defined earlier. Uh, this model will have uh, a number of uh, controls, which are either social demographic controls like number of members. Uh, mean age of, uh, of the members, uh, the owners uh, or education, whether the household has or not uh, an agricultural plot, uh, and the gender of the non-farming enterprise owner. This will really will reveal an interesting finding, which is not very encouraging, but uh, which opens for, uh, for further investigation. The second set of uh, control variables has to do with uh, geographical conditions of the household. I, I know how far in terms of miles households are from the capital city, from the closer ma closest market, from the closest road, and the amount of uh, conflict per capita in the area where the household lives. I will use household fixed effects, industry fi fixed effects, and time fixed effects. And of course, we will have a stochastic error term, which we will hope to be uncorrelated with the uh, covariates, however it will be. And that's why we, uh, we adopt an identification strategy, which controls or tries to break the 
highly endogenous relationship that I expect to be in place between technological adoption and structural change and inclusion. Of course, there will be either reverse causality, so it could be that instead of being uh, mobile internet to have an effect on structural change, it's the other way around. So structural changes or higher productivity, productivity growth leading firms, mobile operators to install uh, mobile internet towers in the expectation of higher returns because firms will be working more, it will concentrate the population there and so on and so forth. There will be, of course, measurement errors for the reasons that I've just explained. I'm using a very coarse measure of digital adoption because uh, all I have is the aggregate uh, at the geographical level of mobile internet coverage. I don't have the dichotomous information on whether the cell in which the household lives uh, gets access to mobile internet. So this is a broader measure and can be interpreted somehow as a likelihood for the household to have access to mobile internet. And then, of course, there may be omitted variables. I'm controlling for a battery of fixed effects. I'm using also time varying uh, characteristics of the households. However, <laughs> I mean, we all know that uh, omitted variables are always behind the corner. And uh, I cannot be sure that there's nothing omitted from, from the model. So there's no Z somewhere that is being picked up by the beta of interest. So I'm using two different identification strategies. The first I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation is to uh, estimate the effect of lightning strikes on the diffusion of mobile internet as an instrumental variable. The rationale of this is that whenever a lightning strike hits the ground, there's a strong electrostatic charge, which makes very costly to manage mobile internet towers. Now, lightning strikes are not a huge problem, not even in low and middle income countries. Lightning rods, in most cases, do the trick in the sense that they attract the lightning strike and they discharge uh, uh, the electricity on the ground, and that doesn't have a strong effect on uh, electricity access or quality. Uh, it does have an effect on devices which use electromagnetic uh, waves in order to propagate the signal. So there are, of course, solutions to this. Uh, mobile phone operators can equip the cell towers with the right uh, devices and equipments that uh, reduce the effect of uh, tension instability in general, not necessarily from lightning strikes. Uh, however, that's, that represents a, an additional cost for the mobile phone operator. So we imagine or we model the decision of the mobile phone operator as a trade-off. They decide whether to install a mobile phone tower, considering the potential benefits, therefore the market they can, they can cater to, and the costs, which are uh, related. They are mostly fixed, uh, apart from the costs that have to do with the uh, external events like electrostatic discharges. Now, this instrument has been used by Anderson uh, in a similar effort, but based on the US. Uh, Gurev, uh, Manacord, and Tese, I mean, uh, there has been papers popping up uh, in the American Economic Review, uh, but concerning most the effect of access to mobile internet on access to information and therefore trusting government and so on and so forth. It's not exactly the same, but uh, this has, how it, this instrument has been used in the past. Now, what is extremely striking to me is the strong correlation between lightning strikes per capita and the, our measure of digital inclusion. As you can see, oops, it went black. Can you still see my screen? Yes, um, uh, Bernardo, uh, so yes. you might want to finish between five to 10 minutes so that there's time for discussion. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, but my screen went black. So oh, I will, really? Uh, no, we can see your screen. Yes, but I can't. <laughs> oh dear. Do you want to share it again? Uh, yes, but it's all black. So if you do I... stop share and then share again, maybe it will work. Yes, but I can't see the screen right now. Like oh, you it's... mean you cannot even stop share? No, I can't. Um... Um... I can stop share for you. Maybe that will help. Could you please, maybe ah, okay. something will happen? Maybe it was just frozen, yeah. And if you try again now? Still all black. <laughs> we can still see um, you if it's sorry. the camera from your... Yes, but I, I really can't figure this out now. Okay, let mm. me... Let, let me... Let me see. I'm sorry, this is very weird.
uh, I, I'm afraid I can't go on because this is, uh, I have to probably to restart my computer or something like that. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll try to shut it down. I mean, to, to sleep it and unfreeze it and see if something happens. I apologize. Do you think, I don't know whether it's faster. If you email to me, I can share it. Would it be faster? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yes. do you have my email? Uh, I, I may have it. I, let me just send it on the chat. Yes, please. I'm really sorry for this. Never happened. No, 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 that's okay. So if you email me, then I can share it. Okay, thanks. Let's hope the email come quickly. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, because the, now the pro I have double screen, which I've tried okay. to unplug and nothing changed. Okay, but have you emailed me? Yeah, but uh, again, the problem is that I can't see the main screen and oh, I can't okay. review the presentation. So, so you, <coughs> you really have to restart your computer. <laughs> yes, I do have. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. I'm Maybe. sorry. Apologize. Yeah, why don't you restart and then we will just talk about your face. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Sorry for that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, it, yeah. So that's a bit of technological uh, <laughs> um, regress, I guess. Yeah, maybe um, next time we should ask speakers to send us their slides. Uh, then... Yeah, that could be a useful thing to have uh, <laughs> for Kirsty. Absolutely. Um, I I actually so all, all the comments I have are really questions, and I don't think we should um, uh, get get talk about behind to, to answer <laughs> things on the fly. I, I can still yeah. hear you because I have a double. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd be happy. Yeah, okay, it's working again. Do, okay, rather, great. rather do the email first. Yeah. Yeah, great, great, yes. great, great. So, are you emailing to me or are you? I am, doing... I am. Yeah, oh, I'm you are, to... okay. But uh, I haven't got it yet, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've just uh, switched it on. Okay. okay. Well, if you already restart, maybe you can start to share again. Maybe it will yes. Work. Yeah. yes, yes, yes. Okay. Let me rejoin the meeting and okay. I'm back to you. I'll be a lightning bolt presenting the results. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the shock. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. I don't know if you're able to answer questions while your computer starts. What I am curious about is in the map that you showed, there seems to be zero, a lot of zero area still. Did I read the chart correctly? Yes. So no. So So in your data, do you see people um, having cell phones in areas that's not supposed to have cell phone access. I'm just curious um, whether that's the whether that. I happens. do, yes, I do see people who have cell phones uh, in areas where they're not supposed to. Um, but again, that doesn't influence the results because those are uh, neg negatively weighted. So I mean, they weight, they're weighted but, but, by zero. Those cell phones. Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder. If, is, so suppose nobody else around me has this, has cell phone, right? But I have cell phone. Maybe that's you know. Good for business, right? Because I can call up the suppliers. Even if cell phone connection is terrible, right? But I'm the only person with that terrible connection. Maybe there's some benefit to that. Yeah, yeah, there are, there are. There's actually a large literature on this, and and the real breakthrough effect of mobile phones, where there was the possibility of sending messages, making phone calls, and that explains, for instance, the take up of uh, mobile money technologies, which pre-exist mobile internet. So M-Pesa in in Kenya and in Eastern Africa overall was very useful for people to uh, move money without having a bank account and without having internet connection. So that's definitely, there's definitely an effect there. And in fact, in the regression, I'm controlling for the presence of 2G technologies to clean out uh, for the, the effect of the presence of uh, the previous technology, so somehow to control for previous uh, conditions. Uh, Okay, so that was the, um, the the instrumental variable strategy. There's another identification strategy, which is uh, an event study, so uh, a difference in difference estimation with staggered uh, rollout of the treatment. 
I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, I can answer questions later, if any. Uh, I'll focus on the results. So what do I see uh, from the estimation? I see that there is a positive correlation between digital adoption and say, the measure of sales per worker, which is our uh, very coarse and approximate measure of labor productivity at the level of the firm. What is interesting is that the, the slope of the correlation coefficient increases uh, after th three years. So in 2012, we have a mild correlation, then the correlation becomes sharper in the next time period, which is uh, reasonable in the presence of a, a, a technology that uh, relies on network effects in order to diffuse. So the more people access the technology, the higher the, the business opportunities and therefore the, uh, the higher the performance of the firm in this case. Now, in terms of the estimation, again, I, I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, I, I've tried to convince you that the instrument works. The, the tests I've run uh, for uh, the instrument are quite um, yeah, reassuring in this sense because we have an exclusion restriction of the instrument, which is taken in its base form and its square, given the hyperbolic relationship between uh, the instrument and the instrumented variable. Uh, if we exclude the two instruments, we have a, a, an F stat of 27, which is way higher than the stock and yogurt criterion that says that the F stat should be uh, higher than 10. We have also uh, a very a non significant Sargon test, which is in favor of the, uh, the validity of the instruments. Um, and then, well, a very strong uh, fit in the first stage of the regression. Uh, almost 70% of the variation in digital inclusion is explained by. Uh, lightning strikes per capita and the battery of covariates, which I use also in the second stage. So uh, again, a very strong uh, fit for a microeconomic model. This is not uh, frequent. Of course, there are also fixed effects. So there's uh, lots of things uh, that are absorbing the variation. Now, the effect of mobile internet is strong and positive on, um, uh, on the measurement of sales per worker. The coefficient I was referring to earlier is this negative coefficient on uh, the female ownership of uh, informal firms. It's negative everywhere in all specification under all circumstances. This is uh, probably an indication that the, the social allocation of labor in Nigeria follows a very strong uh, gender access. And this creates, of course, a very interesting opportunity to, to understand better this process, uh, in which I hope to do in another paper. Now, what drives the growth in productivity? Well, first of all, we have um, an increase in sales and a reduction in labor uh, as, a, as a result of adopting uh, mobile internet technologies. What is interesting that is that we explore a, num a number of other mechanisms, like the effect of access to internet on access to credit, on the uh, capital, on the capital per worker, costs, cost per worker. None of this is significant. The effect that links mobile internet adoption to the performance of firms really goes through these two mechanisms. One is uh, higher sales, the other is lower labor, which drives sales per worker uh, to the top. Now, which kind of labor is affected here? This could be a, a hint that the, the process of structural change induced by mobile internet adoption has a negative effect on, in, on inclusion. Well, we will try to see these more in detail by looking at, uh, so we divide labor in household labor, so labor that works in the non-farming enterprise that is also an household member, and then labor that comes from outside the household. Now, what is interesting is that the household labor reduces a lot as, an, as a result of adopting mobile internet, while non-household labor increases. Now, the story behind this is, of course, the, I mean, the empirical fact is overall that with structural change, we see a reallocation of labor or uh, some sort of uh, marketization of production with respect to uh, the focus on, on the household uh, when, when structural change is at its early stages. Uh, but another possible explanation is that once the technology is adopted, uh, em em entrepreneurs will need laborers with the skills to master the new technology. And therefore, they may not be able to find those skills within the household. They need to resort to the market or to the network of uh, uh, the extended household. Now, what happens in terms of employability of those people who are somehow pushed away by the non-farming enterprise after uh, adopting uh, the technology? Well, what is interesting here is that we see that overall employment across all households, whether they own or not a, a, a non-farming enterprise, the effect of mobile internet adoption is still positive in terms of employability. So these are the share of household members in working age that are occupied in, in employment. 
Now, there's a positive effect for all households. If we only consider households with non-farming enterprises, we see that the effect is non-statistically significant, which means that most of the households that already own a non-farming enterprise are already in full employment because most of them, they also have an agricultural plot. So the household members are already uh, working. Now, if these household members are pushed away from the non-farming enterprise and then reabsorbed into the market, this is a positive effect of structural change, although we do know nothing about wages, quality of jobs, security, and a number of other things, which would be interesting to, to explore more in detail the measurement of uh, inclusion. Now, to conclude, uh, what we see, I didn't show a set of results re with respect to sectors, uh, but I will give you a glimpse on this. Uh, the, the effect of mobile internet is to disencourage firms from entering the manufacturing sector, so they tend to stay in uh, service sectors, either trade, sec trade and wholesale or um, financial insurance and real estate services. And if we re-estimate the same model, uh, splitting the sample into sectors, we see that there's much more strong significance in the uh, trade sector as compared to the other sector. So the benefits of mobile internet adoption are much more likely to be reaped by firms that are active in, uh, in trade services. The story here is therefore a very mixed one. We have uh, in general an effect uh, of mobile internet that drives uh, entrepreneurial activity into tertiary activities, which are however benefiting from uh, technological change and increasing in productivity, but we are also moving away from manufacturing and this is a fact for structural change which is of interest because we, these households and these workers may not be developing the capabilities that are required by an emerging buoyant manufacturing sector uh, if industrial policy of Nigeria will go in that direction. We see a, an overall effect uh, on employment which is positive, this is consistent with the literature, however we don't see a positive effect on the entry of firms. So only the incumbents may be, uh, uh, ad, I mean, they may be in, in a position of advantage to exploit the new technology. And therefore we have mixed evidence in terms of inclusion, more workers, so more job opportunities, but fewer uh, entrepreneurial opportunities. So of course there's a, a balance to, to strike there. I'm done, I'm sorry if I've run over time and apologies for uh, the technological uh, <laughs> problem, thanks. Thank you. Um, we, we still have about six minutes for discussion. So if there's any question from the floor, please uh, just uh, go ahead. So I'm, I'm wondering about the, your bullet point here on overall employment growth. I thought you said that they're shedding labor, like there's more sales, but less labor. Yes, that's exactly the case. Uh, I'm, I've, shown other results where I show in general the average of employed members within households, uh, with, whether they are employed in the non-farming enterprise or not. In that case, we don't really care. What we see is how, I mean, yeah, how many household members are working overall as a result of uh, digital adoption. And the table is here. So uh, yes, in, well, this is a model, cool. which, sorry, which I, I, I've rushed through and uh, I'm oh, sure okay. I've, I haven't been Clear. So this is the employment share within the household as a dependent variable. Uh, we split the sample. So we only consider, for instance, here, these first two columns, I'm considering uh, the employed household members outside the household. So how many people are working in the market, not in the non-farming enterprise? And we see that whether the household has or doesn't have first and second column, a non-farming enterprise, the effect of 3G adoption puts uh, household members in the position of being more employable and therefore they find a job outside the household. Now, if we consider overall employment, so columns three and four, which includes employment of the household members within the household and outside the household, I see a positive effect if I consider all households, but not st statistically significant effect if I consider only households that own a non-farming enterprise. And the reason of that is that non-farming enterprise owning households are already saturated in terms of employment. So most of these uh, household members already work either in the agricultural plot or in the non-farming enterprise. And maybe related to that, um, is it correct to, so suppose that, you know, the, the internet next, the next village is so much better. So I move my, the, the best performing firms are all moving over for communication purposes. 
Um, is it is it the case that some of the effects that we're getting here could be due to that difference? So in, in terms of thinking about the average changes, right? Could it be just firms changing location partly driving the re results? Um, it could be in the sense that yeah. I suspect, sorry, I, I jumped in. I, I suspected the same. Uh, however, I have the lack of tracing, of being able to trace the household over the three time period. So I have the geolocation of the household over the three time periods and I have excluded the households that change location over time, but it's only a few actually. It's very few households. So uh, most of these households that have relocated have been lost by uh, the enumerators. So we have, uh, I mean, no, it's not large, but there is an attrition rate across the three, uh, the three waves of the panel. So we start with 5,000 households. They, they lose 150 in the first time. And then in second uh, wave, they lose another 100. So they are lost. Those that have been uh, traced over time have a different geolocation. So I've excluded those households. Also because they were treated as single tones by, by the panel model because of the way I estimated it. So they were dropped automatically. I, I see, but I think even in that case, if we're thinking about average change, because these identifications, given your fixed effect, are identified by variations, right? Differences, if I yes. understand correctly, right? So you could still, um, yeah, so maybe customers, right? Uh, maybe you know, your business is not changing, but customers are buying more from places where, you know, the business has a cell phone so they can contact them more easily, right? So, yes. so there could be businesses moving around. So it's not an absolute change, you know, increase. If we see a positive coefficient, could be just the, the gap oh, yes. getting wider potentially, right? Between I the see. halves and the halves not, right? So you know, inequality change. But maybe you can see, see some of that by looking at the levels in some way. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, exactly. We don't know if it's a more of the same uh, kind of reasoning uh, or kind of effect or uh, more new stuff that is driving productivity growth. And I, I completely agree. I, I can't really disentangle this. Uh, it's an aggregation. It's a local average treatment effect that I'm, and, that I'm measuring. But that would be really interesting. What I've, I've tried to see if uh, there's entry of new firms encouraged by uh, the adoption of mobile internet uh, the results are actually not statistically significant. So uh, this is the effect on firm entry and the results are non-statistically significant. So I'm prone to think that what I'm seeing is a more of the same kind of thing where you have, uh, especially informal firms in the trade sector, being able to reach a wider market using uh, mobile internet technologies. But this is a mechanism that I would really like to, uh, to explore much more into depth and it may require uh, qualitative approaches, uh, interviewing firms, understanding how their market has been changing, and so on and so forth. Now, there's a, a, some evidence countering what I've just said, which is the, um, the event study approach shows that what I see as non-significant in the uh, instrumental variable estimation could be uh, an averaging out of these effects. So in the first time period after treatment, we see a decrease in the number of non-farming enterprises owned by by households, so on whether the, the, the household owns a non-farm enterprise or not. But then after two time periods and three time periods, we see that there is a positive effect, although it's only slightly significant, as you can see the wings of the coefficient touch uh, the zero line, this is significance at the 10% level. So we have, sorry, at the 5% level, which means that at the 10% level, this is not, this is significant only at the 10% level. Uh, I mean, it's weak evidence. Uh, the data is extremely noisy. And as I showed with the alluvial plot, households are moving from, across sectors. They leave the market, they re-enter the market. It's very hard to really capture the dynamics of entry and exit here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it could be that there's uh, some sort of a buffer time between technological adoption and actual entry. And in that case, fun, the, the mechanism you were suggesting would be in place because we would have new firms entering and then using the new technology to start new type of activities that didn't exist before. And that would be a very quintessential uh, stylized fact between uh, behind technology, behind structural change. So new sectors, new types of activities, new products being sold, uh, new processes being in place and so on and so forth. But thanks, that's an interesting comment. Okay, um, so uh, time is now for Alessio. Thank you, Bernardo. Um, so Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for so, your patience. Uh, let's now go to the second paper of Alexia. Yep. Uh, should I share? Okay. 
I'm sorry. Okay. Can you hear me well, Rachel? Okay. It's good, it's good. Okay. So uh, thanks a lot for having the paper on the program. Um, it's great to be here. And um, this is a joint work with uh, two PhD students at the University of Cagliari, Fenicia and Silvio. And Javi, who is going to answer your questions in the chat, is a, a postdoc uh, also at the University of Cagliari. So uh, in this paper, we want to, to address uh, what I think is the fundamental question in, uh, in, in our literature, which is uh, why agents consume more services uh, <clears throat> relative to goods as their income grows. So does uh, uh, now large literature on structural transformation that uh, addresses this issue and uh, uh, provides mechanisms uh, explaining why uh, why this happens uh, both uh, over time as, as the economy gets richer and also in the cross section. So what we want to do here is, uh, is to try to propose a new theory uh, to explain the phenomenon. Um, and we do it by linking the allocation of time of a representative household uh, to uh, consumption consumption patterns in, in a way that uh, uh, we believe it's, uh, it's new. So the starting point uh, is uh, uh, that we take uh, is, uh, is two well-known uh, facts on uh, structural change in the, in the US economy. So the, the first fact is that uh, uh, both market and homework uh, decrease over time uh, while leisure increases for the representative um, uh, household between uh, 1965 and 2003, which is a reference period. Uh, and the second fact is that uh, consumption expenditure shifts from, uh, uh, from goods and into services, which is what we uh, typically refer to as a, a struggle transformation. So what we try to do here is to uh, provide a new link between these, uh, these two observations. Of course, uh, those of you working in theoretical model of struggle transformation, know that these, these observations are, all, are um, often taken as the basis of, uh, of our model. So to go directly to, to the idea, what we have in mind. Um, so we think that, uh, uh, we think here that uh, uh, what, what you purchase in the market as goods and services do not uh, directly provide utility. Instead, uh, these uh, uh, bundles are uh, um, combined with time uh, through what you can call home production activities. So you buy some services uh, and you use some of your time to provide uh, what we call in the paper uh, final needs. And these final needs are what uh, uh, indeed provide, uh, provide utility to the consumer. So um, what's happening here that uh, uh, it is that the, the household will have to optimally choose the allocation of, uh, of time across activities. And so one of the novelties of the framework is that uh, uh, there is not only one home production activity, but there are two, one using goods and time and the other using uh, services and time. So over time, typically, the wage, the average wage in the economy increases and, uh, and time becomes more expensive for, for the consumer. So the extent to which uh, um, services and goods are demanded depend on the use of time, the change in the use of time that this household will make uh, um, optimally to, or to satisfy her needs. Um, I will be more specific when I show you the model, which you'll see is, uh, is very simple, but let me give you um, uh, a preview of what are the new mechanisms that can emerge in this setting uh, compared to uh, a standard structural change uh, model or let's say typical structural change models that we, uh, that we know from the literature. So one thing is that all production activities, uh, the one employing goods and the one employing services uh, they might display a different degree of substitutability with time. Uh, and this in the, in the model will uh, 
uh, generate what we call uh, endogenous normotheticity. So I, I will be more specific uh, about this in a, in a couple of slides. But this is one mechanism through which the model can generate uh, structural transformation. The other mechanism that uh, is uh, uh, embodied in this, in this framework is that uh, uh, the two home production activities might display a different pace of what we call time-saving technological change. Uh, so what we have in mind here, let me give you uh, an example. So imagine that the, the need you, you want to satisfy is to eat a burger, okay? So um, one choice that you have to satisfy this need is to go to McDonald's or similar restaurants, purchase your, your burger and eat it and satisfy your need. So let's think what you had to do in the 50s to, to, to do this, to satisfy the need in this way. So you had to physically reach out the, the McDonald's, enter, buy your burger, consume it, and, uh, and back home. Then in the 70s, some innovations were uh, introduced, and the uh, first drive through was, was um, put into place, and uh, this reduced the time that you needed to get the burger and satisfy the same need. Then in the 90s, the, the delivery service was, was created and you could call to, to get your burger at home. And in the 2000s, this uh, technology was improved with uh, uh, apps like uh, Uber Eats, Deliveroo, and, and, and Just Eat. So with just a few seconds, you could uh, um, get your burger. So if you think about it, all these, um, uh, all these innovations are just uh, different ways of satisfying the same need. Uh, but uh, what you are doing here is to spend less time to satisfy the need and probably paying more, purchasing more services to satisfy the same need. Okay. Um, so instead, if you think at the, the other option that you have to satisfy your need of a burger, is to cook it at home. So you can go to the supermarket, uh, do your shopping, go back home, uh, get your barbecue, cook your burger, eat your burger. And uh, if you think about this way of getting a burger, the, the amount of time that you needed in the 50s is not so different from the amount of time that you need today. So these two, this, this need of a burger uh, satisfied in the two ways is the two needs that we think enter the utility function and then you can pick to, 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 to obtain utility. And in one way, we think that there is uh, a lot of technological change that allows you to, to save time. So um, producing activities with services while there is uh, much less uh, technological change in the activity that uses time and goods. And so this is the other channel that we embed in the model and that can um, generate structural change. Why do I say this? Well, um, uh, okay, let me jump to this slide. So some of you might wonder, why do we need another theory of structural change? We have many and many of them, they work well. Um, so, what uh, we thought here when starting this project is, is the following. So in the data, we know that uh, both the relative quantity and the relative price of services increase. So in general, the literature suggests that a non-homothetic component in preferences is, uh, uh, is needed if you want to account for, for both uh, uh, quantity of price evolving over time. Um, in my experience, uh, most of the time, this non-homothetic component is not micro-founded. So there is not an explicit explanation for it. Uh, sometimes uh, the, 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 the interpretation is true, is given as being home production. So like a, a reduced form of home production generates this non-homothetic component in preferences. Uh, however, here in previous work that I have with uh, um, Solomas and Satoshi, we embed an explicit uh, um, home production sector in, uh, uh, into an otherwise standard structural change model. We estimate it for the US. And what we find is that even if you have the explicit home production sector, uh, you still need uh, non-homotetic components to, to fit the structural change in the US. 
So what we thought is that a bit more specific theory of home production was needed to, to microfound the, no, the non-homotetic component. And uh, as I'll show you here, um, we'll gener we will generate with our theory, structural transformation fitting both the relative quantity and the relative price of services with homotetic preferences. So the, the non-homoteticity as I anticipated briefly before will be um, an endogenous outcome of the equilibrium of the model. So um, the roadmap uh, um, is the following. Uh, at the theoretical level, we introduce time allocation explicitly into a, a simple structural transformation model. And on the data side, we um, categorize home production activities um, uh, in time use uh, into those that uh, um, use time with goods and activity that use services uh, with goods. And then we will think of these as uh, um, production activities uh, within the household. Then the exercise will be to, to calibrate the model for the US using uh, time series data and see how well uh, this can account for, for, for structural change. Um, with the model, we can run some counterfactuals to see uh, how important is the role of technology within the home production activities. Uh, so in particular, the differential technological change between um, the uh, home activity using goods and the home activity uh, using services, which is one of the main driver of structural transformation, as I said in, a, uh, in one of the previous slides. Uh, and finally, once the model is, is calibrated to aggregate data, uh, we will assess the properties uh, under constant relative price. So for, uh, for the uh, for cross-sectional data. Um, more broadly here, I'd say that uh, uh, with this exercise, we will study um, how much non homoteticity so how much income effects the model generates uh, when it is estimates, uh, estimated to, uh, to aggregate data. And I'll show you that the model generates uh, a substantial amount of, uh, of, uh, of non homoteticity um, so at this stage, I think um, I should discuss the, the, the related literature. So uh, with this bullet point, I, I want to recall the, the, the large literature on structural transformation and in particular models with home production. I, I, I don't put references here, but uh, I'm sure most of you uh, know which papers I'm, I'm referring. Uh, Rachel, Joe, uh, many others have papers. Uh, explaining structural transformation and explaining it through, uh, through own production. But what I want to discuss here is two very recent papers that I think are mostly related to this one. The first one is uh, uh, this by Fang, Anush, and Silos, Luxuries, Necessities, and the Allocation of Time. So what they do is um, to, to match data on, on consumption expenditure, um, from the CX and, and time use to construct a pseudo panel. Um, and what they do is, is, to, is to estimate a model in which the idea is uh, uh, similar to ours, so that there are two activities in their model. Uh, one is home production, which is very similar to the idea we, we have here, and the other activity is leisure. And uh, each of these activities is, is produced by using uh, goods uh, uh, and services purchased in the market and, uh, and time. Um, however, different from what they do, uh, we, we study here the implications of uh, um, such a setting. It's not exactly the same, but a similar setting for, for structural transformation. Um, the second paper is, is this one by Bednar and Pretner. Uh, titled Structural Change Under Home Production with Time to Consume. And here, uh, again, the, the, the setting is very similar to what we have. And the idea is also to, to study structural transformation in this case, um, when uh, uh, purchases of goods and services in the market are combined uh, with time. However, the, um, the interpretation of the model is substantially different. Um, I will be 
a bit more specific in a second, but uh, um, our idea is that uh, final needs entering the, the utility function are substitutes. So think back uh, of the idea uh, of the example I gave you uh, about the, um, the burger. So you can satisfy the need with services or with goods, but the need is similar. The burger is not the same, so the need is not exactly satisfied in the same way, but the two needs are, are similar. While, while they, they give a different interpretation of the model, and so the, uh, the needs and the, the utility function, they also use a different name for them, but they are complements. And uh, the, the assumption on the complementarity or substitutability gives completely different predictions um, of the theory. And so the, the two models, while the, the math if you, if you check the two, is, is very similar, uh, have completely different um, interpretations. Ale Alessio, yeah. can, I, can I just clarify one thing? You yeah. know, the, the example you gave um, is yeah. very intuitive. It's quite, you know, going back to Becker's uh, mm -hmm. paper about, you know, all times needed for consumption. But if I think about a chunk of home production, say childcare, how will you think of childcare in that kind of setting? So the time I spend to purchase, you know, daycare center service, that certainly is not going to be much there. But uh, the real substitutability with childcare is that I have to do the childcare myself. So yeah, so how, how, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I was going to be more specific in a in a couple of slides, but uh, uh, we we have a definition of own production with goods and uh, we have some sensitivity uh, including uh, childcare and other care or not. Because of course, I mean, we are aware about the, the debate on what child childcare here is. So we try to, to, to build some sensitivity on that. So uh, we are a bit agnostic of, of whether childcare is, uh, uh, should or should not be included in uh, uh, home production with goods. Uh, you could also include it in, in, in leisure, depending on how you think about that. And my question is not about whether childcare is leisure or home production. It's more in terms of the theory that the, theory, the consumption of the whatever needed the home production time in it. So, so when I um, purchase childcare service, yeah, you know, the, it's not really, you know, what is the time that is associated with purchasing childcare services versus I do the childcare myself? So, so that, that is the part I'm trying to understand. Um, so in principle, the, so you can think of, of the example of the burger to, you can apply it to, to most services that you can purchase in the market so childcare, for instance if you think of it as a as a i mean we don't include it in on production with services but think that you are doing that you could purchase some services some childcare, and put some time uh, of your own to produce what's the final activity of, of child care in in your family so part is purchased in the market part is is uh, is put by you as your own time and here, there is large substitutability between what you can put as an input that you are purchasing in the market or the time that you, that you are putting in. The two things are very substitutable. So you can think that both are input in your production function and you can adjust quite easily the two in the production of the final activity, which, which is childcare, which is what is giving you utility. I don't know if, you, if I answered your question. Hey, why don't you go on? Maybe we can talk more. <laughs> okay. Um, of course, I mean, uh, something that I guess relates to this, to this question is that, of course, the, the burger example is very easy and specific. But if you think about many uh, services uh, and goods, it's not so easy to categorize them into um, home production activity. For instance, if you or by insurance, which is a service, it's not really straightforward to think that, uh, uh, I mean, you produce insurance by purchasing services and, and your own time, of course. So if we go specific into examples, it's not, yeah, maybe the example is not 
uh, is not the um, is not always straightforward. But uh, so um, the idea here that I'd like you to to keep in mind is that uh, the general idea here of the of the mechanism is that over time you purchase more services because uh, they allow you to save more time and your time is more valuable as you get richer, your wage increases, uh, your economy gets richer. And so services allow you to save more time compared to doing stuff, doing home production by yourself at home with goods. So this is, this is the, the general idea. Then the specific examples might uh, apply more or less uh, uh, appropriately to, to, this, to this idea. So the framework um, getting to it uh, is, uh, uh, is, is really simple. It's nothing fancy. What we have is a utility function in uh, consumption and leisure. And consumption is a, a CS aggregator of two, uh, you can call them activities or needs, uh, CG and CS. And uh, these are produced through home production activities by the household. So CS uh, is a CES production function in time of the household, services purchased in the market, there is some sustainability, and there is some technological change that can happen over time. And uh, the home activity using goods is symmetric, uh, but of course, parameters uh, might be different in the weight, in the elasticity and in the pace of uh, technological change over time. The um, budget constraint of the consumer is uh, what uh, uh, she purchases in the market in terms of services and goods. Uh, it must be equal to the uh, wage uh, per unit of time multiplied by the amount of time she works in the market. And there is the time constraint summing amount of work in the market, amount of work in the own production with services, with the own production with goods and leisure. It must sum to one. Okay. Um, and of course there are, oh, okay, before jumping to the, um, to the sectors, uh, let me highlight here that there are three key elasticities. One is the elasticity between uh, the final needs. CG and CS, which is governed by Rho. Uh, and the other two elasticities, of course, are the elasticity of substitution between time and services in one own production function and time and goods in the, in the second one. So according to our interpretation of the theory, um, these restrictions apply. So final needs are satisfying uh, similar, uh, similar needs and so we interpret them as a highly substitutable. So elasticity is larger than one. Um, <clears throat> the elasticity of substitution between time and goods in the home production function with goods is uh, uh, smaller than one. Go back to the example of, of, the, of the burger. You cannot really substitute your own time with, uh, uh, with the goods you, you, you purchase in the market. And, that uh, that way of cooking the burger at home is, is very similar in terms of inputs of time and goods uh, today as it was in the 50s. Um, so, while for sorry, so Alessio. I, I, yep. It's also not clear. Once you interpret that CS and CG as the yep. final output entered into utility, yep. it's not even clear what is G and what is S. See, in the burger example, you know, Burger has the, you know, from the meat industry, from the retail industry. Yep. So what is it? Is it G or is it S in your setting? There are the two ways of satisfying it. If you go to McDonald's, you're, you're buying the services. The service. But, but, the, but the CS then in your setting will include also what McDonald's purchased in the input-output linkage. So that no, will have uh, the non-service component. Well, well, okay. So, uh, yeah, it, um, here the the um, the mapping to the data is that we are using value added. So we split the economy into goods, let's say manufacturing and services, and this is the 
output that you purchase in the market and you put into your home production. So if you think of the burger purchased from McDonald's, that is entering the sector restaurants and hotels usually. So it's an output from there. And so it's a service, it's not a good. Although in the example, I know that you are obtaining a burger, which is what you, uh, in the, you are consuming. But so here is the labeling of the sector that matters for what enters in one type of production uh, or the other. So the mapping will be uh, service sectors output is what the consumer purchases and it's QS in our model. And what is produced in the rest of the economy is the good sector and it was the, in, it is what so the consumer- So what would be the example of goods in your setting? Uh, you go to the supermarket uh, and buy uh, raw meat and uh, you go home, produce but, your burger but the and- purchase put it in the from the supermarket well, will be value well, added of the retailing. Well, That's where yeah. I got very confused. Yeah, okay. You can think of um, the barbecue. So the, I mean- if you don't want to think that is a durable good, because here we don't have durables and durables, but the barbecue is the good that you need to produce your, your burger that you're you putting see, in, into this product. It's very difficult once you think of it as consuming. Like if I buy a car, mm -hmm. the time I spend to buy a car, what, what do you think of it as? LG or L? Okay, so... Uh, I'll, I'll show you in the, in the classification of time use that the, basically the uh, time use category that enters the home production with services is basically the category that uh, is uh, searching for goods and services. So the time use to search in the market or to go purchasing goods and services. This is, of course, not optimal because we would like to split that category into time spent acquiring services, which should be the only time category entering the uh, debt home production um, uh, function, but we cannot do that before 2003. So what, what we are currently doing is to look after 2003 where the two categories can, can be split. But we, we consider that as a proxy of the time spent to uh, do home production with services. Basically, you, you need very little time, which is the time of searching the service, and then you obtain it. While for goods, uh, the time is much larger because it's really time that you spend doing things with good at home. And so in the example of the, of the burger, uh, most of the time that you spend there is the time to operate the barbecue. And the goods that you put in is the barbecue. So you can think of your renting some goods from yourself uh, to to cook the uh, to cook the burger, which is the goods you're you're using. I mean, I agree with you that it is not straightforward the classification, and so there are, there are many examples that come to mind that is not super clear on how to to classify. So we did we think we did our best to to do. The classification, but still, uh, I mean, uh, critic can apply on uh, on this. Um, I, mean, I would I would say that the the one there are two time there are two household production time use categories that go down a lot, um, and that is one is cooking and one is housework. And the housework one is mostly due to uh, appliances. And so the, the one case that you really have to get right is the cooking. And the advantage of the cooking one is that grocery is, is a shopping that grocery shopping is the one that's broken out um, for longer periods of time in the shopping. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I, I mean, I think you're good. There's a whole bunch of sort of minor categories that are not really gonna matter that are kind of weird conceptually. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about, um, you know, a lot of the, some of the finance things, which are, you know, the, the value of your pen, pension holdings and things which are mm -hmm. done 
by yeah. somebody else on your behalf, like there's no time element to it. It's, I mean, you're, you're going to tie yourself up in knots on that. Um, the thing you got to get right is growth is food product, uh, is food in the household. Uh, you, you mean is, is the most important activity, Ben? That's where all the changes come from. From cooking, you mean? Now, if you're comparing 1965 to 2003, yeah. where are all the changes coming? It's on the food set. That's where household production is uh, going to matter a well, lot. Well, housekeeping, cleaning your house. Right, um, but I, that's not really it. That's, I mean, I guess, yeah, those are the two. Um, I mean, your framework's not going to work well for the house cleaning because you don't have durable goods. But um, I guess you could implicitly create a um, well services of the durables or whatever. So in a sense, something that we talked about this mechanism is also related to a lot of home appliances that, I mean, we, we, we used to buy or we used to buy more before. And, and then the time that you really operate them is, uh, was more before and, it, and it's tiny now. And this relates, I mean, cooking is the right example. You, you buy a fancy kitchen because you want to spend a lot of time cooking and then over time, you cook less and less, and I mean, this is a lot of goods that uh, that you that you bought, and uh, uh, over time, I mean, new let's say new families don't buy such big and fancy kitchens because they know that they are not going to spend much time uh, uh, cooking, and this is one of the the channels. That is not that true in the U.S. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> okay, U.S. kitchens I, have gotten I, enormous. <laughs> okay, okay, so. Not a good example, but um, I think in Europe uh, uh, it's, it's it's sort of true. Uh, also, uh, houses size uh, has been reduced, but I mean, I'm uh, I'm going out of a bit out of um, topic here. Um, so, as I was saying, uh, the elasticities are that, that we expect or that we build the theory on are highly substitutable for final needs, um, low substitution for time and goods, and uh, high substitution for time and services. So um, the, the margin of, 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 of services, uh, you, you can adjust it much easily with your time. So buy more services and uh, reduce your time and vice versa than, than with goods. So there are two, two sectors uh, in which there is a, a price taking uh, there are two sectors in which there is a uh, price taking firm uh, in each, and the equilibrium is uh, uh, super simple: a set of prices, a set, uh, an allocation for for the household uh, about time and the amount of goods and services purchased in the market, and labor uh, in uh, in the two sectors, such that the, the three markets uh, for labor and for goods and services clear. Um, so the calibration strategy is to uh, use moments from the US economy. There's a bunch of them from the economy in 1965 and a set of moments that uh, 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 represent changes between uh, 1965 and, and 2003. Uh, so for a time allocation, we use market work, home production with goods and home production with services in 1965 and the change uh, over time. Then we, we take the ratio of expenditure and services to goods in 65 and the change, uh, the size of the service sector in terms of hours in the initial year and uh, the change over time, and the change in the real quantities of, of goods and services uh, over time, uh, and we estimate everything uh, jointly. So uh, for the data on, on time use, we use the 65, 66 American use of time in 2003, uh, 80 US um, sample selection and weights uh, are from Aguirre Hearst, so there's nothing fancy here that uh, that we do. And the classification of activities, as I was um, saying before to Rachel, is between uh, market work, which in which we put uh, uh, basically core work and uh, work related activities. Uh, on production with goods, it was, I mean, was what Ben was suggesting is mainly cooking, cleaning, or maintenance. 
And all production with services is, uh, uh, as I was saying before, mainly obtaining goods and services uh, from the market. And then there is essentials, 70 hours per week, and, and the rest is leisure. Uh, can, can you please go back, just clarify. So in this example, so you will be saying that suppose I, I do both cooking and I also go to restaurant, okay? So mm -hmm. the time I spend cooking will be in my uh, HG and the yeah. CG there. Yeah. But yeah. the time I spend going to the restaurant will be in my uh, HS and CS. Yes. Is that the reason why you find CG and CS with an elasticity bigger than one? Because they could be the same final good that I'm actually consuming, which is food. I think that's where uh, my confusion is. But that, that's, that's, that's exactly the, the, the idea. So those final needs are substitutable exactly because they are just two ways of, of satisfying the need. Either you do yourself, with some goods, either you go to the market and basically you buy the service, but you are satisfying a very similar need. So that's exactly the point of why we say that they should be substitutable. The theory suggests that, and we expect that the date, the estimated model gives us that. Otherwise, the, the entire interpretation of the theory is different. And it's the interpretation that uh, Bernard and Coulter, they, they give. It's, Final needs are complements. They are representing different things from what we have in mind here. So your, your uh, example is exactly correct. And it's what we have in mind. Um, so fraction of hours in the service sector, CPS uh, match sub supplement. We follow Rachel and, and, and Barbara. Uh, and the quantities and price of goods and services we are, are taken from the value added uh real and nominal from the growing and uh, 10 sector database um so here you, you you have an idea of of the magnitudes of the difference in, in market work uh um, core work uh and travel is uh so if you exclude some categories that uh, can be interpreted as leisure at work is uh, minus 1.6 and home production with, with goods, um, including ch childcare and other care is minus 3.9, and home production with services minus 1.3. And if you think you should include education, there is minus 1.5. Um, so we calibrate the model and the fit of the model is, uh, is pretty good. Uh, all targets are, are, are close to, to, to those in data. Um, so let me go to what I think is uh, uh, most, re most interesting here. So first of all, note that, okay, these are not, these rows are not the elasticities. The elasticities are computed here with those values of the row and they are as expected. So the substitutability uh, between final needs is larger than one. Um, the substitutability between time and goods is lower than one, and between services and time is larger than one. So this is as as, as the theory, uh, what the theory uh, is based on, and and the estimation confirms. Can you explain is, uh, a little bit the, the 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 second and the third elasticity, the, why the ranking is like that. Uh, why the ranking should be like that? Okay, uh, so sticking to the to the burger example, um, to to fix ideas, um, McDonald's provides, or yeah, McDonald's provides you a way to save time in acquiring your burger and satisfy your needs. But uh, you have the whole range of possibilities. So if you have time to spend and you want to put more of your time because you are going out with your girlfriend, you have a walk, reach McDonald's, spend some time there, get the burger, go home. If you want to save time, you just use um, delivery. So these are two options that, we ha that you have in which it's really easy to substitute your own time with delivery time, right? So substitutability is very high with the technology. Uh, cooking the burger at home, substitutability between your barbecue and your time 
is not really great. Of course, maybe there are some new barbecues that are technologically advanced and they do all by themselves, roughly. Uh, but still, you cannot really say, oh, okay, I don't put any of my time and, uh, and the barbecue is doing all the, all the job. While for services, in most cases, you can do it. You can really put nothing or almost nothing of your time and get your needs satisfied by buying services. So, 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 so another way to put it is because the SQG HG is like when other people were estimated the value added, the elasticity of value added between service and good, because your time is always services. So when you look at the your time and the service sector, the elasticity is bigger than one. But when you look at your time and the in the HG, it's less than one. It's simply that. The value, the elasticity between the value added across goods and services is less than one, just like what you did in your AEJ and what Richard did. So, so, so that is where you get that 0.51. It's basically it's a different value added. I, I really but shouldn't I, I, take I, your time. Why don't you go yeah, on? I, I will yeah, not okay. ask. Yeah, we, we can talk later because yeah, I'm I'm not sure I I, I, I get your point uh yeah okay let me let me conclude and maybe we talk about this uh later or, or we can talk later uh between us um so the other estimated parameter that i'd like to call your attention upon is the differential um technological change uh, between the two home production uh functions so we get that there is a 2.2 percent per year differential between uh, BS and BM. Uh, and we interpret this uh, uh, exactly as the technological advances in the service sector that allow you to save uh, more time in, uh, uh, in satisfying those needs relative to using the home technology that, uh, uh, that uses goods. So this, this will be a parameter, a key parameter uh, on which we do um, a counterfactual. So this is the fit of the model. Of course, the continuous, the uh, almost straight line is, is the model, and the other is the data for relative uh, nominal consumption expenditure. Um, and this is uh, uh, the real quantity of services and the real quantity of goods uh, in the model in the data. So, uh, I mean, by, by comparing uh, these two, you, you can see that uh, structural change is uh, uh, well matched by the model, both in terms of relative quantity and in terms of relative, uh, relative price. Um, so the relative price in the data has this um, behavior, which uh, I suspect is uh, uh, highly due to the whole shocks of the, uh, of the 70s, which made the, the cost, of, uh, 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 cost of manufacturing uh, increase uh, faster than the cost of services. And so there is this behavior, but in the long run, we are matching the, uh, the price well. Anyways, the exercise that we do here to, uh, to be close to the, um, to the pattern of the relative price is to uh, back out relative productivity from the first order conditions by uh, using uh, relative price from the data and, uh, and the labor share from the data. So in this way, we reconstruct the, um, the, the price sequence that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, is consistent, more consistent with the data and plug these, uh, so, I'm sorry, we back out the um, relative TFP in the model that is consistent with that pattern for the, for the prices. And we then plug this pattern for relative productivities in, in the model. And so this is the, this is the new uh, fit of the model. So uh, relative nominal, uh, expenditure is, is fit well uh, along the path, uh, although there are some fluctuations. And uh, um, also the uh, pattern of real goods and real services is, uh, is close to the data, except from, of course, this, this uh, departure in the mid 70s and, and the 80s. So now this is the benchmark calibration and uh, from this one, I run a counterfactual in which I shut down the differential uh, productivity 
growth between the two home production activities uh, to see to what extent that uh, the difference is generated structural change. That is the home production with services becoming more efficient. And so we want to buy more service because of that. And this generates structural change. So if I close that channel, and so set the differential between BS, differential growth between BS and BM to zero, uh, this is what happens. So uh, structural change is, uh, is reduced substantially. So here the final point is 3.71, and here 2.61, uh, starting point around uh, 1.775. Okay, so uh, it's... Uh, uh, roughly half of structural change disappears through this channel. And here you can see why this happens because the, uh, um, consider that this is uh, uh, something that uh, happens in on production activities. Um, and what we get is that uh, uh, the growth in real quantity of services is reduced and the quantity, uh, the, the growth in the real quantity of, uh, of goods uh, increases. So the divergence between these two types of consumption um, is reduced. And this is what you expect because uh, the, the, a channel that makes uh, using services in on production more convenient is, uh, is shut down. Now, what, what I want to call your attention upon now is, is the following. In the counterfactual, the relative price of uh, services to, to goods um, grows instead of from 1 to 1.20, so 20%, it grows only 7%. So the remaining amount of, of structural change here is unlikely due to um, a, a relative price effect in a, let's say, in Guy Pissarida's uh, framework. Uh, even if it were, here the price of services is increasing, so the technology, the home technology using services uh, still becomes less convenient because that input is, is more ex expensive with respect to, uh, to goods that enter the other production function. So why there is still such a large amount of structural transformation here that uh, uh, remains in the model? So this is due to... Um, um, endogenous income effects that the model generates. So income effects uh, are, are typically uh, required to feed data, as I was discussing at the beginning of this presentation. Here, uh, there are some references uh, that discuss this point. Um, so now in the minutes that I have left, if I have a few minutes left for my presentation, I want to discuss how these uh, effects emerge in the model. So this is just to uh, show you what happens in the data. This figure is from Timo Bopart paper and shows that uh, every year, if you look at the share of services by income quintile, richer, uh, richer people always consume a larger share of services uh, compared to poorer, uh, to poorer people. So they, they, the structural transformation is not a matter of, uh, uh, of relative prices because here, uh, every year prices are fixed across consumers is also a matter of something that generates the normotetic pattern. So now here we do the following exercise. We take the calibrated model. Uh, we have a, a, an equilibrium wage. Uh, and from, from there, we study the problem of the consumer parameterized with the same parameters that we get from the calibration. The only thing that we do is to make the wage of this consumer exo exogenously change because we want to study the allocation of uh, uh, consumption uh, when the wage changes. So here, the, the red line is showing how the model performs. So if you only increase the wage of the consumer, everything else fixed, um, the consumer is uh, uh, purchasing more services in the market, or it's uh, uh, increasing his, his consumption share of services purchased in the market. Um, the black line is what happens in the data uh, across uh, um, fractions of, uh, uh, of the medium wage, 
Um, so, as you can see, the model generates much more normotheticity than what is required to, uh, to feed the data, the cross-sectional data for 2003. So why this normotheticity emerges? So if you plot uh, QS over QM uh, as a function of the fraction of the equilibrium wage, of course, that pattern is generated by the relative quantity because prices are fixed. We are just studying the consumer problem, everything fixed, only changing exogenous the wage. So if you compute the relative cost of producing CS and CG, I'm sorry, this is a type one, uh, which is the cost of producing one unit of each need, this relative cost is declining in wage. And what's the explanation for this? So remember the elasticities in the two home production function. Uh, in services, the elasticity is larger. In goods, it is smaller. So when the wage increases, one of the inputs in the two production functions is becoming more expensive, time. So the consumer, the richer consumer, wants to reduce the use of time in the two activities. Where is it easier to do that in services? Because substitutability is higher with the other input that she can purchase in the market. With goods, the two are complements, so it cannot really reduce the amount of time uh, and increase uh, the purchase of goods. So if, if you compare, for instance, with two identical production functions, so you parameterize the consumer problem with the same uh, share and elasticity parameter uh, in the two home production function, and you change the wage, nothing happens. The, um, the angle curve of relative quantity is completely flat across wage. Um, and the relative cost is completely flat. The cost of producing one unit of one need in one, in, with one production function is exactly the same as producing the other. So this, uh, um, this mechanism is uh, generated endogenously by the model and is given by the different substitutability across the production function. So we think this is a new channel that can explain the uh, variability in the cross-section in the expenditure share um, that was not uh, highlighted before. So, um, Richard, do we have uh, more time? Should, or, I think you I'm, should conclude I'm, if you I'm want out of to it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay, I'll conclude. This is the last slide. So, the, 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 we think the theory is successful in uh, accounting for structural change and time allocation patterns in, in the time series once is estimate. And it provides a quali qualitative prediction uh, on, uh, on consumption expenditure that is in line with the cross section. Uh, so you can think of this as a micro foundation of the normative component. So why this setting could be more useful than others? Well, it's an entirely homothetic uh, setting uh, in terms of functions. Uh, and sometimes, uh, especially for business cycle um, uh, problems, is, is, is more tractable. When you have non-homotheticity and, and business cycle, the two things do not work well together, as we show with, with Loris in another paper. Um, a shortcoming of, the, of this, which I didn't have time to, 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 to show you, is that the model at the moment cannot explain the uh, declining leisure profile um, so let me show you the, the, the figure. So uh, leisure declines with, uh, uh, with income. The, the model uh, at, at the moment, the estimated model, uh, displays a, a, an increasing uh, leisure component uh, with income. We, we want to fix this uh, by having also leisure produced with time and goods and services, thinking that richer consumers, they use less time to enjoy leisure, but they buy uh, expensive services and goods. So they go on vacation for a short time in very expensive places. And so we think of a production function of, of this sort. And if I take 10 seconds still of your time, um, this is the pattern of goods and services purchases that you have uh, before COVID, uh, during the COVID shock and after COVID. And so a way to see this is that uh, after the COVID shock, 
when let's say activities restarted, the um, amount of time available for people at home increased because people didn't want to go out that much uh, to buy services because it was dangerous. And so the amount of goods that they buy after the, the COVID shock, the rebound is much, much stronger than, than for services. And we think this is, uh, this is uh, in line with, the, with our theory uh, because the, let's say the opportunity cost of your time uh, declined and you started to work the home production technology with goods more than you were used to do right before COVID. And so there is a sort of uh, uh, reversed structural transformation right after COVID, which is, we think, sort of consistent with what uh, uh, I showed you uh, today. And I'm really out of time. So thank you all for listening. And I'm here for questions. Um, is there any question uh, from the floor? I mean, I guess since you since you brought up these later years, why stop at 2003? Uh, yeah, yeah, I know we are. Um, um, yeah, we are working on extending to, to 2003. Uh, and this, and we are working also on the uh, on the um, uh, time use that are finer from 2003 onwards to see yeah. if we can yeah I mean in particular you know I, when we extended the household accounts to 2020 you know you you saw a huge undoing of the marketization undoing so, so like a huge increase in in cooking. And things like that. So I, I think it would do. I think the, the 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 theory you have would work potentially has would work well through that time. And I think it would, you know, and it would make it kind of fun and exciting and you know new. Like because people like the COVID stuff. So the increase in the increase you are talking about is during COVID, right? You Not see, before. so um, you know, in the in the tradition of putting things in the context of my own research, uh, we um, so then the most recent update of the household production satellite accounts that we did at BEA, we took it to 2020. And you see, unlike the previous recession where there's really no change in the mix, mm -hmm. huge changes in the mix, and there's there's a big undoing of the marketization of cooking, for instance. People stop going to restaurants, unsurprisingly, and they cook a lot more at home. Um, okay. So the, the household, this ho household production activities that are done outside the household go down a lot, and the household production activities that are done physically inside the home go up. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so I think that would be kind of an interesting, you know, uh, yeah, complements this exercise figure that I'm showing. Yeah, yeah. Thank Any you. Any other you comments? No. So, Alessio, if we go back, uh, you know, about the lecture production. Um, you know, okay, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. if you go back to that slide. That, yeah. It, that's exactly what me and Timo did about why you know, the leisure go up for the less skill, which is, mm -hmm. you know, stand, you know mm -hmm. it's because uh, you allow for leisure production. And what the high skill does is they use less time and better quality goods, you know, more yeah. expensive capital goods, basically. Yeah, yeah. So we are in your paper. What, Sorry for yeah, so that's what we did yeah. on the leisure yeah, yeah, sure, production. Sure. <laughs> this, is, this is just, this is just so an that addition. That was exactly what I had to, in mind. No, no, if you're no, going sure, to go sure. down yeah. this way, yeah. you, you might as well classify everything in the time use for the purpose of final utility. I think that's what Becker have in mind. You, know, you, you, you think of all the hours, you know, of course, you might want to take out the essential sleeping time, those, but everything else, you know, even leisure time, is being combined with something in to yeah. generate the final mm -hmm. utility. Then you have a full, you know, more, and those things that is being combined is also purchased from the market, and it's belong to either goods or service sector. You know, whether you buy Netflix or you go buy a, uh, I don't know, DVD, you know, 
it's all these, they are still you know, being combined with some market output. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I've been a little bit abusive in this session. I talked too much. I'm really sorry. Thank you. Thank uh, here you. is completely dark and I couldn't find my light switch. So uh, if we don't have any more questions, uh, Taryn, do you have any more things to say to add? <laughs> No, um, I think uh, it's. I think it's been a great session. Thank you, everyone, for um, staying. Uh, my husband's been doing the home production. Um, <laughs> so so <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to. He's been doing the cooking. Um, uh, but yeah, I think thank thank you very much. Um, this uh, session, I think, will be online at some point. Um, and there are a lot of a number of other workshops that are happening in the next week. A uh, couple weeks, I think, Steg workshop. Yes. Um, yeah. So if this is is something that you want to, Joe. Do you want to say anything about the other theme workshops? No, it's okay. They're, they're all on the Steg website. I just wanted to um, thank uh, uh, Taryn and Rachel uh, for organizing this, and Kirsty uh, for helping out um, with the broadcast of it from CEPR. And why don't we all unmute and give uh, the stragglers that are left to unmute and uh, give a round of applause. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. <laughs> Thank oh, you, Christy and Ed. Ed, Ed, Ed. <laughs> yeah. Have a good night, everyone. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, hope to see you somewhere else. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. See bye. you soon. Bye-bye.